Welcome to the other track. We are uh, focused on another topic today with COVID, but I, my name is Elliot Lane. I will be your MC for the day. Uh, I am very excited to be here. We have an incredible lineup. If you've been watching on track one, Luke and Patrick have touched on it uh, pretty fantastically. 30 plus companies today, and today is day one of two, two tracks. And if you miss anything, you can go back and watch it on YouTube later because it's still going to be there. Uh, this is for you guys. All right. This whole day is education. It's insights into these companies. It's for you all to ask questions. You can ask me on YouTube. You can ask me in the event platform. Uh, we will be monitoring both chats. So if you do have questions, please do not hesitate to drop them in. Uh, and we will do our best uh, to communicate as many of them as possible to these uh, executives uh, for these biotech companies. Biotech, heavily regulated space. There's got to be a ton of questions. Uh, for those in the event platform, uh, please do network. Please do uh, set meetings, reach out, make connections. That's what events are for. We want to continue that in the virtual landscape. If you're on YouTube, uh, please, please engage with me. I will be watching this YouTube chat all day long for two days. I'm very excited. So we're going to get started here in literally two minutes with our first presentation, but a couple of housekeeping uh, further items. This is our first small cap event of the year. We had a cannabis capital conference with tons of public cannabis stocks in February. Uh, we obviously have our biotech event today and tomorrow. We have a clean tech focused event next month and then a generalist sector agnostic event in May. And that's just the first five months of the year. We're, we're going to keep going the rest of the year. So stay tuned. Continue to get alerts, subscribe, like, do what you need to do to stay up with Benzinga. And as Luke mentioned, our news, uh, it, it brings awareness to stocks. It brings awareness to companies that you want to invest in. Just look at the NFT movement yesterday. Uh, it has been a super fun time uh, to be associated with the retail market. Benzinga.com is where I get all of my news. Uh, I get my alerts. I, I am a member of Benzinga Pro proudly. I have tons of watch lists. I use that thing religiously. Um, I also host the Daily Cannabis Insider Show with Patrick and Javier Hase. So we are touching on multiple markets. Uh, I am very excited. Ben, LOL lags. What's up? Um, all right. We are going to get started here shortly with our first company of the day, Excel RX, or Excel RX, I should say. There's no X there. A-C-E-L-R-X. Uh, so he'll be over shortly, but that is NASDAQ listed, ACRX. Um, so once Vince, if you are ready, we can go ahead and get you over, get that camera and microphone back on there, sir. Uh, again, I encourage everybody, drop your questions in the chat. Um, I will continue to communicate them over to Vince. Um, and make sure you're keeping track of both tracks. There's tons of presentations. If you miss something, we can go back. Uh, awesome, Vince. How are you? Good. Thank you for having me this morning, Elliot. Much oh, we're very excited. You are the first presenter of of uh, our biotech, our first biotech event. So this it's is incredibly an early exciting. One coming from the West Coast. Oof, you are you are a champion, sir. All right. So again, Vince and Gotti. Did I say that correct? Yes, sir. Thank and you. Gotti. Perfect. I'm going to let you share your screen and get us started. Okay. Let me. Um... And just let me know that this comes through and that we're all set. Perfect. Well, at first, let me thank those of you who have dialed in for your interest in Accelerax. And my name, as Elliot mentioned, is Vince Angotti. I'm the CEO. I joined the company in March of 2017. Um, I know that we only have a short period of time this morning, and it might be unlikely that we'll be able to take some questions, but we'd welcome any one-on-one -on -one meeting requests that you might have. And I also want to let you know that later this morning, we have a fireside chat being conducted with our chief medical officer uh, and founder, Dr. Pamela Palmer, and it would be well worth your time uh, to tune in for that. So thank you. <clears throat> well, before we begin, I'll remind you that we'll be making some forward-looking statements during today's presentation that may involve risks and uncertainties of the business. I'd like to encourage you to refer to our SEC filings related to those matters. And anytime we talk about Accelerex, anytime we introduce Accelerex, we always like the level set where our interests and investments lie. And that is on the left side of your screen. Today, our focus is on acute pain management, always under medical supervision. For example, the pain associated with a long bone fracture, 
maybe a severe sprain that might drive you into the emergency room for care, or pain as a result of an insult to the body, like perioperative pain due to a procedure that you're having. Now that is in stark contrast versus chronic pain, for example, lower back pain, where the patient fills their prescription at a local retail pharmacy and manages their drug administration at home. You will not find our products in your local Rite Aid, your CVS or Walgreens, but rather only at the institutions where it is actually administered. Now our portfolio consists of multiple products with two that have achieved approval and commercial status. All of our products share the sublingual Safentanil platform. The first and primary focus of today's presentation is the product called Desuvia at the top of your chart here. Desuvia is a 30 microgram sublingual Safentanil tablet in what's called a single dose applicator or SDA and it's always healthcare practitioner administered. It's indicated for the management of moderate to severe acute pain in medically supervised settings. Vesuvia is approved and launched in the US. It is also approved in Europe where we are currently having partnering discussions that are in deep progress. Our second product is a product called Zalvisil. Similarly, a sublingual sulfentanyl tablet, but this time half the dose, 15 micrograms, in a pre-programmed handheld patient-controlled analgesia device. This product is NDA ready in the US. We've held on the submission um, until the FDA has better clarity on approvals of this class of medicines moving forward and is currently available and being promoted in the EU. We also have a couple of pipeline products in phase two that share the sufentanil sublingual platform, ARX02 and ARX03 at the bottom of your screen. Uh, these are sidelined as we've begun commercialization of Vesuvia, but these may be partnering opportunities in the future. Now, our sublingual Safenda platform brings you back to our founder I mentioned before, Dr. Pamela Palmer, and current CMO. She's also a trained anesthesiologist um, from Stanford who, while working at University of San Francisco, California's pain center, was often called as an expert witness in wrongful death cases at other institutions involving IV opioid overdoses. And in the evaluation of those cases, it was often determined that human error was the most common cause of those issues. And as a matter of fact, in 2005, when Dr. Palmer started the company, opioids were the second most frequent drug class of medication errors within the acute hospital setting. And unfortunately, it hasn't changed even until today. So the question is why? Well, IV opioids are all clear liquids in similar glass vials, easy to pick the wrong medications and concentrations as they all look the same. In addition, there's misprogramming of the pumps associated with their administration, which even in the slightest manner can result in fatalities. So her goal was to develop a unique solid dosage form to eliminate these human errors. And in addition, she also wanted to address the clinical shortcomings of these IV opioids. So what do we mean when we talk about the clinical shortcomings? Well, on the left side of your screen here, you see a representation of morphine. Now, IV morphine has a very slow, what's called blood to brain equilibration. Just because it's in your vein, doesn't necessarily mean it's in the effect site, the brain. And it often tempts healthcare practitioners to push the dose for a faster onset of action. But as multiple doses are stacked, you start running the risk of respiratory depression, a fatal side effect. The other challenge with morphine is that it also has active metabolites so that once you've done dosing it, these active metabolites are circulating and cause significant adverse events long after dosing. So clinical challenge with morphine. On the opposite side of the coin is the right side of your screen. And that is IV fentanyl and IV sufentanyl. Exact opposite issue, has a very fast onset of action. If it's in the vein, it's in the brain, very quick analgesia, but the challenge is as fast as it comes on is as fast as it can come off. So 20 to 30 minutes later, you're always having to redose these IV fentanyls and sufentanyls to keep an analgesic effect, effect for the patient. So as Dr. Palmer's trying to solve the issue with these IV human error opioid mistakes and their clinical shortcomings, she evaluated this molecule, sufentanyl, which had two key attributes making it appropriate for solid dosage form 
to be delivered sublingually under the tongue. Those attributes are one of very high therapeutic index, which is simply meaning a reflection of its safety profile. And the second is that sufentanil is the most lipophilic and non-ionized of all of these molecules. These are two key characteristics which would allow sublingual under the tongue administration. So she creates the formulation and with sufentanil selected and administered sublingually, it addressed these shortcomings of these aforementioned IV opioids. And really where you should be focused is on the top left of the screen, which is what's called the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic profile. And what you see in that top left chart of sufentanil sublingual 30 micrograms is that first, sufentanil's concentration of both the plasma and effect site, the brain, you should see two lines there, are mirrored. And they actually cross the analgesic threshold to allow for pain alleviation within 15 minutes. So, solves issue one, morphine of the slow onset of action. Secondly, it remains above that analgesic threshold line for three to four hours. So now it solves the other side of the coin, fentanyl and sufentanil in the IV forms because they wear off within 20 to 30 minutes. This one maintains its analgesic effect for three to four hours. And then finally, and probably just as important as anything, is it's got a blunted concentration in the plasma. Meaning when you look at the peak of the line, the top, the crescent of the curve, it's at a level considered to be blunted which means it minimizes the risk of extreme side effects like respiratory depression. So you've got the triad, fast onset, nice duration, three to four hours, and a blunted CMAX that limits these um, extreme side effects. As a matter of fact, with that blunted CMAX in all of our clinical trials, we've had no use of naloxone ever required. And that is an important aspect because if you're familiar with naloxone, naloxone it's administered to reverse opioid effects due to overdosing too much in the blood, has not happened with sufentanil sublingual in any of our clinical trials. <clears throat> so Desuvia was approved by the FDA in late 2018, but importantly, up to that time, when this PK and safety profile was being evaluated, it was caught, it caught the attention of the Department of Defense as the analgesics being used in the field of battle had significant shortcomings. So the Department of Defense partnered with Accelerex, investing $22 million to develop what is now called the Suvia. And you see it on the far left, top left of your screen. It's the full drug device combo. And it's been developed with attention to mitigating diversion issues as well. So it, circumvents the potential for clear liquid substitution or diversion simply because it is solid in nature. It has a non-retractable plunger on the device while the device looks like a syringe. It's got a blunt tip at one end. It's clear so that you see the small tablet. At the other end, it's got a lock that prevents premature actuation of the plunger, but the plunger was developed to be non-retractable so you couldn't try to substitute a fake pill in there and use it for inappropriate reasons. It's got tamper evident packaging and there's no wastage because it's a solid dosage form. It's always the same starting dose for everyone. There are zero leftovers when administered to the patient. So you have no controlled wastage uh, for the product as it is always completely used. Now, importantly with the military, I'll cover it here a few slides later, but there were some significant decisions made in 2020 relative to their use of that. We'll cover that here shortly. So again, as mentioned, the SUVI was FDA approved in late 2018. It's got a very clean label, including our pivotal trial, what was called SAP 301 efficacy chart that you see in front of you. This is lifted right out of the label. And it's based on this efficacy chart, what's called the pain intensity difference. So the higher the difference, the better. The SUVI is represented by the gold line. Placebo is represented by the grayish line beneath it. And you can see a statistically significant separation from placebo in the pain intensity difference within 15 minutes carried out for three to four hours until rescue medications are delivered for placebo. So in our label demonstrates the fast onset of action and nice duration. Also within our label in the same trial is a relatively benign adverse event profile versus placebo, especially for an opioid. 
So this shows those adverse events that are greater than 2% and also greater than placebo. And that's important that you'll see there's only five that are listed in our package insert. And we'd put this adverse event profile against any opioid in the acute care setting. And as a matter of fact, even more telling is regarding the adverse event profile from the results of our, what was called SAP 302 or emergency room trial where patient adverse events are not clouded by other issues in the perioperative environment, like anesthesia gases, et cetera. So again, a very clean profile of adverse events that's really report in the single and low single dose percentages. <clears throat> and what is resounding most in the marketplace with those people using it in the real world is that in that same ER study, the Department of Defense asked us to do a cognitive impairment assessment as they had historical issues with their just traditional opioids like morphine, fentanyl, and other agents like ketamine that were causing the clouding of our soldiers' minds. And of course, you can't afford for soldiers in the field of battle to be cognitively impaired. So this was a requirement of the FDA to assess this. So they established a standardized tool, a six item screener, which was used to assess this cognition at baseline and at one hour when the peak plasma levels are attained of Vesuvius. So the bottom line here on the left side of your screen, if you add them up, 97% of patients had no cognitive impairment, which is really extraordinary. And importantly, for the civilian world, when you look at the right side of the screen, age did not play a factor. So it really separates Vesuvia versus historical opioids. And we can hear from the PACU nurses routinely, those dealing with the patients, and particularly the elderly in the recovery rooms, the clarity of the patient's mind post-op because they're not all clouded over from the adverse effects of these opioids. So when you look at it holistically, you see that with the sufentanyl molecule and the sublingual administration of it designed now as the suvia, they combine to create this unique product of action the nice duration, um, nice AE profile, in lack of cognitive impairment. So it should result in theoretically lower morphine milligram equivalents because you don't have to continue to redose products and eventually help in enhance recovery for patients and reduce their discharge time, which is really the main game, safety for patients and tightening the efficiency within these ambulatory surgical centers and hospitals. And importantly, in August of 2020, a publication in the Journal of Clinical Anesthesia and Pain Management showed just that. It demonstrated that the SUV had reduced opioid use in time in the PACU when administering the product. Now, the study was conducted independently at UHS in upstate New York. It was a prospective use of the SUV preoperatively, so they were matching that pharmacokinetic profile to the pain versus historical controls. Both the Desuvia and control groups were matched for patient demographics surgery types, the same surgeons, so the technique didn't make a difference, et cetera. And what they found was on the top left of your screen that there was a 50% reduction in opioids administered, including intra-op and post op opioids when Vesuvia was utilized versus the control group. And what is not shown on this screen, screen is that there was an 80% reduction in opioid use in the PACU or recovery unit as measured by morphine milligram equivalents. And that all translates into the right side of your screen. Because of this reduction in morphine milligram equivalents throughout the perioperative setting and the patients being clear-headed post-op, they showed a 34% reduction in phase one PACU time when using Desuvia. So the effect was efficiency and cost savings for the hospital system. As every minute in the PACU can be very expensive. As a matter of fact, it's been documented to be anywhere from seven to $15 per minute. So in this study, Desuvia was the opioid that actually reduced opioids in the hospital setting for these patients. So as you can see in the analysis from a financial standpoint, from a pharmacoeconomic standpoint, uh, to a lesser degree, it really had an impact on drug costs being other opioids, but they're relatively inexpensive. It was more about opioid stewardship, but to a much more significant degree on efficiency and more expensive drugs, which really positions it nicely for the importance of efficiency post-COVID. As a matter of fact, a May 2020 study 
of um, in orthopedic surgery volumes by the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery suggests that even in the most optimistic scenario, the U.S. may face a cumulative backlog of more than a million total joint and spine surgery cases due to COVID. And we believe as the elective surgeries begin to ramp in the second half of 2021, the CV is well positioned um, for this in order to help with patient throughput. Interestingly, an additional independent assessment was completed recently and published in the Journal of Universal Surgery, evaluating Vesuvia for the perioperative management of surgical pain. And again, it showed a strong, consistent results of a intraoperative reduction in postoperative or intraoperative use of IV opioids and a greater than 50% reduction in postoperative morphine milligram equivalents associated with Vesuvia. So again, very, very consistent results. So there's nothing like it with that PK and that delivery system. You have a non-invasive option that gives a rapid opportunity for pain release. So it's truly unique in its profile, has the long duration in the CMAX. So commercially, how do we think this will end up playing out? Well, for the patient experience, it's important that it's non-invasive so you're not tethered to the bed. Uh, for the nurse, it's very um, ease use of administration. It takes a matter of a minute or less. There's no risk of IV infection simply because it's not invasive, and this should create efficiencies for the ER, ASC, and hospital environment moving forward, which all translates into lower cost. So the market is significant. There's roughly 92 million adult patient visits in medically supervised settings annually associated with moderate severe acute pain, whether it's the ER, outpatient surgeries, inpatient surgeries, et cetera. And today, increasingly, the same day surgeries are being pushed to the ambulatory surgical center and facilities. So it would be too much for us from a cost and efficiency standpoint to build an infrastructure to address this massive market. Therefore, we have a four pillar strategy for revenue growth. Pillars one and two on the left side are large markets, large revenue opportunities with minimal Accelerex investment. Pillars three and four are where we'll directly invest our dollars in a stage fashion for the long term. So starting with pillar one, I'd mentioned the DOD before, and that's really the basis of this, this pillar. We had in 2020, an imper very important year for us, and that after 18 months post the approval, a milestone C review meeting was conducted by the Army, it was completed in April of last year, concluding that the Suvia met all of its primary objectives and was approved for all Army sets, kits, and outfits for deployed trips moving forward. So while we expect the revenues to be choppy over time, depending on the deployments, we're very excited about the formal review and approval of the CVS profile for the um, men and women of our service. Hey, Vince, addition, about one minute left if you want to uh, give us a few final thoughts there. Sure. In addition, they expanded it to the joint deployment formula, so all branches of the military can now have access to it. We've also signed a um, partnership with Zimmer Biomet for the oral and dental surgery markets, a uh, very large market of over 7 million procedures a year. They have a national sales team and they will be handling that and launching that uh, as this year progresses. And finally, with us, we'll be focusing on the hospitals and ambulatory surgical centers moving forward with a relatively small sales team of about 15 to, to 20 sales representatives uh, accessing those in strategic areas around the country. So for our company, quickly on the finances, our 2020 revenues was five and a half million dollars roughly. We finished the year at roughly $43 million in cash in our balance sheet. And that was prior to a capital raise uh, through the end of February of an additional $36 million. So our balance sheet uh, has a strong cash position. Our operating expenses are tight, running around eight to uh, eight and a half, 8.7 million a quarter. And that actually includes about 1.3 million of non-cash stock options. Fantastic. Vince, uh, is there an email? We do have several questions in the chat. Mark. Uh, I, I believe we have one from Dennis as well. Is there an email they can send them through to? Yeah, investor relations at accelerex.com. And Perfect. again, I just want to remind you, Elliot, that we'll have our chief medical officer and founder yes. who developed this technology later this morning. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah, so everybody, please tune into that. Some of these questions very well may be answered there. I think actually, Vince, you did cover a few that were asked. So wonderful presentation. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, <laughs> it sounds like there's not a huge catch to your product, man. So very cool. Very cool uh, activation there. Yeah, we're very excited. Thank you for having us. And we appreciate again for those of you who um, tuned in this morning. Much appreciated. Yeah. Thank you, Vince. All right. Uh, so we started off with a with an awesome company here. Uh, and it's I think it's important to remember as we move along, we are going to be hearing from companies that 
uh, have engaged in very, you know, broad spectrums of therapies and, and diagnostics that are all going to translate one way or another to COVID. Uh, so you heard from Vince how his product could be used uh, you know, for, for COVID with joint and, and spinal surgeries. Uh, so I think it's a very interesting uh, through line to this track. Um, so uh, again, investor relations at Excel RX, uh, please do reach out. Uh, Mark Parchetta, you had some wonderful questions in the YouTube chat. Dennis, your question as well. But we are going to keep powering through to our next presentation. A uh, good friend of Benzinga, Chris Bunka, CEO and chairman of Lexaria Bio Biosciences, I can talk, listed on the NASDAQ, L-E-X-X. -X. Chris, are you with us? How are you? We just need you to get that camera and mic on if you can. Can you hear me? Yeah, there you are, my friend. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Good, good, good. Mike's a little hot there, my friend, but we do see your screen and I can let you take it away. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time this morning. My name is Chris Bunker. I am the CEO and chairman of Lexaria Bioscience. I'm very delighted to be able to give you this presentation this morning. We, of course, are a public company, so you'll need to go through our disclaimer. In a nutshell, we are a company that is trying to change the world with drug delivery. We are trying to make drug delivery safer with lower doses and more effective delivery. We are a disruptive company. And I know that's a sexy word in the media, but I have to tell you, living it every day, it's a challenge because it means that a lot of Fortune 500 companies hate us. We are disruptive. We have the ability to disrupt existing revenue streams because we deliver drugs so much more effectively. We are a technology company. We're very good at what we do and we've already been awarded 18 patents just in the last several years. We have nearly 60 additional patents pending all over the world. Our patents are granted currently in the European Union in America and in Australia. We are patent pending in all of those countries for additional patents, but also in China, India, Japan, Canada, Mexico, and elsewhere. We are building a very significant intellectual property portfolio. We want you to follow us and follow what we're doing as we try to disrupt these drug markets. Our tech is already patent granted for many fat soluble molecules, including oral nicotine, cannabinoids, uh, fat soluble vitamins. We are patent pending for antiviral drugs, for human hormones like estrogen and testosterone, uh, and for additional drug classes, as you can see. The name of our technology is Dehydratech, and we are a B2B company. We are not a company that is trying to do too many things. We're not trying to invent technology, manufacture it, distribute it, sell it, all the rest of it. What we're trying to do is be a think tank for drug delivery technologies and license our tech to other corporations who can use our tech to more effectively deliver these types of drugs. I have to tell you, you're rarely going to see a company that is addressing larger markets than we are. The nicotine market around the world, for example, is one of the largest industries on earth. It's over $800 billion per year, nearly a trillion per year if you include China. And we're not like a lot of other small companies. Instead of me asking you to just trust us, I'm actually telling you we've already formed commercial relationships with companies like Altria, the largest nicotine company in America. We already have a commercial royalty agreement in place with them. We also have a formal R&D agreement in place with an even larger company, British American Tobacco, one of the three largest nicotine companies on earth. Our team is large. I don't have time to go through everyone um, you would expect us to have a strong team, and we do. I'll mention just a few of the people on the right side of the page. Greg Smith is a shareholder and a strategic advisor. You may be familiar with him. 
from uh, CNBCs on TV, it seems, all the time. He was one of the original investors in Jewel and Beyond Meat. Greg is well known as an early stage investor in disruptive technologies. Dr. Phil Ainsley, who's the co-head of the cardiovascular department at the University of British Columbia, sits on our scientific board. You'll see why his input in a few moments has been so important to us. Brian Quigley, one of our directors, he was sitting across the boardroom table from me a couple of years ago when we were negotiating against Altria. He was the CEO of Altria's smokeless tobacco division. He since left Altria and he joined our board. It should tell you something about the quality of our science and technology that people like this are joining us. Here's what our tech does. This is obviously an oversimplified cartoon, but basically we take a drug, we combine it with a fatty acid oil. This combination is very important to us because there are certain co-ingredients within these long chain fatty acids that our technology requires. And by the way, these are very simple ingredients, very simple and very safe, like sunflower oil or olive oil or grapeseed oil. We heat that to a certain temperature and then we apply it to a dry uh, powdered particulate. We're looking for certain ratios of mass to surface area, absorptive qualities. That mixture is then placed into our patented dehydration processing. And what comes out is a dry powder with the drug literally baked into it. Um, because we operate in different sectors, those powders can now be used to press a pill, be used to fill a capsule in the CPG or consumer packaged good market. They can even be used to create food. For example, uh, before we listed on NASDAQ, we used to have a division in the company that was licensing our technology to the THC industry. And in that industry, our largest client was a company out of Colorado. Some of you may know it, 1906 Chocolates. Their chocolates are well known as, as some of the most effective and best tasting in the country, in the cannabis market. They used to put, and still do, put our technology into cocoa powder. So it's very natural, organic process that we use to deliver these drugs more effectively. Uh, we had to sell that division, that business unit, prior to listing on NASDAQ two months ago. Why do we do this? We do it because we know that fatty acids work symbiotically in your body. And this is something I really want to hit hard with all of you who maybe haven't heard this before. We don't use chemicals. We don't try to use a sledgehammer to make your body do things it doesn't want to. We work with the natural processes of your body because guess what? Your body manufactures long chain fatty acids your pancreas, gallbladder, liver, stomach, and small intestine. They all communicate with each other every time you swallow food. And depending on what sort of substances are detected, different cells are triggered and a very customized digestive bile is released to help your body absorb those nutrients. That is what we piggyback on with our technology. And where our technology is unlike anything else, is we manage to sort of crazy glue the drug to these long chain fatty acids so that the drug is preferentially absorbed and it goes into the lymphatic lacteal system instead of crossing the intestinal wall going into the hepatic vein destined for liver biotransformation. Because of all this, as I'll show you in a moment, drugs that are processed with our technology enter the bloodstream so much factor, faster and so much more effectively. We've also been working for a number of years with the largest R&D organization in all of Canada, the National Research Council. It's a crown corporation and they have done a lot of very sophisticated work to evidence how our technology works. And we've received the, the thumbs up from them and from others. The benefits of our technology vary depending on the type of drug that we are delivering. But in general, these five things you see on the screen remain constant. Because 
Our tech is very effective at masking unwanted flavors. And I'll remind you that our technology is optimized for use in oral drug delivery, something that you're going to put into your mouth. Because of that, taste matters. Now, it doesn't matter very much for a capsule, but it matters a heck of a lot for a beverage or for a CPG. And because of that, we can reduce the amount of sugar or artificial ingredients that are required in those products. The, the, the biggest uh, benefits that people recognize is speed. I'll show you in a moment in a graph just how quickly we get drugs into your bloodstream. And whether you have someone around you who is having a seizure, whether you have a migraine headache, uh, whether there's any number of different conditions, you know darn well that time is important and you want your drugs to take effect quickly. We also get much more uh, of the drug into your bloodstream. It's called bioavailability. And it means that in general, we can use lower doses of drugs. And that means we can lower the, the negative side effects because we're using smaller doses. We discovered in 2018 and 2019, delighted to discover that we cross the blood brain barrier much more effectively. And, and you might ask, well, wh why would that matter? Well, for certain drug classes, most of your receptor cells are located either in the central nervous system or in the brain itself. Nicotine is a prime example. If you can't deliver nicotine into the brain, it's of no use because that's where your receptor cells lie. I'll show you how we do that. And we do all of this at less than one tenth of one penny per dose of drug. So our manufactured clients, our, our corporate clients that use our manufacturing process actually experience an additional cost of less than one tenth of 1%. And that makes us the most cost effective drug delivery technology in the world. The drug delivery markets are huge. You can see some of the numbers here, but I'm gonna drill down into some of the specific sectors to give you a bit better idea on that. And I want to make it clear that for 2021, we have three main areas of investigation. Yes, our tech is effective in a dozen different areas, but this year we're working on CBD or cannabidiol for hypertension, oral nicotine formulations, in part because we already have two of the world's largest nicotine companies as uh, commercial partners and antiviral therapies. This is where we really start to communicate a lot of information. This chart on the right, the black line is indicating our technology in a human clinical study that we performed using a 90 milligram dose of cannabidiol. Time is measured from left to right and quantity of drug in blood measured vertically. The dotted gray line was from a separate study, a competitor that used the nanotechnology. You hear that word a lot. A lot of people don't realize how old nanotechnology is. The peak in nano uh, patents, for example, in America was about 12 or 14 years ago. So a lot of those technologies are actually coming off patent and are now generic. And what you can see here that in both studies, blood was drawn roughly every 30 minutes for between six and eight hours. And at the 30 minute mark, the first blood draw, we've already delivered more drug than the competitor's technology managed to reach at the two hour mark. And at that 30 minute mark, they've practically not even started. And also by the 60 minute mark, we've delivered more drug than the competing technology ever did manage to do as it peaked at the four hour level. So this is called moving the curve to the left. It is high, highly desirable in the drug delivery business. And this is what we do. We deliver more of these drugs and we deliver them much more quickly. On this graph, I'm gonna take a little bit deeper dive. It's the same black line. The dotted gray line in this case is representing our own control formulation. So this was a formulation that does include our patented formulations, but did not include our patented processing. And you can see that even our patented processes, or excuse me, patented 
formulations convey a lot of benefit both in time and volume to the uh, patient. On the left-hand side in the bullets, I want to draw your attention to the bottom two bullets. In this human clinical study that was published in 2019 in a peer-reviewed uh, US medical journal, we also evidenced that our technology was successful in lowering human blood pressure by about 5% with this very, very small dose. Um, the generic CBD that was not processed with the Hydratech did not lower human blood pressure. This was an amazing discovery. We also discovered cerebral perfusion, which is the quantity of blood and fluids flowing into and out of the brain. Dr. Phil Ainsley, who I mentioned earlier, managed to fly some very specialized equipment from the university over to Europe where the study was conducted. And they use a form of Doppler radar to measure blood flows inside uh, the human brain. And we were able to evidence in this study that our technology increases those blood flows. This is hugely important for our number one area of focus. I'm not going to get into some of these data points with you, it's highly technical, but I really wanna talk about the hypertension market. There's over a billion people around the world who suffer from high blood pressure or hypertension, but interestingly, only one person in five is currently treating it, i.e. that market could grow by 500% to treat everyone who has it. Why? Why are so many people walking around with high blood pressure and not treating it? Well, there's two reasons. One, some people just don't consider it to be serious enough. But more importantly, most people who investigate it recoil when they learn of the side effects of most of the existing pharmaceutical hypertension drugs. You see some of them here on the screen. Some of these side effects are extremely serious. And what is of great interest to us is that CBD is not known to have any serious side effects in multiple studies conducted by others. For example, GW Pharmaceuticals was just purchased a month ago at a valuation of over $7 billion because they, of course, were the trailblazer in the CBD market, and they obtained FDA approval to use CBD to treat pediatric seizure disorders. They did a fantastic job, and they were dosing it up to 1,400 milligrams per day in children with no serious side effects. As a result of all this, Lexaria is delighted to be able to announce that in the coming months, starting next month, we are running three human clinical trials using CBD for hypertension. In these trials, we're going to be using various doses between 300 and 450 milligrams a day, i.e. around four to five times what we used previously. And what we are trying to evidence is a 10% or greater drop in blood pressure. If we do that, we feel that we will be successful in demonstrating that Dehydratech CBD is a competitive, effective, and cost competitive alternative in the hypertension market. Just to put a point on this, the number one selling hypertension drug in America has sold over $62 billion worth of that single drug over its product life. These are massive markets. Um, Chris, this, is, this have, is incredible. We do have about 30 seconds left, if you can put okay, a, a last thought to it. Okay, I'm going to have to just skip some of this. We're doing a lot of work in the CBD sector. We're doing work in this giant $800 billion nicotine market. We've evidenced 300 and 500 percent more drug delivery to brain. Um, we're working with some of the biggest companies in the world in the nicotine market. We're also active in the antiviral. In our first study released before Christmas, we've shown great promise in delivering some drugs that are being investigated for use in COVID-19. Here's what I want to tell you. We just got listed on NASDAQ. We only have 5 million shares in, in existence. We have two years of capital in the bank. We don't spend a lot of money. We need you to help us to grow our company. We want your support as shareholders. And, and we thank you very much for your time. Please come to our website, lexariabioscience.com to learn more about the company.
Chris, that was absolutely fascinating. <laughs> the runway for you seems to be quite, quite long. A lot of potential there, my friend. It's absolutely enormous. Most people have a hard time wrapping their mind about the hundred million billion dollar markets that we're chasing. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for being here. Chris will be back with us at future events, but please do check into them. Uh, LexariaBiosciences.com, listed on the NASDAQ, L-E-X-X. -X. I may also look into it myself. Uh, Chris, thanks so much, my friend. Glad you were here. Thank you so much. Have a super day. You too. Awesome. So two fantastic presentations to start off. Uh, that drug delivery uh, aspect uh, of Chris's presentation was super uh, interesting to me, uh, but we're going to keep going, I think, to uh, maybe the panel, one of the panels of the event. Uh, very, very excited for this topic because we've all been struggling through this for uh, a year now. Uh, I'm going to bring over Jason Colbert. He is the Director of Research from Dawson James Securities. They themselves had an interesting announcement recently, but Jason, I'm going to let you introduce the panel and get off here. Uh, good morning. Can you guys see me? Can you hear me? We can hear you, but you might need to turn your camera on if you can. Uh, let me see what I just bear with me. Okay, there we go. Uh, good morning, everybody. Yes, COVID is a very interesting topic and it's a really interesting panel. I had the pleasure and luxury of being on television yesterday and talking a little bit about something very unusual that's happening in the world. Does one size fit all? When we look at drug development, it's very, very unusual to think that one drug treats all patients. And in terms of the COVID epidemic, there has never been a mass vaccination during an actual pandemic. So we are on new ground here. So one of the really exciting things when we think about this is, what are we gonna learn from this process? And it's very clear when I look at this panel and the range of companies that they really represent what I think is going to happen over the next two to three years in terms of not just the COVID pandemic, but in terms of the next pandemic as well. What do you need to know? Well, you need to know is, is the company leveraged to COVID? In other words, if the company's business really climbs as a result of uh, either therapeutics, diagnostics, or other elements of COVID, how will that affect the company? How will it translate going forward? Another aspect is, what do we need to learn about COVID? For example, if you've had COVID, do you need to get a COVID vaccine? If you've had a COVID vaccine, are you still safe from COVID six months or a year down the road? And if you do get COVID, what therapeutics are available to treat you and prevent death? And I think these panelists can answer that question. So I see on my right, uh, Henry. Henry G is the CEO of Sorrento. Sorrento is a 2.5 billion, billion market cap company. Uh, Henry, I looked at the recent 10K. You may even have more money than this on the balance sheet, but 56 million in cash. The thing that excites me about Sorrento is it's still flying under the radar screen. People do not appreciate the scope and breadth of this company, both in oncology in pain management, but here we're, we're gonna talk about Sorrento and COVID, both on the therapeutic side and the diagnostic side. We also have Prophase, ticker symbol PRPH. I see Ted there. Um, I love Prophase because I view it as a, as a leveraged play towards COVID. And as we see COVID testing increase, I, you may have heard me in the past say that I have a son at University of Wisconsin. He gets tested every week for COVID. So as we see testing increase, uh, this company Prophase is going to benefit from that. And there'll be some challenges going forward. And then the other question I asked is, what is your immunological status? If you've had a COVID vaccine, are you safe from getting COVID in three months, in six months, in a year? The Aditex score is the next generation of immune surveillance, and we're going to see its applicability towards COVID. But what's interesting is it's more than just COVID. And in fact, Amro, congratulations. I saw that the psoriasis trial uh, you had some news on that this morning. So with that, let me turn it over to Henry first 
And Henry, in about five minutes or so, just give me a basic description of Sorrento and focus on the COVID opportunity for us. Thank you. Yes, uh, Sorrento is a, a NASDAQ listed company, and we have working on uh, all solutions relating to uh, uh, COVID-19, that including diagnostics as well as the therapeutics. In the diagnostic side, we have a rapid antigen detection for COVID-19, which we call a COVID stick, which is very rapid. In the 15 minutes, we can uh, detect whether you have infection or not infection with accuracy. And uh, on the uh, therapeutic side, we have neutralizing antibody. It depends uh, when you get infected in the um, uh, mild to moderate space. We are having a IV form as well intranasal form of the uh, uh, neutralizing antibody. As of today, we have uh, finished the phase one for the IV form and into phase two with all patient setting as inpatient setting as well. In intranasal form of the neutralizing antibody, we just got the FDA clearance and we are right now doing the uh, phase one uh, clinical trials for it. Now, the, uh, the beauty of this one is a combination of these may uh, having uh, both uh, inside and outside approach that you can get to the uh, nose clearance, a lung infection blockage as soon as possible as intranasal, and then you get to systematically with the IV form. Now, our approach to this whole COVID-19 is uh, detect early and treat timely. Now, treat timely, including different stage of COVID-19 patient treated with different drugs because not a one drug fits all. We have the uh, moderate to uh, uh, mild to moderate with neutralizing antibody. With uh, moderate to severe, we have a small pill called the abivertinib, a BTK inhibitor. is a strong cytokine storm. We call a stopper, cytokine storm stopper, which is a blocking the production of a pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine, including R2, uh, R6, R1 beta, as well as uh, uh, TNF alpha. We have uh, close to 200 patients already treated, and uh, half of them uh, in the US, and half of them, uh, more than half of them uh, in uh, uh, Brazil. So we're gonna get to a data read of the, probably within a month or so. That's very exciting. We can't wait to, to see the data. And the, lastly, but not leastly, uh, we have the uh, mesenchymal stem cell treating a severe patient in the ICU settings. And uh, we have so far have uh, tested the patients in the ICU and every one of the patient, I'm emphasized here, every one of the patient discharged from ICU and uh, you know the uh, right after that the discharge from hospital as well this is very exciting and we recently announcing a uh, acquiring a compound for the uh, lung hauler that means you know you have lingering effect after infection which typically lasts uh, over you know uh, nine months potentially over years to come and we have a low dose uh, naltrexone which is good for the fibromyalgia, and that which is a similar symptom to a lung hauler. So we got that exclusive license with our subsidiary, a uh, wholly owned subsidiary uh, called the Silex. We're gonna be able to exercise this one as relating to a uh, non-opium pain management as well on that company. So uh, we are uh, pursuing very aggressive, potentially gets into uh, phase two, phase three right away with that compound. So you really have the complete spe spectrum from diagnost from a rapid diagnostic COVID stick to a range of therapeutics. And I, I just want to ask you one quick question, which is when we saw the president get COVID and he was treated with the Regeneron MAV cocktail, Sorrento is working when you describe one of your therapeutics as a MAV cocktail, a similar type product, right? Yes. So uh, what we have is right now at this moment, STI 2020 in clinics is a single antibody, works on the, uh, the uh, Washington strand, UK strand, and we just found it out. It works on the Brazilian strand potentially too. 
So that's very exciting. But we, as you noticed, that we got the license from uh, Monsana as well from antibody discovery from our library. And we have over a dozen antibodies right now, works on all uh, variants of concern and as today discovered, that including the South Africa, Brazilian strains, UK strain, Washington strain, and we are having a COVID shield on a development to treat all variants of concern as today is known. Henry, how many people at Sorrento are working on COVID? Oh, we have hundreds of people right now working on COVID. We have uh, uh, IND staff with uh, say uh, 100 PhD and we have uh, three, over 300,000 square feet, the CGMP manufacturing facility. Okay. It's Thank you so big. much. So I cover Sorrento, ticker symbol SRNE, buy rating, be, please, Feel free to go to the Dawson James website and pull down the report. Uh, Henry, great job. Let Thank me you. flip now to Ted. Ted, one of the questions that comes up when you and I talk about prophase is how big is the market opportunity for diagnostics? And I just want to remind you of a conversation that we had, particularly when the government uh, stimulus came out and the COVID care package. The government, in essence, it just in the US, we're not talking global define the market. So people who question, is this a billion dollar market? How would you respond to that? Sure, Jason, would you mind if I just give 30 seconds or a minute on the background of my company first? No, we're gonna get to the company. Oh, I okay, fine. So how big is the opportunity? Um, look, the Biden administration uh, pushed for, you know, billions, actually hundreds of billions, more than a trillion, but hundreds of billions of dollars for uh, testing uh, for COVID. They wanna get the schools open. We now have sports arenas opening back up. We have weddings and events opening back up. Um, COVID goes through waves. Um, everybody is a little burned out right now uh, because of what we went through the last several months. All of a sudden they see a downtick in the incidence of COVID. Everybody thinks that the worst is over. They're thinking psychologically because people are getting vaccinated that COVID is going away. What people don't understand is that in the entire country, um, less than 20% or a little over 20% of the population has gotten one vaccine, less than 15% have gotten two vaccines. So first of all, only a very small percentage of the population has actually been vaccinated. Secondly, people also don't understand just because you get vaccinated doesn't mean that you can't get COVID. You can still get COVID. And in some instances, it's actually more dangerous because you'll be asymptomatic or you'll have such light symptoms. You won't even realize that you're sick with COVID, which means that you're even more dangerous to passing it on to other people. So testing is going to be a tremendous industry over the course of this year. We're going to have waves up and down in COVID. Right now we had a downtick in February, but already in Europe, we're seeing an uptick in the incidence of COVID they're, and they're panicking around the rest of the world while we think that, that we've beaten you know, this virus. Well, uh, uh, so clearly one of the things you said was that the government has allocated not a billion, but billions, many billions Hundreds of dollars of to define the diagnostic market. We're not even talking about therapeutics. So clearly the potential to expand your business and diagnostics is huge. This is a multi, multi-billion dollar market. Tell me a little bit about prophase and about the epiphany you had to make the transition from being what you were to where you're focused today. Sure. So we used to own the Coldies Cold Remedy brand, which we sold to Mylan for $50 million. We kept our manufacturing facility and we still have a dietary supplement business that we sell into 40,000 food, drug and mass stores around the country. Last year, because of COVID, we saw an opportunity to both help people um, with testing. And so we pivoted into uh, owning two uh, CLIA labs. These are high complexity molecular labs, testing for COVID and other upper, upper respiratory incidences and viruses. Um, we have the capacity for 60,000 tests per day. Most of that is free capacity. Our motto was, if you build it, they will come. So we believe that because we have this tremendous, and you know that's from the movie with Kevin Costner, Field of Dreams. And so our, our approach was if we build this tremendous capacity and the other key point is the turnaround times. Most of the large labs, they turn around the results in three to seven days. We turn around res our results in less than 24 hours. So we have tremendous capacity, 
Turnaround times are fast. If you think you have COVID, you want to know that day. You don't want to know a week from now. Um, so we have the fast turnaround times. We have a, an incredible app for reporting results. Um, we also have the newest, latest state-of-the-art Thermo Fisher equipment for testing for multiplex, which is multiple genes. So that we're testing for the COVID strains and mutations. So we're still going to get the true positives from, um, you know, from, from these mutations. Finally, we're growing rapidly. We just raised about $43 million in January. Most of that was a 1250 or share. Our stock's trading at, at a little over half that. We're trading near, it's amazing because of the NASDAQ sell-off, we're trading at near liquidating value where our, our company is growing, cash flow is growing, earnings are growing, and it's a tremendous opportunity for our company. Ted, thank you. That was very concise. Sure. I'd like to hit a little bit on what is your capacity capability. So right now, I know that you have two places where you're processing. I visited the one facility out on Long Island, which is absolutely beautiful. How much capacity uh, do you have? And let's say if you were at 100% capacity, how much revenue would that equate to? Oh, I haven't even calculated those numbers. If we even get to 10 or 15 percent of capacity, you know, our numbers are going to go through the roof. As it is, we're we're, and I don't want to get into specific numbers because we're reporting next week. Um, but we're at under 10 percent capacity utilization, and even at those rates, uh, we're growing rapidly. We're cash flow positive. We're generating earnings and growing. So we're tickled pink with our performance. Uh, we really started the business in Old Bridge, New Jersey started testing a little bit in December, rapidly grew into January. Um, we saw the opportunity, so we built out a larger lab in Garden City, New York. Um, and I, I mean, clearly the opportunity is enormous. Uh, as I mentioned, because of uh, wedding events and sporting arenas and schools opening up, there is so much new opportunity for testing. And the way we view it is, yes, this is a profitable business for us. At the same time, we're helping people because if we can isolate the people that are COVID positive, faster, we hopefully are, are going to mitigate the transmission um, of, of, the, of the virus. So one, you know, you're, you're being a little bit modest, but uh, because I know that you have a tremendous capacity to test a lot of samples. And I know that if I looked at, you know, I did a very interesting model on Prophase where we looked at margin on one grid and capacity utilization on the other grid. And I'll tell you that the numbers get crazy when we start looking at 20, 30, 40% capacity. And we start looking at margin assumptions. Uh, you know, I think my assumptions are very conservative. So we've really broken this down in the model. I'm excited to see, you know, what where what you're going to report next week and you hopefully give us some insights into how the business is doing and just one last question how do you go about selling this capacity how, what how does that work so there are rfps that are popping up all over the place uh there's a tremendous uh, when the biden administration got the hundreds of billions of dollars uh approved all of that is going to states which is then mandate mandated to school systems so we have school systems that, that we're now talking to at the same time, as I mentioned, you have sports arenas at the same time, we're talking to wedding event planners that are all excited to be opening up again. There's so many different avenues or so many groups of people that we are talking to. It is hard. Honestly, it's hard to keep up. So, but we're building our business brick by brick, uh, test by test and, you know, quarter through quarter, right? There are going to be ups and downs. Um, February uh, had terrible weather, which slowed things down a little bit for shipping of specimens. Uh, we do a lot of testing across the state of Texas. Texas, I guess, never had flow, snow flurries before, and they just shut down. So we slowed that in February, and, and now we're growing again. But quarter by quarter, there's no question we're going to be growing our, our revenues, cash flow, and earnings going forward. And as I mentioned, we're trading near liquidating value with a, a positive growth, actually positive revenue growth and cash flow positive. And we have a very strong balance sheet as I, um, I'll announce it next week. We have a lot of cash on our balance sheet. So Ted, you did a great job and you started to set up AMRO to talk a little bit when you were talking immunologically about how do you, could you still get COVID if you've been vaccinated? How, how do you know what your COVID status is? And AMRO, I, I really see you as a 
critical piece of the COVID jigsaw puzzle. And, and of course, this has huge implications beyond COVID for a range of diseases from cancer. And I know you guys are working on psoriasis, but talk with us a little bit about uh, what is Aditex and what is the Aditex score? And help me understand what you are seeing in terms of people's immunological profile who are maybe had COVID, maybe you're in the hospital, maybe got a COVID vaccine and they wanna know if they're safe. Help us understand how you fit in this landscape. Jason, thanks for having us on the panel. And I just wanna to touch on a quick point that Ted started talking about in terms of the market size uh, for COVID-19 and beyond. Uh, one interesting thing that we're seeing from our point of view is there is a unique shift in the marketplace where diagnostics is not only going to be driven by medical professionals, but it's also being driven by individuals. Individuals now are keenly aware of how critical our immune status is. Uh, they wanna be tested for COVID, which are the tests that Ted and uh, Henry provide. The, you know, society as a whole is becoming very, very aware of how important it is for us to understand our body. So we see that fundamental shift in the market and we see that market uh, continuing to grow from where we are. Now, back to your point, um, it's gonna be really interesting now to see how as we go through this next phase of the pandemic, now we need to begin to understand our immunity status. So Ted, for example, is talking about weddings are opening up. Uh, people wanna go back to sporting events. Look, we are all so ready to get back to living. And that's just reality, it's human nature. And what's happening in the marketplace where 2020, the focus has been on infection status because it's a way to mitigate risk. It's a, it's a, it's a social approach to really minimizing uh, infection and death. But now as we move forward, we need to begin to understand how do we get back to reopening um, societies? How do we get back to work? How do we get back to, again, sporting events? And, and one of the key answers and one of the key tools is understanding our immunity status. So what does that mean? You know, personally, uh, for myself, for my family, we need to not only uh, feel comfortable that there is infection control being done by whatever organization or whatever location we go to, but we also need to understand, are we really protected? So if we get vaccinated and you know that the numbers are out there in terms of statistics, whether it's Moderna or Pfizer or J&J or any other vaccines, those come with statistics based on the clinical trials that they did. I know personally you know, I don't want to be one out of 10 that end up not developing immunity because of whatever, whatever factors. So where Aditex score is, and that's the commercial brand that we have for our innovation platform, we basically look at multiple analytes with very high specificity, very, very high sensitivity. We run the data through algorithms, set of algorithms to provide meaningful information, whether you've been exposed, whether you were not exposed, and if you were exposed, do you have an indication of robust immunity? And we truly believe that this is gonna be one of the key tools that we are going to need in addition to PCR testing to really begin to uh, you know, go back to what we used to be doing uh, before COVID. And that's one segment of Aditex, of course. You mentioned earlier that we have the therapeutics segment, which is pretty unique uh, or pretty uniquely uh, and pretty strategically uh, complement the Aditex score side. And that's reprogramming the immune system to address organ rejection, autoimmunity, and allergies. So that's a little bit of overview of what we do, Jason. Have you gathered any insights in terms of the Aditex score where someone, ha have you had a chance to test people who've been vaccinated? And do you get a feel for what their fingerprint looks like? And are you seeing variation in the immunological profiles that maybe some people, have a stronger immune defense after defense after vaccination versus some people who maybe don't get a huge impact after being vaccinated. Are, are you seeing that kind of variation? We are, uh, Jason. We have been uh, Aditex scoring people uh, for clinical study purpose, and uh, we're just going on the commercial side as we announced about a month ago. 
and we are seeing interesting patterns now i'm not ready to provide any conclusions right now we want to be you know we want to be very accurate when we're ready to do that but we we are certainly looking at patterns in terms of you know moderna pfizer people that had covid and got vaccinated people that had covid and did not get vaccinated or don't want to be vaccinated so really interesting patterns in terms of you know even the um you know the the types of antibodies that are being developed when for someone that's vaccinated and someone who developed antibodies but you know but did not get vaccinated or did not get the vaccine really interesting patterns and i think that knowledge again is going to be very critical for us as to move forward not only in reopening society but also developing therapeutics that henry was talking about uh, earlier right and and that was my next question which is if someone is in the hospital and they have a you know a serious infection with covid you would think that the Aditex score would become a critical element towards their treatment but right? that's correct right we, we certainly believe so yes because we can objectively monitor what's going on with their immunity uh, and with their immune uh, with their immune system as we're administering certain therapeutics okay so Henry, I'd like to ask you a question, which is, you know, when you hear AMRO talking a little bit about the immunological profile, I know that that is not new information to you. Uh, but where is Sorrento? You, you know, it seems like it would be, you know, all of you guys seem very complementary to each other. So uh, my first question, Henry, is, uh, how, do you find that technology exciting? Do you have a similar technology that you're working on in Sorrento? in terms of understanding the immunological profile of a patient who might be getting a Sorrento therapeutic in the future. Yeah, Amolo's uh, technology is very exciting. And the reason is that when you do therapeutics, if you have already have, uh, let's say, a neutralizing antibody in your body, you know, maybe a neutralizing antibody is not the way to go. If you have a T cell profiling, if you have an immunity, uh, T cell immunity, Maybe you have a very strong, but if you can detect the patient in the, uh, uh, you know, moderate to severe or, you know, in the mild to moderate, if they don't have antibody, that's when you want to uh, uh, use the neutralizing antibody, especially, especially right now, the uh, yeah. ma if majority, if not all, I believe it's all right now, it's all vaccine against the Washington strain. So the yeah. vaccination gonna escaping the, uh, you know, in the South Africa strand, Brazilian strands, you know, name it, some um, emerging strand going to be escaping. If you have a score, you can detect it. You have immunity against Washington strand, but not South Africa. That's when you can select the, which neutralizing antibody to use. And at the Washington strand, for example, the uh, strands against the originally uh, Washington strand being the start for distribution in uh, three states right now, you know, that's including California because it's not useful. And they have a majority of the strain is uh, not even, uh, not even uh, Washington strains. Well, that's so, so what, 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 Henry, you're bringing up a, a different topic, which is the vaccines today are all going after what I thought was a very conserved region on the spike protein. But what you're saying is that we may see escape where that region may not be as conserved as we think it is. No, so the, all of the vaccine, uh, Jason, is right now, is all against the whole spike protein. Correct. There is no subunits right now. There is no conserved regions. And we actually are studying the uh, conserved regions. So maybe you can have a one common uh, you know, uh, regions that potentially works on all coronavirus. However, as of today, everyone at the vaccine either messenger RNA or adenovirus, they uh, all against the whole spike protein. And when you have the whole spike of protein, when you have some mutation, which is have a collection of mutation for South, as South Africa, Brazil, they change the conformation. They, when they change conformation, some of parts you have a neutralizing antibody, then some of parts you, you don't. And uh, when you have the binding pocket being the mutated conformation change, your vaccine may not work at all. And that's where it's getting very interesting. Right. If everybody thinking you got the vaccinated, but you don't have the immunity against the variants of concern. Yeah. And one quick question for you, Henry, you also have Stack, which is a rapid test. You heard Ted talking about his capacity to you know, be a provider and really turn around at a very large scale testing. 
how, how do those two things compare? How does a, is Kobe stick a point of care test? And then on a positive, you probably go for a second test. Tell me how yeah. you think that. So COVID sticks right now is a lab developed tests, which you can use in a uh, clear lab for testing as long as you validate it uh, against the uh, PCR approach, which is what Ted is doing. And I think a very complementary, two company, very complementary. So Kobe stick potentially could be a useful uh, in the clear lab setting. Meanwhile, if you get the UA approval, then you can potentially commercialize in the point of care if you got the at home base then you can use at home on the potentially on the supervision of a professionals. Great job, guys. So three companies, I really like them. We've got complete coverage from the initiation of coverage report to the latest updates right available on our website. Uh, you can see CEOs very smart. They understand their company. They understand their drivers. And what we're looking for in this panel is companies that not only can bring great things to all of us and help you know put the covid pandemic behind us but that are leveraged and and through this great work will benefit the company and grow the company and then and then you can see how the infrastructure and technology that these companies have can help down the road in terms of other things from as simple as flu to being therapeutically prepared for the next pandemic Thanks. it pains me to cut this conversation short <laughs> It's been an incredible panel, gentlemen, but we are hearing from, I believe, all of you. Jason, really lovely job uh, moderating this discussion. Uh, Henry, we'll see you in, in uh, less than a couple hours on the other track. Ted, uh, okay. good to have you with us as well. Amro, shall we stick around and uh, talk about Added X a little bit more? Yeah, that sounds good. Awesome. Thanks, thank guys. you all. Thank Hello, you, gentlemen. Jason. Thank you. Perfect. Everybody, thank you so much. We did get a little Kobe sticks discussion, but uh, 1215, you will uh, hear more from Sorrento on the other track. Amro, uh, why don't you go ahead and share your screen if you have a presentation and I'll let you take it away, my friend. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Elliot. Let me... A lot, a lot of fans of your product on our YouTube chat right now, Amro. Oh, really? Yeah. Look, it's... Um... It's really timely, Elliot. I mean, it is right now. Um, I mean, that's as I was sharing with the panel earlier. That's the real question is what is my immunity status? So I can understand how to make a decision uh, moving forward. So hopefully you guys can all see my screen. Let's see. Elliot, are you, there we yeah, go. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Great. Well, again, my name is Amro Albana. I am the co-founder and CEO of Aditex. Uh, we're traded on NASDAQ. We actually went public back end of June, back in 2020, and our symbol is ADTX. Uh, just a few seconds here on the safe harbor disclaimer, if you don't mind taking a quick look. And I really, look, obviously the audience here is going to be uh, hearing from a lot of companies, a lot of good quality companies, but I want to summarize Aditex really in three main points. Uh, we are a unique company in that we combine a unique combination and a strategic combination of therapeutics and health tech, both of which focus on improving uh, the health of our immune system, and both of which share one thing in common. They're focused on taking a fundamentally different approach to therapeutics and immunotherapies, as well as immunodiagnostics. Number two, we have two key milestones to accomplish in 2021. On the therapeutic side, we wanna make sure we transition the company from preclinical to clinical. On the monitoring side, the diagnostic side, we wanna get into meaningful revenues. So we're, again, we're a young company. We've been public for about almost nine months now. And these are two key milestones that I have been communicating with the market as far as how I see the company transitioning from where we are today to where we want to be. So uh, becoming a clinical stage company and getting into meaningful revenues with the additive score side of the equation. And frankly, we have an attractive valuation. We're right now trading in market cap of 44 million. So hopefully the market can see the potential growth for a company like ours with everything we're doing. So what we do is we're developing 
promising discoveries, promising innovations that are focused on immunotherapy as well as immune monitoring. And I'll get into more details. We are located in Silicon Valley. That's our product development center up in Mountain View. We have our immune monitoring center, the Aditex Immune Monitoring Center in Richmond, Virginia. That's actually where I'm at right now. It's right next door. And our finance, accounting, legal, business development is located in New York City. So let's get into the reprogramming side, which is the therapeutic side. The field we're in is labeled as immune tolerance or induction of immunity. And the whole concept of immune reprogramming, and instead of suppressing the immune system to stop it from doing something you don't want it to do, you want to retrain it, you want to reprogram it to behave differently. So as an example, think of organ transplantation. When someone receives an organ, our immune system will do its natural job and will begin to reject it. It will recognize that it's a foreign organ. It will begin to reject it. Autoimmune diseases, our immune system somehow treats our own cells and tissues as foreign and it will begin to attack it. So as allergies, the same concept, except it's with external substances, allergens. And the whole field of immune tolerance is to reprogram the immune system to make it uh, identify a specific cell or a specific tissue as self. If we're able to accomplish that, that obviously becomes a significant breakthrough in the field. And immune tolerance has been shown to be achievable, but the questions really remain to be, can it be made into a product? Is it feasible logistically and economically to produce? And will it require additional hospitalization? And we believe the approach we'll take, we are taking, actually does uh, answer all these three, three questions. It can be made into a product, it will not require additional hospitalization, and it is feasible and logistically possible to ship and produce, and very economic, economically possible to, to produce. So that's really our approach. Uh, very strong IP portfolio. We have 95 issued patents in the US and internationally, and we did it in four animal models. I'll just talk about three in skin allograph as a proof of concept in organ rejection. We've shown an increase in survival of the graph by 300%. We've done it in psoriasis as an autoimmunity model. We've shown 69% reduction in skin thickening and 38% reduction in scaling. And we've done it in T1D. It's published and it's public study. And we've shown reversal of hyperglycemia and suppression of T1D. So very promising animal data. Of course, as we all know, success in animal studies does not necessarily translate into humans. And that really becomes the major question for our therapeutic side for these three indications, which is moving forward with human trials. So major inflection point once we reach to human trials, uh, as we announced this morning, psoriasis is the very first indication, first program that we are pushing forward through trials by Q4 is what we're anticipating. Skin allograph will follow psoriasis and we're looking at first half of 2022 and type, the, type 1 diabetes we're looking at getting into clinical trials in second half of 2022. Beyond that, our uh, specific technology that we are working with to translate into uh, multiple indications really can translate into many other indications beyond the three that I just mentioned in autoimmune diseases, allergies, dermatology, and certainly organ rejection. And you can see the pharma market is pretty active in, in these indications. And we really look at it the two ways. One, the three indications that we're working on, type one diabetes specifically and psoriasis. As you can see, a lot of activities, a lot of interest in the marketplace by big pharma in these two indications. So that's why we're pushing forward with psoriasis first, T1D after. On the skin allograph, there is really not much activities, but that shows big opportunity. Plus it really becomes a proof of concept in an organ rejection model because skin allograph is actually a pretty challenging model. And if we can show success in terms of safety and efficacy, it, we believe it opens up the doors to beyond just skin, of course, organ, solid organs, kidney, liver, and others. So big, big excitement, big opportunity we see with the ADI technology. So let me switch over to the Aditex score side. We started working um, on monitoring the immune system more than two years ago, way before COVID, and we did a partnership with Stanford University to develop a platform that will enable us to understand the immune 
uh, or someone's immune profile. And the reason for that is, as we were developing therapeutics, it's actually the conversation that we touched on in the previous panel, as a company is developing therapeutics, you have to understand someone's immunity profile before you administer and as you're developing the drug, during clinical trials and post clinical trials so you can continue to monitor someone's immune system so you can get an idea what's going on with their immune system. If you're programming something, you gotta understand its profile. An Aditic score is a platform with multiple applications in multiple categories to analyze with high specificity and high sensitivity, multiple analytes of the immune system, antibodies, cytokines, and others to give us meaningful information about the immune system. So areas that we see additive score in, allergies, uh, general health, like gut health, drug and vaccine response, which is what we just discussed, disease susceptibility. Think about kids, young kids and young children that could potentially develop T1D. That's where we see additive score in. Organ rejection, understanding or predicting or even detecting an organ being rejected early on uh, years in advance in some cases would be extremely helpful um, to, um, you know, to, to individuals. And of course, infectious diseases, which is COVID. So speaking of COVID, let's talk about where we see COVID right now. Again, I, um, I'm not sure how many people already attended the panel, but this is a little bit of repetition as far as COVID-19. The question right now is going to be in 2021, what is my immunity status? I really believe there's going to be a transition from uh, focus on protection, on infection to protection. Uh, I do believe infection testing will continue, but now people are going to look at protection. So let's take an, a great example, uh, a cruise ship, you know, cruise ships right now wanting to open up. So if they're focused on infection only, uh, it's great to, you know, to, to, to say that a ship, which is pretty impossible to do, a ship is infection free, but even if they can, what about from door to shore? What about the hotel? What about the airline? What about you know, everything else in between? What about excursions? So ultimately, we need to understand protection status. We need to understand immunity status. That's where we see 2021 and beyond is going. And this is where Aditex Core is perfectly positioned to provide immunity or an indication of immunity status, whether those who are uh, exposed, not exposed, vaccinated, not vaccinated, we really do need to understand you know, individuals' immunity status. So how does it work? We're, this is really why I labeled it as health tech, uh, where samples get collected uh, through channel partners, collection sites, uh, hospitals, uh, you know, uh, major employers, CLIA labs, other CLIA labs, they collect the samples, they have an agreement with us, they ship us the samples, we process it in our immune monitoring center, Aditex Immune Monitoring Center. We process the samples, we collect the raw data, we run it through our proprietary algorithms, and we ship back Aditex score report, outlining the individual numbers, as well as a set of comments to uh, guide someone of what those numbers mean. So they can make a decision individually or they can make a decision along with their physician. So let me summarize Aditext with one minute left, I believe here. Um, again, one, it's a pretty unique company in a sense where we combine therapeutics and health tech. On the therapeutic side, we in 2021, we are transitioning the company from preclinical to clinical and you've seen our announcement today, psoriasis being the first to go into clinical trials in Q4 uh, of 2021, of course, assuming all the regulatory approvals is secured. But we are well on our way with our IND enabling GMP talks and looking to begin that clinical trial in Q4. On the health tech side, Aditex Core, uh, this is the really catalyst for our revenues in 2021. And we're starting with COVID-19. Uh, I'd like to just bring up the fact that I say COVID-19 is, is certainly a health challenge. It's a global challenge, but I also believe it became a trillion dollar awareness campaign where individuals become or became keenly aware of how critical it is for them to understand their, their health status and not just rely on medical professionals. And that's where we see Aditex score being a major contributor in this field. 
So those are the two key milestones that we are pushing forward in 2021. And with a 44, 45 million as a young company, we feel we are very well positioned as, a, as, a, as an attractive uh, investment uh, because of what we're doing, what we're accomplishing, and what we're looking to do in 2021. So with that, I do certainly appreciate uh, everyone attending and listening to Aditext. And I thank you, Elliot, and your team for inviting us to present at your uh, conference. Absolute pleasure, Amro. Uh, you know, we do have a question from the chat from Joseph Sutton. Uh, it, it, would you mind diving in a little further to your channel partnership with Easy? Uh, he's yeah. curious because he says the website only has FDA approved tests. So he's he's curious about the FDA status for Aditex. Yeah. So what we're, you know, to first of all, we're we launched Aditex Core for COVID-19 as a lab developed test. So we secured our CLIA certification. We're operating as a CLIA certified lab and we launched COVID-19 as a lab developed test LDT. Uh, I know that some of the audience members probably interested in knowing the status of our EUA. We submitted an EUA back in August. We really have not had any, uh, you know, communications with the FDA other than the, you know, canned email that we get that we are in queue. Uh, but um, with that said, uh, and I said that it's actually last year, our interest as a company is not only EUA and it's not only LDT, it's to really go for full 5, 10K for the platform as a whole. And that's what we're pursuing. Now, as far as Easy, Easy is a channel partner. We signed up with them. Uh, they have eight locations in Southern California, one location up in Northern California. And that really becomes our first uh, physical locations where people, uh, certainly in California, can go and begin to get Aditex scored. Um, but they are a channel partner and we announced that partnership about a week, a week and a half ago. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for that. So uh, another question here from Gab A. If ADTX issues shares in the future, uh, do you have an idea of what those proceeds will be used for if that is a part of the near future here? Yeah, so a uh, couple things. One, we have enough cash to operate in 2021, and I've always wanted to make sure that the company is, is, is not in survival mode, is in growth mode, and both, uh, both programs are now funded by the capital we have that we, you know, that, we, um, you know, that we filed last in Q3. And of course, we're about to file our K as well, just like everybody else. Um, the capital markets for us becomes really focused on growth, meaning if there is a program that we want to advance, we want to accelerate, and I see that it contributes to the growth of the company, then we will engage with the capital markets. Beautiful. And then from Chris, uh, keep grinding, Amro. You're on to something. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here. Uh, really informative, uh, hugely topical. We appreciate your insights, Amro. Thank you very much, Elliot. Thank you all. Bye-bye. All right. Fantastic. That is Adidex. They are listed on the NASDAQ as ADTX. Uh, please do reach out to AMRO. You can reach their website, aditxt.com. Uh, we're right on time. We have had some amazing conversations thus far. <laughs> we're not even halfway through, y'all. We may be a, too close to halfway through, but I'm excited uh, to welcome the next presentation, the president of Alpha Cognition, Fred Sanchillo. Uh, Fred, once you get your mic and camera on, you can correct my pronunciation of your last name if indeed I was incorrect. Uh, but this is Fred Sanchillo, president of Alpha Cognition. Uh, they are currently not listed, but very uh, excited to join us. I, I, Fred, shall I turn it right over to you, sir? Yeah, if I have some luck with getting the uh, presentation. No worries at all. There should be a share screen button at the bottom there now that you are uh, joining me as a panelist. Which I have done, but it's not behaving itself here. You can see, can you see my screen? I cannot. Uh, that's not a good thing. Let's see, how do I do this? I'm going to be using... Kelsey, can we make sure he has uh, the opportunity to share his screen, just to confirm? I have... This is the fear of everybody. As you <laughs> oh, no worries. No worries. You're far from the first here. Hey, I see something here. There, there it is. There it is. I see your Zoom screen. So we just need to click over to that presentation. Oh, uh, yeah. How do I do that now? This is not going well here, folks. Oh, no worries at all. Uh, Zoom and the pandemic are the life of us all, my friend. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, now that you're resharing your screen, uh, just the appropriate window, I would say. 
yeah, let me give you, give you a second here. Of course, the talk disappeared. Oh, Lord. This is the worst nightmare. Chris. Chris says we should turn ourselves into cats. I'm assuming yeah, the, I wish I had. <laughs> the reference to uh, I'm not a cat. You know, I, I'm on Word Feud, uh, and I've, I've played four people that say I'm not a cat, Chris. So um, fantastic. Mm -hmm. So uh, Fred, again, alpha I'm, cognition. Sorry, okay. go ahead. I'm, I'm not going to be able to share the screen. Uh, Kelsey, do we have his deck that we can share for him? Yes, give me one moment. Perfect. This is why we have backup plans. We always have a plan B. Well, that's why I sent that out earlier today to make sure somebody else could do it. There is no share screen function here for my, uh, unfortunately for the presentation. So. All right, well, we'll get that up. We are still relatively on time here. So. All right, Kelsey is gonna pull it up. Fred, as we're doing this, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, I can. My name is Fred Sancilio, and I'm president of Alpha Cognition. And uh, I've been in the industry for about 35 years, actually closer to 40 years now. And I've been wow. in, in drug development, in management. I've managed public companies, private companies. Uh, right now, I hold a position as president, and I'm also a board member of Alpha Cognition. And I would really appreciate if somebody can get that presentation up. Uh, like I said, uh, I sent it ahead, ahead of me here. Yep, Kelsey. Uh, I'm going to start doing working on it. Those presentations where the guy uses the, uh, um, you know, the, the the screen in the background to talk. <laughs> really you, you know, it's probably the most engaging presentation we would have. Uh, you know, in any sense, doing. we'll do that live next time we're we're in person. <laughs> yeah. Are we having any luck with that presentation here? Oh uh, yeah, she's sharing it now. Uh, All right. Yeah. So Thank Fred, you know, uh, just give her you. cues on when to go to the next slide, and I'll hop off. Okay, you can go ahead to the next slide, please, and we'll start. And I apologize to the audience for that uh, delay. Uh, before we get started, however, let me uh, uh, remind you about forward-looking statements and the discussion here. Next slide, please. Okay, Alpha Cognition is a late-stage biopharmaceutical company focused on diseases that affect the brain. Our lead compound is Alpha 1062 a patented new chemical entity designed for the treatment of mild to moderate Alzheimer's dementia. This program is utilizing a de-risk regulatory pathway called a 505 u 2 NDA. FDA confirmed that approval will require only a single pivotal bioequivalency study since alpha-1062 is a prodrug of an approved product, but with minimal side effects and the potential for improved long-term outcomes. Alzheimer's disease is a very large and growing market with serious unmet medical needs. In 2019, over 19 million scripts were written for treatment with acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. That would translate to over $7 billion of branded sales for this class of therapeutic. But till now, existing therapeutics have serious gastrointestinal side effects that create overall dissatisfaction and discontinuation. We aim to launch the first new branded acetylcholine esterase inhibitor in over 18 years designed to overcome the side effects seen in all of the products in this class. Next slide, please. Not only do we expect to submit Alpha 1062 for the treatment of mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease in the first half of 22, but we designed a pipeline of life cycle management products to expand our reach into a broader market. Alpha 1062 is being combined with memantine and following a similar 505 2 regulatory pathway for approval. This time, it'll be for moderate to severe Alzheimer's. And we're also developing a nasal, nasal spray formulation for the treatment of traumatic brain injury. Both products are in development and will follow behind the initial approval of Alpha 1062 expected in the first half of 23. This ra rapid development program was only possible with the acquisition of experienced industry professionals with a demonstrated ability to bring products through the development process and into the market. Alpha Cognition's management team has been working together for decades and successfully gained FDA approvals for dozens of products 
and has commercially launched over 20 products successfully. Next slide. I just wanted to take a minute of your time to share a bit of the history of the company with you. Alpha Cognition is not an overnight success, but a company that has been working on neurological products for over 15 years. Starting in the early 2000s, Ken Corkell and Dennis Kay founded the firm to explore treatment uh, opportunities to mitigate rare brain diseases. Years later, and following the acquisition of Alpha 1062, the management team was expanded to include both development and commercial professionals. More recently, a reverse, a reverse merger onto TSXV was completed and trading of our stock will actually begin next week under the symbol ACOG. This important milestone coincides with the ending of pilot clinical studies and the commencement of pivotal phase of development for our lead product, Alpha 1062, for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Next slide, please. So to expand on that, we're entering the final stage of the development of our first product, and we plan to initiate the single pivotal study in Q3 of this year. Top line results should be available in Q4. Following this and the required stability study, we should be seeing a submission to the US FDA in the first half of 22. Next, using a similar formulation approach, we're combining 1062 with the man team to expand usage to include moderate to severe patients. Pilot studies for the combination will commence in the second half of this year. Work on the nasal formulation for the treatment of traumatic brain injury is well underway. We've already completed preclinical tox studies on the nasal delivery of alpha 1062 and completed human phase one and phase one B toxicity trials. We're in the process of completing preclinical pharmacology work expected later this year, and will progress to an IND following review of the data with the FDA early next year. Lastly, our second patented therapeutic, Alpha 602, a protein-based product for the treatment of ALS. This early stage program is in the preclinical phase and has recently gained FDA approval of its orphan drug designation, specifically for ALS. These slides didn't come out very well on the screen. You must be using a Mac or an Apple. An Apple. Next slide, please. Alzheimer's disease is characterized by loss, uh, memory loss, behavior changes, and loss of many everyday functions. What's been clear for decades is that the disease begins to destroy neurons that secrete and neurons that bind a chemical called acetylcholine. That's a neurotransmitter. As the number of neurons decreases, both acetylcholine and alpha-7 nicotinic receptors are reduced, directly impacting memory, learning, and executive function. These are characteristic of Alzheimer's. Current therapeutics increase acetylcholine by inhibiting the enzyme called acetylcholinesterase that otherwise regulates it. Hence, the class is called acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. What is unique about alpha-1062 is that it's not only an inhibitor of the enzyme, thereby increasing acetylcholine, but it also enhances functionality of the alpha-7 receptor and provides a second possible mode of action. Next slide, please. Okay, I wanted to give you all a better understanding of what the actual molecule looks like and why the FDA considers this a new chemical entity but allows us to rely on previously submitted data for rasidine. Rasidine is the brand name of galanthamine. Galanthamine is the active material and it's depicted on the left. What we've done was deactivate the molecule by binding a benzyl ester to the hydroxyl group that you can see at the top of the screen. That's the OH in red. This, uh, coupled with making a gluconic acid salt, to enhance the solubility creates an entirely new molecule depicted on the right. It's totally inert when it enters the gut and highly water soluble. However, once in contact with certain enzymes that usually are found in large concentrations in the liver, the gluconate disassociates from the molecule and the enzyme is cleaved 
releasing galanthamine as the metabolite. Galanthamine then becomes the only substance that remains and travels to the brain where it functions as an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor and an alpha-7 nicotinic agonist. Next slide. Now, keeping this in mind, and again, without a pointer, this is more, a little bit more difficult. It looks, this is what, what occurs. This diagram is a cross-section of the small intestine. When any of the current acetylcholine esterase inhibitors on the left enter the intestinal lumen, they, they're active. They've not been deactivated. They're not inert. And they're consequently absorbed into the intestinal wall. The inhibitor, the active inhibitor, binds to neurons in the intestinal wall and causes vomiting and diarrhea. This is classic for all drugs in this class. This action not only causes nausea and diarrhea, it also reduces the amount of acetylcholine esterase inhibitor available to circulate. Hence, you see slightly depressed bioavailability. Now, Let's take a look at the right side, which is alpha-1062. Alpha-1062 enters the gut and totally bypasses the neurons. It doesn't see them. It's totally inert. When it does that, it passes directly into circulation at higher concentrations than the active counterpart. Following an absorption through the hepatic first, there's, all right, there's a hepatic activation that then rips off the benzyl ester and releases the galantamine. So all of this occurs as a first pass effect in the liver. What's left is galantamine at very high concentrations and it travels to the brain. Now, what we've seen and what we postulated before we started running clinical trials is that when we compare galantamine with alpha-1062, if this is true, we should see higher bioavailability of galantamine we should see reduced nausea and vomiting as compared to galanthamine itself, which is lower bioavailability and increased nausea and vomiting. Let's go to the next slide. Next slide. There it is. Okay. We believe that alpha-1062 will address the unmet needs of people and caregivers living with Alzheimer's disease. We expect to show significantly less GI side effects and patients may actually be able to start therapy at efficacious doses, thereby seeing improvement in their symptoms earlier. Today, patients have to be titrated up to the effective dose over a very long period of time. We also expect that with limited side effects, patients will become increasingly compliant and long-term benefits will result. Next slide, please. Let me share some preliminary results with you. This is the results from our pilot program. To the left, we show the bioequivalence of alpha-1062 formulation with commercial rasamine. As you can see in this diagram in the chart to the right, we have met the bioequivalence requirements needed for approval. Although, as predicted, slightly more bioavailable, the results are well within acceptable limits suggested by the FDA for such a study. But we believe the next diagram is even more telling. If you can flip to the next slide, please. We've dosed alpha-1062 in several pilot studies. To date, we've not seen any adverse events for the eight milligram tablet. When we compared this with published data for razidine, we found that even at the four milligram dose taken BID, side effects were common. On the right, you'll see, in fact, Large studies conducted on razidine show the incidence of adverse events to be over 35%. As I said, so far, we've not seen any GI adverse events related to alpha-1062, and based on the mechanism of action, we don't expect to see any. Next slide, please. Now, this is a really important diagram. This is extremely telling. Over the past decades, Patients have been treated with galantamine, and some have been able to tolerate the efficacious dose for several years after they've been titrated to the efficacious dose. What Feldman reports here in this publication in Geriatric Psychiatry is that 80% of the patients 
treated with galantamine, that's, that is those patients that tolerated galantamine for three years, were still at home compared to only 30% that didn't receive treatment. When treatment continued for four years, 60% remained free of long-term care, while only 25% of the untreated group remained at home. The cost of long-term care is very high, not only in terms of dollars, but in the patients and caregivers' quality of life. Being able to stay home and avoid a nursing home environment is a priority to most seniors. Next slide, please. Alzheimer's disease presents a large opportunity for a differentiated new brand product. In 2019, over 19 million scripts were written for acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. Translating this into branded sales would show a total market size of over $7 billion. This is an enormous market opportunity that's growing and has a high rate of dissatisfaction among patients, caregivers, and physicians. In our recent survey, we found both physicians and payers willing to accept the profile of our Alpha 1062 product. In fact, we've learned that our product will cause all current prescribers of acetylcholine esterase inhibitors to rethink their prescribing habits and switch some of their patients to Alpha 1062 to avoid the nausea, diarrhea, and vomiting they normally see. Next slide, please. Alpha Cognition is preparing to have an impact on Alzheimer's, on the Alzheimer's market, which is segmented into two major groups, long-term care with specialists, shown here in gray on the left, and primary care physicians, shown in blue. Our compelling value proposition will support reimbursement at branded pricing as we deploy an internal sales force to focus on the long-term care segment. A strategic partnership will expand our efforts into primary care, and we'll expand our distribution into the international market with strategic licensing arrangements. Many of these discussions are already underway. Next slide, please. Our life cycle management plan for 1062 is also, is also to generate applications for two additional products that are already in development. The first will be a combination of 1062 with memagine, uh, memantine following a similar regulatory pathway as for the initial product. This 505B2 application will rely on data for both drugs and expand our market share to include moderate to severe patients of Alzheimer's. A second research program, as I said before, is on the way to develop a unique nasal spray formulation to administer a prodrug into the nose to treat traumatic brain injury. This treatment will be a breakthrough therapy since there are no present approved drugs to treat these patients. In preclinical experiments, we've seen indication that alpha-1062 delivered intranasally may result in a significant deposition of the drug in the brain where it will enzymatically convert to galantamine. Galantamine has shown promise for the treatment of TBI in several human trials, but suffered setbacks due to the same GI effects that limited its use for Alzheimer's disease. In our phase one and phase one B trials in over 90 subjects, alpha 1062 nasal spray was well tolerated and showed minimal side effects, even at doses far higher than presently approved for the current indication. We believe that the preclinical pharmacology work evaluating alpha 1062 as a treatment for TBI will report data by early next year and allow filing of the IND soon after. Next and last slide, please. To wrap this up, our value proposition is compelling. We have several near-term value inflection points to be announced in the next few months, followed by multiple product introductions over the next couple of years. Our lead compound has been de-risked and addresses a large opportunity. Our pipeline adds additional opportunity to treat the entire Alzheimer's market from mild to severe patients. And we'll continue to develop Alpha 1062 for under the indications, starting with TBI. In the long term, we are exploring treatment options for ALS and have already gained FDA agreement with an orphan indication here. Lastly, our in-house development and commercialization teams are optimizing the value proposition and preparing for launch by leveraging internal sales and marketing expertise 
with ongoing strategic partnerships. Next slide. And I want to thank you for your time and attention. And I think we have about a minute or two for a question or two. Yeah, Fred, you weren't even phased, man. That was, that was uh, well, well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so uh, the slides, the slides weren't uh, behaving themselves either. They appear to be shifting all over the place. Well, you got the information out wonderfully. Uh, we do have a couple questions here. If you want to give a couple second answers sure. to each from Sky, uh, could people without Alzheimer's use this drug to increase uh, cognition function? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is there is use off label of galantamine uh, for exactly that reason, and. Uh, it, it's also a neurotropic, which makes you uh, dream very, very uh, vividly. Wow. So market share lo looks to be much bigger than, than I thought originally. That's fantastic. So what age uh, are, are the tests uh, surrounding? Um, curious on how good of a fit it is for early onset Alzheimer's from double B. Yeah, the drug itself, galantamine, and as a result, 1062 is going to be targeted at mild to moderate. Uh, there are plans post approval to look at MCI, which is really prior to getting Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you begin just having memory loss and we are going to be looking at phase four studies in that area and others. So we have uh, very interesting plans for that post marketing. Perfect. Fred, thank you so much for being with us. It was Fred Sancilio. I wasn't correct before, uh, but we are very happy to have you. Alpha Cognition listing on the TSXV. Uh, A-C-O-G. That's alphacognition.com. Thank you so much again, Fred. You're very welcome. Bye -bye. All right. Thanks, All right. So we are going to keep moving on. I mean, we have touched on some very innovative companies and therapies, uh, so, some pipelines that I am just so curious to follow now. Uh, we are going to revisit our COVID discussion, though, with uh, Ted Carcass is coming back uh, to the stage here, CEO of Prophase Labs, listed on the NASDAQ, P-R-P-H. Uh, we just saw him in the panel maybe 30 minutes ago, if that. Ted, welcome back, sir. Uh, just making sure you, you do have the share screen function down there, correct? There we well, let's make sure you get There we go. There. I just want to get off of mute. Ah, <laughs> one thing at a time, Elliot. Come on. And uh, share screen. I, 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 don't, I don't see a screen to share, but um, quite frankly, I don't believe in presentations anyway. I'm going to talk for the next 15 minutes about our company. So if Perfect. you could put up the presentation, that's great. In the background, feel free to do so. Um, and in the meantime, uh, I assume you, Elliot, would you like me to get started? Yes, sir. Please go right ahead. Awesome. All right. So I am Ted Carcass, CEO of Prophase Lab. Stock symbol is PRPH. And yes, we are on NASDAQ. Um, I want to highlight forward-looking statements. I'm not going to read the forward looking statements, but I'm going to presume that everybody listening to me uh, today has. Uh, we are reporting uh, 2020 year end results uh, on March 31st and uh, Q1 approximately May 15th. So look out for those. I have to be careful in terms of what I talk about in terms of numbers since we are about to report next week. So I'll try and dance around that a little bit and try and give you as much flavor as possible. Um, by way of background, I have a 40 year history of investing in and consulting to small cap development stage companies. Um, uh, one of my experiences was with a small uh, Canadian biotech company that was on the verge of bankruptcy. I was a large investor. Um, I forced a restructuring of the company. I forced out the CEO, battled with the board, uh, promoted the two guys underneath the CEO, uh, did two financings for the company, put the biotech company in a new direction. And, Several years later, it was sold to GlaxoSmithKline for $1.4 billion. I, the reason I mention that is from that experience, I learned how to restructure and run a company. And so the company I'm now the CEO of, Prophase Labs, originally I was just a large shareholder of, of our company. After some questionable activities, I decided that the company was in need of a new strategy, new direction. I launched what's called a proxy contest and replaced the uh, board of directors with a new board of directors and became CEO. Originally, I was just looking to liquidate the company, but after becoming the CEO, um, I learned that most of the businesses of the company were actually worthless and I had to write them off. There was only one business that I thought had some value and that was the Coldies, Cold Remedy brand, um, but it had declining sales for four or five years. And so I had to turn that around. Um, I had to restructure the entire company. I had to learn how to be a CEO, 
this started 10, 11 years ago. So this has been a long journey for me. So I restructured the company, uh, replaced virtually everybody in the headquarters. We went from about 26 people to seven people doing the work of 26 people to turn around the brand, turn around the company. Ultimately, we sold the Coldies brand, which had declining sales and was in a lot of trouble. Ultimately, I sold a few years ago for $50 million. And um, the bottom line is I always do what's best for long-term shareholders. That's number one. I grew up investing in small cap development stage companies and, and believe in terminal value on a per share basis. What does that mean? It means every decision I make in terms of raising capital, spending money, hiring people, what to do with our company. It's all with the idea of, is this going to increase the value of our company on a per share basis? And with that, when we sold the Coldies brand for $50 million, I immediately did two stock buybacks, which actually increased the value per share of our company. And then after that, I did three special dividends uh, to benefit the shareholders. So our long-term shareholders uh, believe in me, support me, and, and support my actions. Um, and going forward, again, I will always do what's best to build the value of the company. So now, last year, uh, with COVID hit, we pivoted um, into uh, two high-complexity molecular uh, labs. These are CLIA laboratories in New York and New Jersey. We started with a small one in New Jersey, built it out, saw enormous potential. So we built out a second lab in Garden City, New York. The first lab has capacity of 10,000 tests per day. The second lab has capacity for 50,000 uh, tests per day. Um, we test both swabs and saliva. There is a growing trend for people that are being tested regularly. They don't want a swab stuck way up their nose. Um, so they would rather saliva. We work with one of the best um, saliva collection device companies uh, called Spectrum Solutions uh, that had the first uh, FDA EUA for saliva. That was last April. As I said, we have 60,000 tests per day of capacity. Most of that is free capacity. My approach has, has been to say, if you build it, they will come. As I mentioned uh, in the earlier panel from a Kevin Costner uh, movie, uh, Field of Dreams, the idea is if we build this large capacity, we also have fantastic turnaround times. One of the issues in our industry is that the large labs turnaround times are three, four, even seven days. If you think you have COVID, the last thing you want to do is wait a week to find out to have that confirmed when you could be contagious to so many other people. It is critically important to have fast turnaround times. So we built our labs with the understanding that we'd have tremendous capacity for large customers and we would actually provide turnaround times in less than 24 hours. Um, and as I mentioned, most of the large labs are three to seven days. We also have a state-of-the-art app for reporting results. So we have great technology to go along with our lab processing. And we also, because we're relatively new in the industry, um, we purchased the latest state-of-the-art Thermo Fisher equipment in response to COVID. Thermo Fisher developed a new multiplex platform test for more genes. So we test for all the new uh, COVID strains and mutations. Um, there's currently tremendous activity for new business. It, COVID always goes in waves. We've gone through at least two waves last year. We're going through another wave now. We peaked in January. Um, COVID incidents did drop off um, in late February. Um, and at the same time, interestingly, the stock market sold off, which hit our stock two ways. But meanwhile, we see tremendous activity going forward. Uh, the new administration just uh, received approval for over a trillion dollars of spending. Uh, we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars for testing and for reopening schools. We have sports arenas and stadiums opening. We have weddings and events, and we are talking to so many groups of people. And it's just a matter of when new orders click and when uh, more testing um, continues. Um, I'd like to talk about vaccines for a minute. There's a little bit of confusion there. As of today, only a little more than 20% of the population has even received one vaccine. And it's under 15% have received two vaccines. So to think that all of a sudden COVID has gone away because of vaccines, it's just not true. The fact of the matter is COVID goes in waves, just like the cough cold uh, season. Um, it's gonna go through waves. In fact, we're going through a new wave of COVID uh, over in Europe. Uh, we're in parts of Europe, it's actually picking up and becoming very dangerous. Uh, and it's clear that that new wave is going to hit the United States. Um, I don't want to be a bummer, but when it comes to vaccines, when they talk about uh, percentage efficacy, they're talking about to save people from severe symptoms and death. 
We are not talking about preventing people from either getting COVID or from transmitting COVID to others. So vaccines are great. Uh, and that's why I went to the elderly first who were uh, most at risk of severe symptoms and death. Um, but the truth of the matter is vaccines don't prevent you necessarily from getting COVID. And even worse, if you are vaccinated and you get COVID and you don't have symptoms, makes it's like a ticking time bomb, you're a walking time bomb, you can pass COVID on to others, makes it a very dangerous situation. Um, so vaccines are critically important. Obviously, we don't want people dying. We don't want people getting severe symptoms, but you have to be careful in terms of confusing um, severe symptoms when they're talking about efficacy percentages as opposed to preventing you from getting COVID or transmitting COVID. Um, look, a lot of people have gotten burned out from wearing masks and from social distancing. People are getting out now. They're wearing masks less. The truth of the matter is, uh, because of the psychological wave of not wearing masks and less social distancing and, and more sports arenas opening up, there's going to be another COVID, uh, uh, wave of, of COVID. We are extremely well situated as uh, testing starts to rise again at some point in the future. Um, as far as our company is concerned, we are growing rapidly every, every quarter. Um, I don't wanna get into too much of the details now. We started testing for COVID um, really just started ramping up in late December. So you're going to see a, a bump in revenues and earnings, obviously. I don't think that's any secret um, from, from our December testing, but then we've already announced, um, and this I already announced publicly, we had an initial goal that by the end of December to have uh, 1,000 tests per day of actual processing. Um, that's based on a five-day week. We are open seven days, but I like to average it based on five since weekends are often slower. Um, we very rapidly grew and hit not only 1,000, but 1,500 tests a day by the end of December. In January, I've also stated publicly, we actually hit 2,500 tests per day, which is an enormous amount of tests. If you think about about 95% of the labs in the country, probably only doing 200 or 500 tests a day. We grew, we executed where others didn't. We grew very rapidly um, in January. Um, I don't want to get into the first quarter numbers now. Unfortunately, uh, I'll probably say a little bit more when we announce our uh, year-end 2020 numbers um, uh, publicly you know, in the press release. And of course, then on May 15th, we'll announce our, our Q1 numbers. Um, I, will, I will tell you that in the, in the month of February, there was tremendous bad weather. We do an awful lot of testing in, in Texas and uh, Texas really all but shut down. Um, if you think about it, when we test across the country, we use FedEx uh, for shipping specimens into our lab. Um, everyone was concerned with FedEx, also testing facilities shut down. So there was a slowdown. And then also that was um, exacerbated by COVID testing dropping off. But by the same token, our three largest customers are actually now going forward, actually looking to grow their testing. I'm looking forward to our uh, testing actually growing. So in any event, when you look quarter to quarter, um, our numbers are growing rapidly, our revenues are growing rapidly, our cash flow is growing rapidly, our earnings are gonna be growing rapidly. Meanwhile, NASDAQ sold off. Um, we just raised an enormous amount of capital, uh, about $43 million in January. Most of that was at 12.50 a share. Our stock price now is like half that. And meanwhile, um, I haven't reported the numbers, but we have a tremendous amount of cash on the balance sheet. We have tremendous network and capital. Um, we're getting down near liquidating value. Well, meanwhile, our revenues are growing, our earnings are growing, our cash flow is growing. So if you're interested as a long-term investor, I really am not interested in short-term investors, but we grow the value of our company long-term. And I would suggest that you certainly want to take a look at our companies if you're interested in being a long-term uh, investor. Again, we raised $43 million in January, um, trading near uh, liquidating value, uh, which is primarily because of a combination. NASDAQ had about a 10% sell-off. I don't control NASDAQ having a sell-off. And I said, COVID goes in wave. We went in a down wave in February, March, um, but there's certainly another wave coming in. And besides the fact that there's another wave coming, um, again, uh, the Biden administration has mandated that these dollars be spent. And this is all uh, being distributed to the states and from the states it will be trickled down to the school systems. There's a tremendous am act, amount of activity with opening up schools and looking for testing solutions. As I said, we're cash flow and earnings positive and growing. 
uh, and we expect every uh, quarter to grow for the, uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, again, this is not a guarantee, but it certainly appears that based on current activity, uh, we have a tremendous amount of potential. I would also tell you that I say in almost press release, we're actively pursuing um, new M&A activities, um, both within um, our industry and outside. The capital that we raised through two investment banks uh, is led, led by uh, Think Equity and Dawson James. Uh, we have strong sponsorship from the, our two investment banks. The amount of capital that I raised put us in a position, it really put us in a different playing field because we have a tremendous amount of capital. We have growing businesses. Um, it gives us opportunities that we did not have previously um, to uh, make acquisitions, to merge, to look at new technologies. We are looking at new technologies on a daily basis. We're looking at ways to complement uh, our COVID testing uh, businesses. Uh, we are looking at, at antigen tests. Um, understand that in general, most of the, the rapid tests out there are not as reliable um, as COVID, as PCR COVID tests. The reason is what we do with the PCR uh, COVID test is we actually analyze the RNA strand um, directly to see if you have the virus. The, the virus exists in layman's terms within the RNA strand. All of the rapid tests out there are testing what are called antigens that are circling around the RNA virus. The problem with testing for antigens is those antigens can be there for a number of reasons. And quite simply, in actual practice, rapid tests, um, you're going to get false positives and false negatives because you're not testing the RNA strand directly. However, um, coincidentally, we are looking at some antigen tests that are highly reliable that maybe could complement because in many cases, um, companies and individuals decide that they need both a very rapid test as well as the PCR test. But interestingly, our PCR test uh, gives results within 24 hours because of our tremendous customer service and because we have such tremendous capacity. So the fact is, in our particular case, we think less people would be looking for rapid tests if they know about what we have to offer. At the same time, there are other uh, PCR tests that are coming out that are faster, but that's not to be confused with a rapid test. There's an enormous amount of uh, information that I've provided in a short period of time. I see that the management slide is up. Um, when we bought the, the New Jersey lab, the first thing I did uh, was hire a COO, Steve Kamalik, who's been in the industry for decades. He started as a lab tech. He helped build up um, his former lab to, um, to be a very large lab. Uh, I was fortunate enough to hire him at Prophase Labs. We immediately built out our Garden City Lab. We attracted some fantastic talent. We have two of the best uh, high complexity molecular lab techs in the country working for us. What I also learned after getting into the business is it's not just the lab processing. That actually becomes the easy part. Once you have the great lab techs and, and the great equipment that we have, the difficult part is actually the technology in collecting patient data and in reporting results. Fortunately, we hired um, two IT techs. We hired uh, Sergio Morales, who is our uh, chief information officer and, and head of our IT department. He actually managed his own IT firm of 18 um, IT professionals. Somehow we convinced him to leave his own consulting firm to join our firm. So we have tremendous technology, which gives us the ability to have a great, what's called LIS system, laboratory information system. We have um, great technology for collecting patient data and for reporting results. We're developing an, a, a special app for reporting those results. So quite frankly, I'm really excited about every part of our company, um, strong financials, growing, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, it's an inexpensive stock price. That's not to say it's not going to go a little lower. I have no control over NASDAQ, but I can tell you that we're growing and I'm, I'm really looking forward to the future. Um, I said a lot in a, in a short period of time. Um, Elliot, would you like to hand it over to questions? Yeah. Ted, Please. that was awesome. Uh, <laughs> you got through a ton there. I'm curious, uh, like in a few seconds, is, is the, the COVID testing market, how saturated or unsaturated is that? But it seems like you all are well positioned, so I'll qualify that. Sure. So um, it's, an interest, it, it's an interesting question. The base way that I can answer it is that the large labs are still, their turnaround times are three, four, seven days. You'll negotiate with a lab and they'll tell you that they're going to be fast. And then the next thing you know, within a week or two, all of a sudden you're not getting res your results for several days. That's because many of these labs are at capacity. Now they might do special deals for special customers 
where they turn around the times very quickly. But in general, for the average public and for the actual, for the average customer that goes to them, the turnaround times are horrendous, which is one of the reasons we got into the business. So saturated, I don't know what saturated means. And also the way I look at it, we're not competing with the large labs. I don't think they can compete with us because we have the large capacity, but our large capacity is untapped at the moment. Um, we are extremely successful making a lot of money doing a small percentage you know, of our capacity under 10%, but um, there's no reason why we can't grow that uh, our capacity utilization uh, tremendously. And there's so much activity out there with new customers that there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to uh, gain many of those new customers, particularly in the areas, as I mentioned, um, schools opening up, weddings and events, uh, sports arenas opening up, um, you name it, there's so many new customers. So mm -hmm. there's a tremendous amount of activity. I don't want to be depressing either, but COVID's not going away. We've never cured flu. Vaccines don't cure flu. We're always nine months behind. We're always creating a vaccine for the flu that already occurred. Same thing with COVID. COVID hit us, you know, last February, March. It took us till the end of the year. It took nine months to create a vaccine. And now it's going to take six months before everyone gets vaccinated. COVID mutates faster than flu. Mm -hmm. And it's more transmissible. So COVID's not going anywhere. Vaccines are not going to prevent COVID from sticking around uh, for many years. So well, we're well situated. What I believe we're in the maybe the second inning for COVID testing, we just happened to have gone through a lull for six weeks. And it's interesting, the stock market picked it up even faster than we did. <laughs> um, but now there's no question there's another wave that's gonna be coming. I can't control what NASDAQ does, obviously. Right. I can only control building the value of my company every time. Well, uh, Prophase is here to stay too, it sounds like. So Ted, thank you so much. NASDAQ listed PRPH. Uh, that is prophaselabs.com, I believe. Uh, we'll drop that link in the chat. Ted, thank you so much again for being here with us. Wealth of knowledge, my man. Thanks, Ali. I really appreciate the opportunity. Right. Have a great Have day. a wonderful day. Awesome. So, <laughs> I, I that it, it honestly, I feel smarter now. Uh, so again, thanks to Ted. Uh, we're going to keep moving right along, though. We are welcoming back uh, a Cell RX Pharmaceuticals for a fireside chat with the one, the only head of Benzinga's news desk, Brent Slava. Brent, get your camera and mic on, man. How you doing? What's up, Elliot? Oh, he's got the Looking good, brother. jacket. You too, man. I, I like the jacket. I actually How's it been going? How's it been it's, going so far today? It's going well, man. The education nice. I'm getting is just second to none. Nice. Um, <laughs> I'm biased, but I'll happily say that. So uh, Brent, I'm gonna go ahead and let you introduce Pam and hop off. Dr. Palmer, are you out there? I hey, Dr. Palmer. How's your day How going? How are you doing, Brent? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So we have uh, Accelerix co-founder and chief Medi medical officer, Dr. Pamela Palmer. And uh, there was an earlier Accelerix uh, presentation. It was by one of your colleagues, Vincent. And he, I listened into a little bit of it. He was going more kind of like from the business perspective a little bit. You're mm -hmm. going to be going a little bit more into like the medical side of things, right? Absolutely. So let's get started. Let's uh, give a quick company overview, if you can. Sure. Well, Accelerix was started in 2005, and it really came out of my experiences working as a pain management physician um, at University of California, San Francisco. So I was the head of the pain clinic there that dealt with both outpatient chronic pain, as well as taking care of post-operative patients with pain issues. Um, and, you know, really seeing, I think, not only was there an outpatient crisis with opioids back then where people were um, obviously taking too many and, and becoming addicted, et cetera, and was early stages for that, but there was a separate crisis that was going on in the hospitals. And um, it really was with all the errors that can happen with IV injectable opioids. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, the, the drugs themselves have active metabolites they have slow penetration to the brain, so you can get dose stacking. They all look the same. They're all clear liquid injectables. And so, um, you know, I was asked again and again throughout the West Coast to be an expert witness in wrongful death cases involving hospital-based mm. opioid management. So Accelerox was started in 2005 really to address the inpatient opioid crisis that I was sort of observing um, and that's why we've ne ne never been involved with the outpatient uh, use of opioids. 
Mm -hmm. Gotcha. I'm just chatting down a couple of notes here. And so you kind of just hinted at it, but I want to ask in uh, a, a couple, a couple more deliberate ways. Uh, what are, or is the main Accelerix product and what is kind of the highest level vision that is helping you and other team members motivate your goals in your day-to-day -day operations? And I think you just kind of hinted at it a little bit, but uh, yeah, go, go ahead. Well, yeah. So basically, I mean, our, our lead product is called Desuvia and it was developed in concert with the Department of Defense. Uh, because again, we're try I'm trying to, I was trying to come up with a way to quickly treat pain very powerfully. So of course you see an opioid. And again, I will say, we're not trying to grow the opioid market. We're just trying to replace IV injectable opioids. If you do not need an opioid, do not use Desuvia. If Tylenol or Advil or a local anesthetic block works for your pain, then that's what you should do. Right. But in the situation where you're needing opioid level analgesia, we have a non-IV method of treating the pain. It's a sublingual tablet of 30 micrograms of sufentanil. And we love it because it's really straightforward. It's one dose, one dosage strength, I should say, for everybody. It's always sufentanil, it's always sublingual, and it's always 30 micrograms. So the dosing errors that we saw with the injectable opioids I mean, IV morphine, people don't realize this, IV morphine commercially comes in 10 concentrations and they all wow. look like clear liquid. So right. you can see right there, the setup for dosing errors mm -hmm. that can occur. That Desuvia from that standpoint is much more simplified. And so uh, I wish we had a little picture of the, the, the delivery method, but it's just like a little like slider and you basically just slide the, the pill under your tongue. That's it, right? There's nothing well, else. Well, the here. nurse does. So you don't as the patient. Mm, that's so the key. The nurse, yeah, you're exactly right. It's a teeny, 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 tiny, small sublingual blue tablet. It's four times smaller than a sublingual nitroglycerin, if anyone knows what that looks like. Mm -hmm. So it, we actually have it housed at the tip of a little plastic applicator, and it comes preloaded that way. Mm -hmm. So the nurse just has to rip open the foil pouch, pull out the applicator, pop it under the patient's tongue depress a little plunger and that's pretty straightforward from that standpoint how long does it take for the little pill to dissolve about five minutes that's it okay and then how long before a patient will start feeling the effects 15 minutes so 15 we minutes. said that okay. was the earliest time point that we measured in our clinical trials but if you look at the pharmacokinetics of the drug mm -hmm. where you're basically looking at the plasma level of sufentanil in 15 minutes, it also reaches therapeutic levels for sufentanil. Wow, so not okay. only does the pharmacokinetics tell us it should work in 15 minutes, but the clinical trials also showed that it works in 15 minutes. Right. And so how long is a patient feeling the effects for? How, how often, I guess, is, is a nurse or a doctor having to, to reapply for the patient? Well, yeah. So basically, most of the time we're being used in fast-paced settings. Right, I can imagine, um, because right? Of the, the nature of the pharmacokinetics of the drug. So mm -hmm. it lasts about three hours okay. in younger patients and patients over the age of 65, it lasts about four hours. Okay. So oftentimes whether you're dealing with uh, ambulatory surgeries that are only 45 minutes long, a lot of times what they're doing is they're just dosing a single dose about 15 to 20 minutes prior to the surgery they're using it as the intraoperative opioid and the postoperative opioid with just a single dose. Mm -hmm. And they're able to show a dramatic reduction in the overall opioid exposure to the patient and to the recovery times um, in, the, in the recovery room. And so that's been shown actually in, in multiple recently uh, peer reviewed published um, articles about Desuvia. Understood. And so uh, you know, being that you're the chief medical officer, I wanted to get in, into a little bit more of like what's actually happening inside a patient's like body slash brain when when they're given a, a pain management uh, medicine. Well, it, it binds to the opioid receptors. And that's the neat thing about sublingual sufentanil is that typically IV fentanyl is used intraoperatively. So as an anesthesiologist, which is what I am, um, we would inject 50 micrograms, let's say, of IV fentanyl. What the problem is, you get this rapid high peak 
followed by a rapid drop. And so you get, you know, sort of, uh, you know, side effects, and then you have to dose again because it fell off and side effects and dose again. So what we're seeing with Desuvia is that we've got 17 fold blunted peak plasma levels with an extended duration of action. And so that's how with the sublingual depot of the sufentanil leaching into the plasma over time, we're actually able to give a much nicer profile of the drug to the brain um, than you get with the typical bolus IV injections of opioids. So that's what we're really trying to do. We're trying to rethink how opioids are administered, both in the emergency room, the you know, in palliative care, where you know your loved one can get really sort of um, you know clouded mentation when they're mm. trying to talk to their loved ones before passing away. So there's so many areas where a nice low horizontal flat profile of drug is better than the sharp high peaks you get with IV administration. Mm -hmm. And so just taking a, a quick step back here, I mean, how important are pain management solutions for physicians and, and patients today? Uh, you know, I would say respond to your critic who is unsure why pain management drugs solutions even exist in the first place. Well, I mean, like I say, if, if Tylenol and Motrin treated all of our pain, it'd be a wonderful world. But unfortunately, right. you know, when you break your femur and you come into the emergency room, um, no one's screaming out for Tylenol, right? Yeah. So the, we have to have powerful opioids and that's an absolute given. We mm -hmm. have not changed the fundamental paradigm of IV bolus opioids in decades. Mm -hmm. So we are the first time that you can give a sublingual opioid to a patient that is not opioid tolerant. That's just your regular garden variety patient coming in mm -hmm. and give them quality, him or her quality pain management. And, you know, whether it's orthopedic surgery, for example, orthopedic surgeons are now doing total hip and total knee surgeries same day, same day discharge. Wow. You tell me that pain management is the fundamental key aspect mm -hmm. of getting that patient home. So whether it's orthopedic surgery or plastic surgery, for example, that's very reputational. If someone goes and has a facelift and they don't have pain afterwards, um, they tell their friends about that. But when they're feeling woozy and groggy because of some bolus IV opioid that then wears off, you know, 20, 30 minutes later, you know, that's not a, bad, a good experience for them. So a lot of doctors are adopting us because of the great patient experience. And so they go and tell their friends, um, you know, it, it's a nice word of mouth advertising. And you just gave one there, I'm sure, but what are some of the other large challenges that you think the, the pain management industry is facing today? Well, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, the pendulum swung wildly towards opioids about 30 years ago. Um, and they were overused, they were overprescribed. And now the pendulum has swung to this opioid free approach to managing pain, which is not even tenable. It's, it's just not a, lot, a good way to treat patients. Um, and I think the pendulum is going to come back to, to the middle point where we're using opioids where they belong. We're trying to minimize the overall opioid exposure and use them in combination with a bunch of non-opioid analgesics. And that's really where Desuvia fits squarely into it because we've been mm -hmm. showing, you know, through these clinical trials run after the approval of our drug, that if you use Desuvia, you're overall reducing that opioid exposure to the patient. So it's, it's almost the opioid that's opioid sparing. That's a good way to put it. So what do you think the pain management market, market looks like in, in five years, in 10 years? Well, you know, I really do believe that um, we tried hard to find new targets in the body to treat pain. Um, we've not been that successful. We're still relying on opioid receptors, inhibiting cyclooxygenase, which is what NSAIDs do, um, local anesthetics. So really what we've been seeing is we're going after the same molecular targets, but we're trying to do it with better and improved drugs. So newer capsaicins, newer local anesthetics, newer opioids. Um, I mean, I really think that we're still going to be seeing that over the next 10 to 20 years. Gotcha. And 
I know there's a lot of, you know, perspective, perspective patients, perspective investors out there. So uh, tell us what you think is the best way for patients and investors to learn more about the pain management industry and of course, Accelerex. Sure. Well, I mean, our website is great. We've got some of our real world um, evidence that's been published about Desuvia on that as well. Um, our press releases give you all of the information as far as the uh, publications we've had. And the great thing about those publications is they're open access, which means you don't have to pay great. 50 to $60 a paper. You can just Google right. those uh, names and they pop right up for you. Great. Really good stuff, Dr. Palmer, uh, Dr. Pamela Palmer from Accelerex. She's co-founder and chief medical officer. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Palmer. Sure, Brent. Thanks so much for having me. Yep. Have a good one. Elliot? Thank you both so much, Dr. Palmer. Much appreciated. Again, that is a cell RX NASDAQ listed ACRX. And that was our one and only Brent Slava, the head of Benzinga's news desk. Thank you so much, sir. We'll see you soon. All right. Fantastic. Awesome fireside. So we've heard from a cell RX twice. Uh, very interesting uh, pain management solution. Uh, definitely check into that NASDAQ uh, ACRX. All right. So uh, in very, very exciting company coming up next. Uh, I think you'll definitely want to pay attention here. We have the CEO, interim CFO of Lineage Cell Therapeutics. They are Nice C American listed LCTX. This is Brian Cully. Uh, how are you, Brian? Hi there, Elliot. Nice to meet you. I'm fine. You hear me all right. Yeah, it's a little choppy, uh, but if you continue to talk, we can. Uh, but I do see your screen, so we're on the right track here. Very nice. That's great. Perfect. All right. I think we're good, sir. I'll let you take it away. All right. Thanks very much. A pleasure to be here. First time presenting at a uh, business event and uh, really appreciate the inclusion. Uh, as a public company, I will be making some forward statements. You can learn more about our risk factors through our filings. So Lineage Cell Therapeutics, uh, really, what are we looking to do here? Nothing less than uh, ushering in a new branch of medicine. Uh, the aim of the company, our, our uh, sole uh, purpose here, is to manufacture and transplant specific cell types and then deliver those to the body. I'm going to show you a few examples. Um, you've probably heard a lot about different approaches in cell therapy. You've probably heard a lot of wondrous things about cell therapy. Uh, I want to be very clear that lineage uh, lineage does something very different. We, we never put a stem cell into a human being. Uh, what we do is we use stem cells as starting material. That starting material is that the cells can become any of the cell types in your body. So your, your body is comprised of 200 or more different cell types. We can manufacture different cell types and then use those cells to replace what's missing. So we are transplanting whole cells to the body. This is very different than using undifferentiated stem cells, which have a lot of questions about whether they really work and people are going to clinics and getting things, you know, injected into them all over in different places and spending a lot of money. But there haven't been a lot of randomized and controlled clinical trials that have passed through FDA process to demonstrate whether or not you're actually getting any sort of benefit. So that is our mission to manufacture specific cell types, deliver them to the body in order to drive positive clinical outcomes. Uh, why are we so passionate about that? And the answer is that using whole cells may be able to generate outcomes that are beyond the reach of traditional small molecules or antibodies and, and traditional pharmaceuticals that you think about. Uh, and we've seen some evidence of that, for example, uh, in a condition where, which is uh, di uh, only directionally gets worse, we've been able to show a reversal, a rescue of some tissue. I'll, I'll describe that in a minute. Uh, in spinal cord injury patients, which for, for decades have really had nothing, uh, we've been able to show that we are able to uh, prevent the cavitation or the hole that forms after a spinal cord injury. Uh, so we have three clinical programs today. We recently updated our cash position as of March 5th, had 57 million in cash, cash equivalents. And the company's market capitalization uh, has been growing substantially over the, uh, the recent period. So this is a, a schematic or an illustration of our technology. We use those cells up there at the top uh, right hand corner of the image. And again, you can in theory manufacture any of the 200 different cell types. 
we focus down at the bottom on those three. We can manufacture specific retina cells, spinal cord cells, and a certain type of immune cell to treat various diseases and conditions. Each of our clinical stage programs has received validating and meaningful levels of funding, uh, upwards of $40 million in the aggregate from groups like the California Stem Cell Agency and others. And we have some uh, notable clinical milestones uh, later this year. Uh, in fact, we just reported uh, yesterday an update with our lead program, uh, Opergen. That's where we transplant retina cells to treat one of the leading causes of vision loss. Uh, that vision loss is called AMD or dry age-related macular degeneration. It's caused by uh, essentially a wound in the back of the eye and the wound gets bigger and bigger. So this is a panel of uh, images of a patient's eye in the back of their eye. And you can see that black spot is getting bigger. Uh, and the red, red line is showing uh, a, a actual data from their vision going from 2020 down to, uh, to being essentially completely blind as that wound grows. It's a, it's a lesion that's getting worse and worse over time. So what we do is we manufacture the new cells to replace the ones that are dying off and causing that lesion. We do this in part because there are no approved therapies for this condition. There are two kinds of, uh, two forms of this condition. They're called wet and dry. Uh, there are therapies for wet AMD and they're doing about $10 billion in sales. But many more people have the dry form of the condition. And again, this is an untapped market, certainly uh, un undisputably uh, with many billions of dollars of revenue potential. Uh, now, people have tried, let's not be you know, ridiculous here, people have tried to treat dry AMD, but they've tried with traditional approaches like small molecules. <clears throat> what we're doing is we're manufacturing those cells and transplanting them, and we've had a lot of success. We've transplanted successfully 24 individuals, so uh, compared to others, uh, especially some academics that are working in this, we are, we are way beyond uh, where, where others are with respect to our clinical experience. This is a one-time treatment so far. The first 12 patients, they were all legally blind. That's a safety uh, consideration. We're treating people who have um, very bad, uh, very advanced disease. Uh, and we do that because we don't wanna do any harm. After we gained some confidence and we saw some encouraging initial results, we moved into patients that more accurately reflect our intended patient population. That is to say, people that have got less advanced disease and for us, these are individuals who hold out greater hope of being able to, uh, to treat their condition. And we finished enrollment in November. Now this graph, I'm gonna spend a minute on this because this is breaking data. We just recently, uh, just yesterday, we, uh, we announced uh, an update. So a prior version of this graph had um, you know, maybe half as many patients and, and we've updated it. And what's really notable, the takeaway here is that the treated eye, you know, because everyone has two eyes almost, uh, the treated eye is able to read more letters than the untreated eye. Uh, this is imp impressive because uh, what we were happy about is that in the first six patients, we had seen that at, at four and a half months, about five out of those six patients were either at or above baseline. And again, this is a progressive condition. It only gets worse. So we were very happy that five of six patients at four and a half months had gotten better. Well, we recently announced uh, additional data, which another four out of six patients were again at or above baseline, meaning 75% of our patients were at or above baseline at four and a half months. That's notable because with small numbers, you always run the risk that it might be just luck. You got a few patients going the right way, but we essentially doubled our data set. Things were affirmed through four and a half months. And I can tell you that those patients, those original six that we treated, call it pre-COVID, uh, those patients maintained gains. They continued to be at or above baseline at their longest measured time point, whether it's nine or 15, or 18 or 24 months. So the ones that went up stayed up. So we're really happy to have announced that we saw another four patients that had uh, an early indication of a trajectory of being positive. Uh, and we think as this data set grows, it's going to be very encouraging uh, for us and that we'll continue to monitor these, these patients. I do wanna add that the other thing that we look at is the size of the lesion, but that takes a lot of months to follow. It's a slow growing effect. So this is vision. This is looking at letters on an eye chart. Visual, uh, the size of the area of atrophy takes longer to monitor. So there's not really anything notable to see in the first few months, but next quarter, we intend to provide another update. And so you'll be able to see patients out to six months and follow out 
Again, how are they trending? What's the trajectory look like? Uh, this is an example of, is just to give you a reference point, the I, you know, how many letters of improvement. Here's a 10 or 15 letter improvement. Obviously, it'll really help you pass your driver's license exam or read your phone and just have a better quality of life for people who are headed toward uh, blindness. The other thing that we've done, and no one else has shown this, is we've been able to demonstrate something called retinal regeneration. So this is that wound that I said, it only gets worse. Well, we actually made one of these get better. So uh, this is a tracing, it's an aerial view of the wound. And in orange, it was, that's the size of it on uh, the back of the eye, that's how big it was. We traced it and colored it in so it was easy to see. And then after a year, it had grown from orange to red. And we treated the patient basically when they were at red, when the wound was like that. And then nine months later, we traced it again and we've colored it in blue and you can see that it's smaller. And then out at 23 months, which is the last available data, that patient still had a smaller area of atrophy. This does not happen. Human beings do not have the ability to regenerate retinal tissue. So if you had 100 people and you followed their areas of atrophy, 100 of them over time would have a larger area of atrophy. Well, here's someone who after two years of monitoring has consistently had a smaller area of atrophy and improved vision over this period as well. This is the promise of cell therapy. This is the promise of cell transplants. This is the promise of lineage cell therapeutics. I really love how we are positioned among the other companies working in this because many of them are approaching it in a traditional way. Small molecules, antibody, trying to stop inflammation. I, I think the problem is too big. I think the problem requires transplant medicine. Uh, there was a article this morning on Endpoints News, a very widely read industry uh, article talking about the big open secret in cell therapy is manufacturing and that there are uh, a lot of companies that are working on promising clinical pro uh, issues but haven't figured out manufacturing. We have figured out manufacturing. We manufacture more than 99% pure retina cells. And in just a three liter bioreactor, like the one I'm showing right now, we can manufacture 5 billion retina cells. That's equal to 2,500 clinical doses per batch. And it is straightforward to add more bioreactors, larger bioreactors. We grow these cells in three dimensions. They're not grown on plates. They're not grown in two dimensions. So we can scale in a very straightforward manner. The cells don't know if they're in a little thimble of liquid or a swimming pool of liquid. They all behave the same. So we have exquisite control of our manufacturing and we can scale up making it affordable unlike a lot of cell therapies that um, when you start doing the math on, on whether they're affordable these customized therapies autologous therapies uh, just it just doesn't pencil out so we have invested in manufacturing in order to differentiate ourselves among other companies i will not go through this for the benefit of time i would try and get some questions at the end but we have positioned our lead program to take advantage of the multi-billion dollar commercial opportunity in dry a and d through regulatory advantages through product enhancements through scale and in manufacturing <clears throat> we've done a, we've done a lot and i welcome you to look further into it uh, when you have time another area of interest for us for which we're in the clinic is spinal cord injury again nothing available it needs new approaches so we transplant cells so that we can help people like this young man who was on our clinical trial he was paralyzed after his car crash here you see him throwing out a baseball but it's more important to me that he can manipulate that knob on his wheelchair right that's mobility that's independence i'm less i'm less interested in you know the one day where he throws a baseball I want to make sure that this kid can feed himself and dress himself and use the toilet when he wants to. So that's about getting upper extremity mobility. How do we get mobility for people who are otherwise paralyzed? And there are about 18,000 new cases of spinal cord injury every year. So what we do is manufacture a different kind of cell. We manufacture oligodendrocytes. These are cells that are kind of like, they provide the insulation to the wiring of your nervous system. If you want your fingers to move, they need to receive a signal from your brain that's carried on axons and that signal needs insulation in order to be carried appropriately we provide those cells uh, this is just some you know uh, some deep data to give you a sense of one of the big problems with spinal cord injury is it can leave a hole behind this is the top left panel uh, this is a rodent slice and uh, after an injury you have this problem and you can see on the right after transplanting our operogen cells you can essentially fill that area that's important because an electrical current cannot jump across a gap it needs material 
to be carried on. And so that's one of the many advantages of using OPC1. These uh, cells come from an NIH registered cell line. They're just like our other program, they're off the shelf. Uh, we've never had problems in our eye program with rejection. We don't, we don't have problems with rejection in our spinal cord. We are able to uh, manufacture these cells also by the billions. Uh, so this is a ready to use formulation we've developed. Uh, we also have been working on, uh, on delivery, uh, new enhanced delivery and enhanced scale. And this has been very well tolerated, as you can see, with 534 reported AEs. It reflects how serious these conditions are, but only one of them, and it was fairly minor if you read the, the asterisk there, only one of them was even related to our cells. So we have a very encouraging safety profile, and we have shown that in about 80% of the time, we've been able to avoid that cavitation, avoid that hole that forms after an injury. More importantly, we've been able to show in about a third of the patients, they were able to gain two or more motor levels. So in spinal cord injury, one of the things that you measure are motor levels, i.e. how much can you move, right? What do you care about if you have a spinal cord injury? Moving and feeling. So we have been able to show that we can improve the motor, the locomotion of these individuals, essentially moving people from a C4 injury to a C6 or a C5 to a C7. That's a level of neurological injury in the neck. And look at the differences that you can see moving from a C4 to a C6. It's basically going from around the clock care to being able to provide significant care for yourself, just getting a little housework around the house, helping to get yourself around, maybe using the toilet, um, but you can eat, you can rest, you can get yourself. That is a big, significant, clinically significant move. So we have an excellent safety profile. We've seen high levels of engraftment. It's been very well tolerated, and we're going to be moving toward a randomized controlled clinical trial with this program next year. And we're hopeful to be the first therapeutic to provide for these patients uh, using also a new device that we recently announced and showing these levels of improvement. So these are uh, measures of impure cells, cells types that you don't want. The old stuff that another sponsor used is in blue. The lineage stuff is in orange. You can barely see it there, but that's because it's so pure. So we think that is an important safety component and uh, reflects that we have good control of our process. In this image, this is actual uh, an actual procedure, but um, a very similar setup you might have seen on Grey's Anatomy, that popular show. Um, they borrowed uh, our, our device and our storyline uh, to talk about how you might be able to use cell therapy to improve outcomes in patients with spinal cord injuries. This has been a supported program, uh, the first clinical program supported by the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. We have RMAT designation, orphan designation, and of course, we've got a lot of patent coverage. So this is a compelling opportunity to provide new therapeutic outcomes in spinal cord injury. Lastly, we have an oncology program. This reflects our third clinical stage program, third form of cell. We manufacture the dendritic cell. The dendritic cell is part of your immune system, and it is the it is nature's most powerful antigen-presenting cell. So it delivers information to your immune system. We all have immune systems, but sometimes you need to fire them up. And that's what a vaccine does, right? COVID-19 vaccines, it's about firing up and giving information to your immune system. We can do exactly that. In this case, what we're doing is we're putting tumor information into dendritic cells, and then tens of millions of dendritic cells go into the patient to inform the patient's immune system about what, about a, what, is, what makes a tumor cell a tumor cell. So how do you find and destroy that tumor cell? Your immune system needs that information. So we've seen very high levels of antigenicity, specific to antigen, and this also is in the clinic. We have one patient left to enroll on this clinical study. Brian, about also, 30 seconds left if uh, you okay, can. Great, thanks. Use, Perfect, yes. Elliot. This also is a platform. We can go after many different tumor types using this platform. So uh, with a lot of news ahead, uh, also just yesterday, recent news, um, but thinking forward, the takeaway here for Lineage Cell Therapeutics is that this is a growing company in the leading field of regenerative medicine and cell therapy. We control our own uh, manufacturing. We have many hundreds of patents to protect our, our programs. Uh, the company is well-funded into 2023 and one of the growing leaders in regenerative medicine and cell therapy. So with that, Elliot, I thank you very much. And if you're able to ask a question, I'd be happy to follow up. Brian, that was really, really informative. Uh, we are at time, unfortunately, my friend, but I mean, I actually have three or four questions myself, but is there an email we can reach out to with any questions, uh, requests, feedback? 
you bet. Uh, info at lineage. I'm just gonna go right to my uh, uh, my director of investor relations, and she can connect uh, connect people as as they need. So info at lineagecell.com, and uh, and they'll be all set. Perfect, Brian. Thank you so much for being here again. This is Brian Kelly, CEO of Lineage Cell Therapeutics, uh, NICE American listed at NCT. Or I'm sorry, LCTX. I like to mix up my ticker letters. Apparently, LCTX. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate you being Barely. here. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Awesome. Uh, incredible company, y'all. Please make sure you are fully knowledgeable about Lineage Cell Therapeutics. Uh, and we're following up right with another one. Very excited to welcome Rob Nee, uh, K-N-I-E, the CEO of Hoth Therapeutics. Uh, they are NASDAQ listed H-O-T-H. Rob, how are you, sir? Elliot, how are you today? Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Oh, we're glad to have you. I am just, I'm getting so much education right now and I'm going to let you continue it. Great. Thanks so much. Let me uh, share my screen here with everybody so we can show the presentation. Let's go here. Once again, thanks everybody for joining uh, Hot Therapeutics presentation today. Uh, appreciate your time and uh, joining our conference. Uh, safe Harbor Statement, obviously, and this presentation is on our, on our website uh, at hawtherapeutics.com, so uh, please feel free to visit it. So Hoth was founded in 2017, a uh, global platform uh, for immunological uh, disorders, uh, unmet needs, and deliver value to uh, patients and, of course, our shareholders as well. Give a little bit of the company overview, and then we'll talk about all the different uh, therapeutics that are currently in the pipeline. Uh, our number one program right now that's going to uh, have clinical results probably in Q2 as we're starting the trial here in late Q1 for Biolexa. That's for atopic dermatitis in pediatric patients. It's a novel compound of two drugs um, that form a way to actually handle atopic dermatitis in a way that's not currently met. Most treatments today handle the symptoms only. They don't handle the undercurrent and the underlying issue, which is usually staph aureus. So the way our therapeutic works is, is a DTPA key leader. That key leader kind of sucks up the zinc, which then clears the way for our therapeutic, the other end of the therapeutic, gentamicin, to get in and actually clear the staph aureus. So you're not just handling the symptoms, you're handling the underlying cause. So flare-ups would be further and fewer, uh, which would be great. And there's nothing really on the market that kind of handles that. Uh, currently, what you see are corticosteroids or Eucrisa from Pfizer that more stop the inflammation but don't actually stop the underlying cause. As I mentioned, that phase one uh, in uh, Australia is starting. Uh, we expect to have some data on that um, early next quarter. Multiple shots on goal. We have uh, a really robust pipeline. Uh, HG001 is something we're super excited about at the company. It treats the cutaneous side effects when a patient is going through chemotherapy. What does that mean? Well, about 36% of patients that go through chemo have to stop treatment or drop out. Why? Because they get these cutaneous lesions all over their body, whether it be on their chest, their back, their face, their lips. There's nothing currently on the market for that. So how's it treated right now? It's treated with different ointments and topicals to try to take down that inflammation and those cutaneous lesions. Uh, unfortunately, it's not very successful. So what does HG001 do? HG001 actually, when applied as a topical, we believe will reduce these cutaneous lesions. We could treat patients prior to chemo or while going through chemo. We recently received uh, feedback from the FDA from our pre-IND, uh, very good feedback. We're looking to see if we can possibly get a breakthrough strategy designation for that. We hope to start a phase 2A trial later this year. We're currently finishing up our toxicology studies. HT002, we released some data on that yesterday. That's our peptide therapeutic for COVID-19, which showed really robust um, in the in vitro study that was then confirmed uh, by an independent lab that showed HT002 uh, is like a remdesivir, if you could think about it in that sense. Uh, where it goes after these H2 inhibitors and stops COVID. So you're still going to have quite a few patients that whether they don't get the vaccine or 
areas in the world where you know the vaccine is not available so therapeutics are really most certainly needed uh, for here in the US and throughout the world. Then we have H2003 acne and psoriasis licensed from University of Maryland, Baltimore. Uh, that work's being done by Dr. John Zippin at Weill Cornell here in New York. Uh, we hope to have some further preclinical data on that next month. It's a really, what's really unique about um, H2003, it's just not acne and psoriasis. It's an anti-inflammation platform. And we think that's something that you see um, in many acne companies, they're one trick ponies. They're only going after acne. Well, what we're doing here is we really have an anti-inflammatory platform that we think there's other indications that could be um, serviced by HG003. Then HG004 is uh, asthma and allergic inflammation. That's out of NC State. Um, that's a gene therapy drug. What's different from our gene therapy drug from other gene therapy drugs is the fact that when our gene therapy drug is used, and we've shown this in uh, preclinical studies, it shuts off the gene when it's being used, but then the gene goes back to its normal state after you stop taking the therapeutic. Most gene therapy companies haven't been able to do that. We think this acid at NC State is uh, pretty exciting for that reason alone. Then HT005 is uh, uh, lupus, and uh, HT006 is uh, our partnership with the US Army and Walter Reed uh, for hospital acquired pneumonia. And you might have saw today, uh, Vaxillerate, our partner for COVID-19 vaccine, issued some preclinical data uh, that was very positive. And the on-the-go SARS COVID testing uh, device system is licensed from George Washington University. We recently took that in-house to further the development uh, as we uh, look forward to moving that along at a quicker pace. Partners, as you can see, UMB, Camargo, Mass General, University of Cincinnati, US Army, and others. Um, what we think is kind of unique about our partners are, we keep them all in the family for us. So what does that mean? When we license something, we continue to sponsor research at these universities and keep the inventors involved. Keeping the inventors involved is really important for us. They know their therapeutic better than anybody else and it's their passion project in most instances. So as I mentioned, all the shots on goal, here's our pipeline. Uh, what's really exciting for us and happy to share is you know, our therapeutic has shipped to Australia, trial starting. So that atopic germ trial really changes us from being a in development company to a clinical biotech company. Um, and we think that's something that's really significant. So as I mentioned, the BioAlexa platform, what's so different about it? You know, atopic dermatitis, uh, six and a half billion in 2017 going to 16 billion in 2027. Uh, current treatments are expensive and a lot of them don't work. Uh, you've got topical steroid addiction. Most parents don't wanna to put topical steroids on their children. Can't have be in the sunlight, uh, layers of sunscreen, you know, and the other part of it is they're only treating, like I said, the symptoms. You're only really stopping the redness and the itching. We need something in the marketplace that actually treats the underlying cause. That's where we think BioAlexa is in a street, uh, really sweet spot. So, you know, as we mentioned earlier, this is also a platform. You know, we did a DFU study at Mass General that showed really good results. Uh, we had a really good pilot study. We continue to go further for DFUs. You know, that's sort of a secondary indication for BioAlexa. HG001, as I mentioned, we licensed from George Washington University. This is something that you know, it's a life-saving therapeutic and there's nothing in the market. You know, when patients have to drop out of chemo uh, due to these cutaneous lesions, you know, that's a real life support formulation therapeutic that we can provide. Uh, you know, we did a 12-week study at GW that recently confirmed uh, the topical application would be effective in suppressing, um, you know, EGFR treatment. So we really think that Moving forward in 21, uh, as we get our toxicology studies back from Charles River, we'll be able to start the trial late this year. Here's some of the pictures, as you can see, non-treated when going through chemotherapy and then treated with HT001. I mean, you can see obviously in these rat studies, uh, you know, large rat studies that the therapeutic was uh, very, very well received. And this is on our website too. You can get a further look if you uh, 
if the picture is not clear. So we had four formulation candidates under evaluation. Uh, two candidates were left. We actually have now, I uh, can say here, we have one formulation, which we think has given us the best indications. Um, no toxicity, uh, very, very clear in clearing the skin, stops the uh, EGFR rash. Uh, the formulation has skin protectant functions as well. We have the target dosage ready. This leads us to you know, our trial at a quicker pace. So I talked a little bit about the COVID-19 therapeutic from uh, Virginia Commonwealth University that we issued information on yesterday. Uh, as we mentioned, you know, the virus binds to these ACE2 receptors, which allows the virus to replicate. With this therapeutic, it actually stops it. It stops that binding of the sars cov spike protein. So this is really super exciting. Uh, we are in our next steps uh, going through, you know, we have our proof of concept essays, essays. We have, you know, confirmation of that from an independent lab. Now we move on to the current tox study at uh, Charles River. So this acne and psoriasis from ACET from University of Maryland, Baltimore, you have seven and a half million people alone affected by psoriasis. There's nothing been new in the acne front from quite a long time. Accutane is the tried and true that's uh, used for severe acne. So what's bad about Accutane? Accutane's been around forever. It's been used. We know how it works. We know the molecules behind it. Problem with Accutane is if you use it, you have to get blood work done once a quarter or so. Pregnant women, uh, young girls that are thinking about getting pregnant, young women, you really have to be cautious on using Accutane. So if we have something here that's non-toxic, non-systemic, uh, in the acne space, you know, we think that's a game changer. Uh, as I mentioned, preclinical trial at Weill Cornell, we'll have further data on that next month. So we talked earlier about these toll receptors that showed really, really good, uh, significant downward uh, expression after treating with VNLG152, which is HG003 for acne. We'll have some further uh, clarity and confirmation of these studies. But once again, we think this is an exciting opportunity. Two companies were recently uh, bought for, pre, not even in clinic, just preclinical results, uh, one by GSK, the other by Eli Lilly in the acne space. Uh, we happen to think we have a really good anti-inflammatory platform here that could be super exciting. Asthma and allergic inflammation, this is the gene therapy drug I talk, talked about earlier from NC State. Uh, Dr. Glenn Cruz is currently doing the studies. We'll have further data on this in Q3. Uh, we recently have moved on to our next tox issue, um, which will be testing done probably in Q2, Q3, which will give us more of a uh, preclinical mouse data, which will also then allow us to go into our pre-IND later this year. And as most people hear about anaphylaxis, uh, we think this is something that's really interesting that's come up after Dr. Cruz gave us his most recent study from NC State. What showed is H2004 was really effective in stopping anaphylaxis. You hear a lot about anaphylaxis right now when people have reactions from the current COVID-19 vaccine. So, you know, uh, anaphylaxis is something that is, you know, takes place from food allergy, asthmatics, and so forth. So to have something new on the market for anaphylaxis uh, can be a game changer in that space too. Uh, you know, inflammatory cell uh, recruitment and so forth and stopping that with a gene therapy drug that actually can go back to its normal state after use is something that differentiates our HG004 drug from other therapeutics that are currently on the market. So z -Pods is, we have a, a joint venture with a company called Xylo. And uh, Xylo has developed this delivery system, which then makes the endocannabinoids in your body function and bring down inflammation. So with our therapeutic and using Z-Pods, we think we have a drug that goes after the cutaneous lupus uh, issues that they face when they get inflammation, redness, and so forth. So we had really good preclinical studies done at uh, Albert Einstein that was confirmed at Jackson Labs. 
our next preclinical study starts uh, Q2, late Q2, 2021. Uh, Xylo, as I mentioned, is our partner. Um, they do the actual preclinicals for us. Why do we have Xylo do that for us? Uh, it's cheaper for us. Uh, they have the lab, which then keeps our cost low. So you can kind of see here through the graph uh, how well our AEA did with Z-Pods. Uh, controls rapid metabolism, really bought down inflammation in the body significantly. And here are some of the pictures from H2005 in the animal data. Uh, you can see the untreated um, with the empty Z-Pods and then with our therapeutic in the Z-Pods. Uh, the mice really have unbelievably a reduction of these cutaneous lesions and inflammation through the body. What's kind of interesting about this too is uh, when people think endocannabinoid, they automatically think THC, marijuana. What's kind of different for us is we're going after the endocannabinoid system in the body, but without the effects of a THC or medical marijuana or so forth. So what you're doing is you're getting that same anti-inflammatory effect. And then we'll just talk about uh, HG006. This is our partnership with Walter Reed Medical Center uh, based in Washington, DC, Maryland area and the US Army. So what are we doing here? We have a really, really interesting market opportunity that we're going after. There's a large amount of patients that go into hospitals, get respirator or have pneumonia while being in the hospital. VK28 is an iron chi leader properties. Uh, that is essential for bacterial growth and survival. We've got proof of concept data. We recently announced a study with UC Cincinnati to further the studies of VK28. And what's really neat about doing it at University of Cincinnati is we have an unbelievable relationship there for atopic dermatitis drug. And the doctor that's doing it is one of the world renowned uh, for uh, new antibiotics. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the company as a whole, where we are financially, uh, where we are for 2021, and sort of catalyst. So the company has uh, approximately $20 million um, in the bank. We have 23 million shares currently outstanding. We are funded through 2021. Um, you know, we have no need for capital. Uh, we believe we have a good runway for all our therapeutics to handle all the financial ramifications of a new trial for HG001, our trial for BioAlexa, and all our preclinical studies. What are catalysts for 2021? Catalysts are obviously the BioAlexa readout um, for atopic dermatitis. Uh, we'll have multiple readouts on that for each cohort. Uh, preclinical data on HG001, confirmation data, start of the trial later this year. Uh, our acne platform and psoriasis platform from Dr. John Zippin at Weill Cornell. We'll have data on that uh, early Q2. And we'll also have data on our VK28 program, most likely in Q2. We'll start further preclinical studies and toxicology studies on our gene therapy drug, which we'll also share with the investment community results of that. COVID-19 assets that we talk about that we released some data on so today, our partner company, uh, Halovax, that we're an investor in, and we stand on the development committee, uh, this vaccine, we released data that had really good confirmatory study at Mass General Hospital on how well the vaccine did there. It's kind of interesting, that vaccine is not an mRNA vaccine, it's more of a traditional vaccine. Um, also on our preclinical work from um, UV, uh, you know, we already released that the other day, talking how well that did in comparison to like a remdesivir. So that's kind of our pipeline. That's where we are today. That's our financial situation, which we're in really good shape. And we think we have an exciting uh, 2021 ahead of us. Rob, you might have the most robust pipeline I've seen yet today. Uh, <laughs> that you. is very impressive. Um, so much is going on past COVID, but obviously a lot of lot to be excited for within the pandemic. So thank you so much. Don't go far. We're going to be hearing from you again in 20 minutes, I believe. Sounds great. Thanks, uh, I really panel. appreciate you having us on. Yeah, of course, Rob. Uh, again, that was Rob Neath, CEO of Hot Therapeutics. They are listed on the NASDAQ, H-O-T-H. -H. Uh, Rob, we'll see you in a second. Uh, next up, 
before we get to our panel with Rob and Brian from uh, the Lineage Cell Therapeutics Company, we have Daxor Corporation, Michael Feldshu, the president and CEO. They are listed on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, DXR. Uh, Michael, let's get your camera and microphone on. We are excited to have Daxor Corporation with us. There we go. And in the interim, y'all, uh, we have a panel. We have multiple presentations upcoming, and this is just day one of two. Uh, exciting, exciting uh, <laughs> couple of days here in biotech. I'm learning tons. Michael, pleasure to have you, sir. I'm going to turn it right over to you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having Daxor as part of the Benzinga conference. This is our first time participating. We're very excited. Um, so let's jump into it. Uh, Daxor, uh, we have some forward-looking statements here in our deck. We are a publicly listed company on the New York Stock Exchange, ticker DXR. So what is Daxor? Daxor is the global leader in blood volume measurement technology. We're focused on blood volume testing innovation. We've developed and market the BVA 100, which is the first and only diagnostic blood test cleared by the FDA to provide safe and accurate objective quantification of blood volume status and composition compared to patient specific norms. It's used in the hospital setting for both inpatient and outpatient care in a broad variety of very significant medical conditions and challenges within our healthcare uh, uh, spend. The BVA 100 is used in conjunction with Volumex, which is a single use diagnostic uh, tracer radiopharmaceutical. This test is reimbursed and covered by both CPT and APC coding. Uh, it's covered by both public and private insurance for the inpatient and outpatient setting. And I'm going to get into why blood volume measurement is so important and how uh, Daxor is leading the way within this very, very significant addressable market. Uh, just as a way of background, uh, Daxor owns and operates a 20,000 square foot uh, state-of-the-art ISO 14385 certified production and research and development facility out of Oak Ridge, Tennessee. So what is this blood volume test? Why does it matter? Well, first of all, what our test does is what no other diagnostic metric does in medicine, which is that it provides a rapid 98% quantification of the total blood volume, red cell volume, and plasma volume that a patient has. This FDA cleared test can uh, generate results inside of an hour, and it's been recognized for reimbursement, as I just mentioned earlier. Believe it or not, doctors don't really know, uh, absent the utilization of our test, exactly how much blood a patient has in their body. They know the temperature of the blood, they know the pressure of the blood, but they don't know how much blood a patient actually has. And that's a critical metric for uh, healthcare practitioners to know because a large number of life or death decisions are based upon the patient's blood volume. And we'll get into why that's important and, and how this test really is a paradigm shift for medicine. Just to let you know, this is not a clinical stage company. We are a commercial stage company. We have had over 50,000 blood volumes uh, performed in leading hospitals across the country uh, in over 65 hospital systems. Uh, we have dozens and dozens of peer reviewed uh, publications establishing the value of blood volume analysis, confirming the accuracy and improved outcomes, over 100 published uh, peer-reviewed studies, uh, case studies, and uh, poster presentations at conferences from leading research centers across the country. So a quick executive summary of DAXOR, some key points to keep in mind as I go through the deck and to understand what the opportunity is around DAXOR. DAXOR is the global leader in blood volume technology. We have more experience, more knowledge than any other company within this space. Uh, we are the only FDA cleared ISO 13485 medical device within this uh, marketplace. Uh, we have a very uh, exciting business uh, model. Uh, this is a relatively high margin uh, insurance covered razor razor blade diagnostic model. And I'll get into what that razor razor blade means in a moment. Um, we have a very, very significant number of uh, areas where blood volume management is at the center for how medical conditions are managed. So you have heart failure, uh, critical care, hypertension, sepsis, just to name a few, where blood volume management is at the center of what uh, healthcare teams are trying to do. 
We reported 50% revenue growth in 2020. Uh, we have been expanding our sales and commercialization team as well as our commercial channels. And uh, we have received backing from uh, the Department of Defense, which has given us over $2 million of military contracts. In addition, the NIH just recognized us last month with their point of care award for the company, giving us a grant through their CAPCAT facility. We'll get into that as well too. Um, I mentioned how uh, BVA, of course, has been very well validated and shown to improve outcomes, reduce costs, lower mortality, and lower length of stay for patients. Uh, we have a very robust R&D program right now funded through partnerships, as I mentioned, with major organizations such as the DOD and the NIH. And we have a number of important studies underway. So there's a continuous pipeline of not only product development, but also clinical outcomes, furthering the need and the showing the value of our, of our diagnostic to improve results. Uh, as far as the company goes, it's very exciting. We have a totally clean cap table. We have no warrants outstanding, $15.7 million of net assets, no warrants, very high insider ownership, and a very low 1.4 million share free float. So we are a company that is very much geared for shareholder value, and we are very, very focused on generating that. So a little bit more about who we are. Uh, Daxor, uh, became the global leader not overnight. We came, became the global leader through decades of fundamental research, basic R&D that actually has its roots in the 70s. Uh, we uh, received clearance initially for our diagnostic test in the late 90s, proceeded to do a significant amount of research and uh, evidence generation in the 2000s and the early 2010s. Uh, there's been a number of different pivotal uh, outcomes that have shown not only the you the uniqueness of our diagnostic, but also the value of it compared to other options that healthcare practitioners have. I'll get more into that. And what we've seen as the result of this has been a growing adoption of our technology and a recognition by some of the most important organizations that support this kind of work about the value of blood volume diagnostics. So what is Daxworth's mission? It's to advance healthcare by make, making sure that patients have optimal fluid management. And that's done through blood volume analysis. Our vision is really that no patient should have anything other than optimal blood volume. Optimal blood volume for all patients is our vision. And it is attainable if practitioners have access to the right diagnostic. So what is our diagnostic? So you can see on the right, there's a tracer that's injected at the bedside into the patient. There's a detector that's at the center uh, uh, illustration. And uh, the result is that this tracer, when injected into the patient, uh, is measured by the detector. So the detector is the so-called uh, razor, and the injectate is the razor blade. Every time the test is run, this injectate is used. Our test is considered the gold standard in the industry. That means that it is the most accurate test of blood volume. And it is utilized not only by leading healthcare centers, but it's also been utilized by drug companies, and other uh, researchers in order to validate the accuracy of their own or the uh, utility of their own pharmaceutical interventions as well. So Daxor is the company of choice that large pharma companies go to when they have a volume effective drug and they wanna test its effects. Our diagnostic has been shown to dramatically decrease mortality, lower the length of stay and save healthcare systems as well. I'll get into what some of those uh, uh, levels of evidence are around that. As I mentioned, over 50,000 tests are being been performed on patients to evaluate blood volume at leading medical centers. Uh, as we speak, there are patients who are getting their blood volume evaluated uh, with our diagnostic today. So why is volume measurement so important? Why is this something that you might not have ever heard of or been aware of? And why is it something that is so crucial for outcomes? Well, it's very simple. Your blood is the conduit for the oxygen that perfuses your tissues. It's literally the way that we breathe and we live is that when we do bring air into our lungs and we exchange that for oxygen via the hemoglobin, that is what perfuses our tissues. And so care teams, and it's universally understood that the imperative is that tissue perfusion must constantly be maintained. And the body has a number of mechanisms to try to constantly keep our blood volume and our perfusion happening. The problem is this, there are a number of different medical conditions, both acute and non-acute, that can lead to blood volume derangement. If those blood volume derangements are not corrected, then uh, a patient can suffer from um, decompensation or organ damage or death. 
And so this ball kind of represents what's happening here. The body is trying to keep the volume in an optimal place. And right now care teams are really flying in the dark. They don't really have a good sense of where the patient's blood volume is. That's because symptoms of volume overload or hypervolemia and symptoms of underload or hypovolemia look very similar to patients. So, you know, the care teams are constantly trying to decide, do, does the patient need more fluid or diuresis to take volume off? In addition, they're trying to understand whether they need red cells or plasma volume. Our test answers all of those questions. What are they using today? Well, they're using a variety of indirect measures. They're costly, some of them are invasive, and all of them are vastly inferior to direct blood volume measurement. It's sort of like if you were running a shoe store and you didn't have something to measure somebody's feet, so instead you had something that measured their height. You say, well, I guess the guy's six foot three, so I'm gonna guess he has a size 13 shoe. No, that doesn't really work. So chest X-rays, echocardiograms, wedge pressure measurements, all of these things have been shown to have very low correlation to actual blood volume. Why are they used? Because they're readily available, and up to now, that's what's been available. What's been the validation around it? Well, we've had far more research outcomes than I can get into in this brief presentation, but in the areas of heart failure, critical care, sepsis, syncope, which is fainting, surgical blood loss, and acute respiratory distress syndrome, blood volume analysis has been shown to be a very, very important measure and something that care teams really wanna know more about. And I'll get into the highlights now of what some of these uh, uh, research outcomes have pointed to. Something to just be aware of is that anything that makes a pivotal difference in outcomes in something like heart failure and critical care, these are massive total addressable markets, both in the United States and globally. This is some of the largest areas where we spend money in healthcare. This is not a diagnostic that solves a problem for some kind of orphan uh, drug kind of situation. This is not a narrow market. We're talking about one of the largest areas of healthcare spend and one of the leading causes of death in the country. How big are these markets? Well, heart failure is uh, over 6 million people suffer from heart failure in the United States alone. 1 million of them will end up in the hospital this year. Uh, about a third of them will be dead within a year of having been hospitalized for this. It's one of the leading causes of death. Critical care and sepsis also represents about 8 million admissions annually. This doesn't even touch on other areas where blood volume management is very important, including things like dialysis and ARDS. So we're really um, uh, in a situation where we're making decisions every single day about how patients' blood volume should be managed, but doing so with inferior diagnostics. So what happened for Daxor? Daxor uh, had uh, at the uh, end of uh, 2000, and 18, uh, a very pivotal study uh, published in Jack Heart Failure, one of the leading heart failure journals in the world, showing that when blood volume management was used to guide care uh, in 245 patient encounters, that it reduced heart failure mortality by an, a whopping 82% uh, on a 30-day basis and 86% on a one-year basis, and it cut the 30-day readmission rate by 56%. Why are those numbers so important? First of all, hospitals are measured on a quality basis of their 30-day outcomes. Anything that reduces heart failure by 82% is massive. Similarly, 86% on a one-year basis, also a very, very significant number. You can see the p-values on these studies were 0.001. Just to give you a sense of what that meant, in the control comparator group, 35% of the patients were dead within one year who did not receive blood volume guided treatment. Those that received blood volume guided treatment fewer than 5% were dead within one year. This was a, a very significant outcome. We've seen similar results actually in the ICU side. This is a prospective randomized controlled trial also published in a leading peer reviewed journal. It showed a reduction in mortality by 66% for severely ill ICU uh, patients uh, and it lowered their length of stay by 20%. So we're seeing uh, significant uh, value when patients are treated where patients have the benefit of practitioners who know exactly what's wrong with their blood volume. That gives them individualized care and precision treatment outcomes. What does this translate to in terms of health economic value? A tremendous amount, actually. Blood volume guided treatment has been shown in a study that was published uh, in the fall of 2020 to be five times more cost effective than other sources of treatment. The threshold of what's considered good value is about $50,000. When you treat with blood volume plus standard uh, treatments, the cost was approximately $10,000, so five times more cost effective. It uh, is forecast to extend the quality 
life years of a patient by a full 2.3 years. That's why Medicare uh, and private insurance both recognize the value of blood volume analysis and have awarded us with CPT and APC coding for our test. Uh, you can just see that it's an exceptional value and it's something that extends patient lifespan. Why? Diagnostics are cheap, therapy is expensive. Our diagnostic optimizes that therapy. So we have ongoing trials that are going on with a, a partner a therapy company, CHF Solutions, they do uh, uh, precision volume removal. We have a prospective randomized control trial in heart failure being done by Duke. We have a multi-center uh, COVID uh, related study that's being led by NYU. Uh, it's just a small slice of all of the exciting research that's going on. Again, also recent published data in the last three years, this is just a, a slice of how much uh, uh, is going on with blood volume analysis in leading journals. You can see uh, that uh, everything from the Society to Critical Care Medicine to the Heart Failure Society, all are receiving exciting abstracts and, and papers about the value of our BVA technology. And again, we are the unique only blood volume uh, diagnostic that is approved by FDA and the global leader. So innovation and next generation products. Well, the Department of Defense came to us several years ago and said, can you make a portable, ruggedized, rapid version of this to handle uh, hemorrhage and uh, blood loss for our soldiers? We agreed that started a series of military contract awards for us. 30% of our warfighters die from hemorrhage. And so we have been working for years uh, now to develop our next generation product. We're incredibly excited about it because it has both military and civilian applicability. It's something that can be used on the battlefield and it can also be used at the bedside uh, for patients in the ICU or can be used in the uh, out, outpatient setting as well. So we've been receiving multiple contract awards. We just received one last week, $750,000 from the US Air Force for a novel fluorescent tracer based system. We're very excited. Our next generation products are are a tremendous leap forward in terms of uh, usability, speed, uh, and uh, we're just so uh, excited that we're now in the military supply chain uh, and we're something that is, uh, will be eligible for contract award going forward. So having the, the military system as well as civilian hospital systems all wanting our product. Uh, again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the NIH also looked at our technology. They're very excited about us. They gave us uh, a grant also. Uh, that just happened two months ago through their CapCat uh, Point of Care uh, uh, Innovation Institute. Uh, they also recognize, <coughs> pardon me, they also recognize how very important what we're doing is, and they also want to speed uh, the development of our next generation of products and we couldn't be happier. We rose to the top of a very, very selective and competitive field. Just to give you an idea, fewer than 2% of companies get the kind of military awards or the kind of NIH awards that we get. We are really at the top of our game right now. Our business model, uh, again, there's a massive uh, addressable market here. Heart failure, for example, we estimate that if we achieved only 30% penetration of the market in heart failure, just 30% of it, that would be a recurring annual revenue of $585 million. You look at critical care sepsis, 20% of the market is $320 million. Hypertension, which also involves volume management, is a $1.2 billion uh, annual recurring market, at just 5% penetration. Surgical blood loss and transfusion, Similarly, at a 10% penetration, it's a $2.2 billion market. In other words, what we're seeing here is that this is a multi-billion dollar addressable market. There's a huge need to improve outcomes in these areas. And Daxware has the diagnostics, the patents going forward, and the technology in order to make this happen. About one minute left there, Michael. Thank you. I have a just, I have to go quickly through this. We sell our device, lease it. We also make money from our uh, uh, single use kits. We have exciting uh, agreements that we've just been signing with third-party distributors to accelerate our, our sales uh, through me, uh, major medical centers and, and hospitals. We have international expansion in the books as well. So we're going to be globally distributing our products. We have a very robust patent portfolio, a uh, number of patents that have been filed uh, last year, uh, granted in past years. We have half a dozen now for this year. We have a number of growth catalysts going on better clinical outcomes, next generation technology, an accelerating distribution and commercialization team as well. So we have a large number of, uh, of avenues of growth and a number of catalysts. I'll leave it to people to look at this slide later. Um, 
Daxor itself uh, is at a very attractive entry point. We feel we just have a $52 million market cap, no outstanding debt, um, just 4.01 million shares outstanding and a free float of 1.3 million with 67% insider ownership. So we are very much um, committed to what's uh, in the future here. Again, the highlights of the company, I can't really go into all of them due to time constraints, but I can say that Daxware has accelerating sales, uh, accelerating R&D, uh, and a number of exciting partnerships going on. Um, this is our management team. It's deep, it's experienced from some of the leading companies uh, in the space. And uh, we're very excited about what Daxware has uh, uh, in the books for 2021, 2022 coming up. Uh, thank you very much. That's our information. I'm sorry that we don't have time for further questions. Yes, no worries. Michael, I mean, the value is obvious. Wonderful presentation. President and CEO, Michael Feldshu of Daxor Corporation, listed on the New York Stock Exchange DXR. Um, I, I think an, a, a very valuable play. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Michael. Really, Thank you so much. I hope everybody has a great conference. Thanks Bye -bye. so much. All right. Uh, honestly, very excited from that last presentation, one that I will be paying close attention to uh, moving forward. Uh, I'm very excited for the upcoming conversation as well. I'd like to welcome Shanti Rexeline, uh, a Benzinga biotech-focused reporter, uh, to the stage. Uh, Shanti is going to be having a conversation with two executives that are returning as well, Rob Nee and Brian Cully. Uh, from Hoth Therapeutics and Lineage Cell, respectively. Uh, Shanti, I'll let you take it away. Hello, I'm Shanti from Bensinga. Welcome to the panel discussion on coming together to address unmet medical needs. Today, we have with us Brian Curley, CEO and interim CFO of Cell Therapy Company, Lineage Cell Therapeutics. It's a nice market listed company trading under the ticker symbol LCTX. Welcome, Brian. I'm excited to have you on the panel. Thank you, Shanti. Hi. Uh, we are also joined by Rob D, CEO of Dermatology Focus Biopharma, Hot Therapeutics. H O T H is a ticker symbol. Those of you who are keyed into their stock may have seen a surge in it yesterday on the back of some positive preclinical data on the investigational COVID 19 treatment. Good to have you, Rob. Thanks for having me, Shanti. Yeah. Uh, all set, right? Uh, we are going to have an exciting 45 minutes ahead discussing a range of topics on unmet medical needs and how these companies are endeavoring to plug the holes in the arena of drug research. Those therapies that qualify as catering to unmet medical needs are potential game changers possibly emerging as future standards of care, promising revenue opportunities that run from multi-million to multi-billion dollars. With that introduction, let's set the ball rolling. First up, let's hear from Brian. How do you qualify an unmet medical need? How important is it as a guiding concept for biotech R&D? Well, hi, Shanti. Um, so unmet medical needs, it's a, it's a funny term, right? It's got sort of formal and informal definitions. Uh, basically, what it does is it highlights that, um, that it's, you, you have a, an opportunity to provide some, some benefit. So I think it's a term that um, originally had some real purpose and uh, an intent by highlighting the problem, right? Because you've got the problem side, and you've got the solution side. Uh, so unmet medical need as a phrase sort of got borrowed by everybody because we're all trying to improve therapeutic outcomes for patients. So in one way, you could say that, you know, any advantage, any improvement is addressing an unmet medical need. And so people start saying things like severe unmet medical need or serious unmet medical need. Um, but it, it really is contextual. You can uh, offer a tiny improvement to a huge market, and that's a big change. Or you could have a huge benefit to a small number of people, and, and that's a big change. So uh, for as a guiding concept for biotech, it, it really is core to everything we're doing because we're all trying to make the patient condition, the human condition, improved. And so whether you're working on, you know, squeezing out a little more efficacy from an antibiotic or working on an enzyme replacement therapy, which heretofore didn't exist, 
uh, and can be life-saving. Uh, it, it, they, they all fall into that unmet need because we're all trying to deliver solutions where the outcome is a better result for the patient or the person. Uh, Rob, anything you would like to add to that? I think Brian really summed it up well. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it is true. You know, unmet medical need is anything. If you're a patient and you're not getting the therapeutic that you need for your treatment, whether it's something on the market today that doesn't help you or is a therapeutic that's not giving you the efficacy that you need, it's an unmet medical need to you. So I really think, as Brian mentioned, every biopharma company believes they're working on an unmet medical need. And we continue to do so. And that's innovation for you. And that's, uh, you know, COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics are a perfect example of unmet needs. And then biopharma working, you know, at, you know, at the speed that they did to try to remedy these different indications. Okay, that was insightful. Rob, what are the regulatory and governmental incentives as well as institutional support available for pursuing treatment options for unmet needs? So, uh, you, yeah, go ahead. I think that's a great question because, you know, we think unmet medical needs and then we think how long they take to get to market. Uh, There's a gentleman named Brian Wallach who suffers from ALS um, and he continues to raise money for ALS. And he talks about, you know, Will there be something for me? I don't know, but I want research to continue for the next patient. So there is a way for that patient to get some resolution, get help, and hopefully a cure. So I think with the FDA environment, what you're seeing with right to try for drugs that there are no clinical pathway for, or not a big enough patient population to start a clinical trial, those are really important functions that the FDA is allowing biopharma to go after. So I think that's something that's unique and different that we've experienced uh, this decade uh, over the last four years, and it continues. Uh, started, I believe, in the Trump administration, continued by the Biden administration. What's nice about it tonight's bipartisan issue that everybody can get behind. We're all about patients getting better, about trying therapeutics for life-saving needs when there's nothing else on the market. If the patient is willing to try it, if they're at their you know, final uh, you know, there's no other treatments out there. There's nothing else to try. So this is an important thing that the FDA and, you know, uh, Congress has gotten behind to allow patients to uh, experience. Thank you. How about the expanded access program of the FDA? Is it something special to therapies for therapies in development for unmet medical needs? Yeah, I think, look, I think that's something that, uh, you know, as a biopharma company, we look at, uh, and I'm sure Brian looks at as well, you know, this is something that's unique. And once again, you know, uh, you could talk about the vaccine or other therapeutics, uh, whether the FDA, I, I always believe the FDA as a whole is friendly to biotech companies. And, you know, they have a, a fine line that they have to balance on for patient safety as well. So I think what we're seeing here is with innovation moving so fast, the FDA realizing how fast, you know, whether it's gene therapy, whether it's, uh, you know, mRNA uh, vaccines for COVID patients, uh, you know, whether it's dermatological or, you know, cell advancement that uh, Brian's company is doing, which is phenomenal. You know, the FDA is really receptive to helping companies and helping patients and balancing that fine line. Okay, thank you for that insight. Sure. I appreciate the fact that both your companies are doing some solid research and potential therapies to address unmet medical needs. Uh, Brian, apart from profit motive, what are the other driving factors that keep you going in this quest? Well, I, I'm driven uh, by, by trying to, I, I often say, consistently have said, I'm trying to uh, leave the world a better place than when I found it. So for me, I am motivated uh, deeply by trying to develop new therapeutics. And, and I really think without exception, everyone I've ever met in this industry feels the same way. Um, profit may come from that. Uh, although I, I think actually as a CEO of a growth company, I'm really more focused on creating value, right? Uh, you know, Elon Musk created a lot of value before he ever turned a profit. So I, I feel very strongly that um, you, you, can, you can do well by doing good. And so, uh, you know, these breakthrough therapies, it, it is incredible. I, I, early in my career, had an opportunity to meet a gentleman who was involved with the development of a new heart uh, therapeutic and um, to treat heart failure. 
And I mean, he touched a million people, he, right? He saved a million lives by contributing to that program. That was striking to me because when you look out into the night sky and you see, you know, billions of stars and you start feeling meaningless, if you can help a million people be better, that is really motivating. So yeah, I'll take biotherapeutics over, you know, marketing cereals every day of the week. Oh, that's inspiring. Uh, Brian, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Rob, would you like to add anything to that? What Brian said, actually, uh, you know, it, it, great thought made me think about about that as well. You know, we we're so small, right, uh, here, um, you know, but we all can try to contribute in some way. And you know, it's one of the things that we've kind of talked about at Hoth. You know, you want to make your therapeutics accessible for everybody, right? And we all do. Um, you know, we we have that. You know, being profitable and trying to uh, take care of our shareholders, and so they do well. Um, but as we all know, you know, what is the first thing, you know, do no harm, right? So we're sitting here all today trying to make mankind better, trying to make a way to help patients who have no other help. So you really think, as you mentioned, the gentleman that he met that, you know, whether you save a million lives, uh, amazing. Um, and, you know, if you look at the scope of biotech companies, uh, you could look at the large and small, you know, they help patients each and every day. Okay. Uh, that's some high ideal to have. I appreciate both of your efforts. Uh, uh, moving on to Brian, could you please shed some light on your pipeline, especially on the pluripotential that is the technology behind your pipeline? Yeah, of course. It, in a sentence, what we do is we manufacture specific cells that your body has lost and we replace them. So we're really a cell transplant company. And we have three clinical programs today. Uh, one is for dry AMD, which is a condition where your retina cells die and you go blind. So we manufacture brand new retina cells and transplant those to the body to preserve your vision. We also have a program where we manufacture a special kind of spinal cord cell. So people who suffer a spinal cord injury, you know, the classic diving board accident or skiing or whatever, um, they become paralyzed and you can't move your arms and legs, uh, but they have the potential to recover. So we manufacture spinal cord cells and we transplant them to the area of injury to try to help individuals have greater mobility and recovery. And in the third iteration, we manufacture a type of immune cell. It's the part of your immune system, which is responsible for educating and informing your T cells. And so we manufacture these things called dendritic cells, and we load them with information to teach your immune system what a cancer cell looks like to ensure that it has the horsepower to go and kill it. So really, we are um, we're a platform technology manufacturing various cell types and trying to accomplish things that small molecules and antibodies uh, have not been able to accomplish so far. Uh, how does your cancer vaccine candidate back to differentiate from other currently available, uh, I mean, novel oncology therapies? So we have, uh, we, we manufacture these dendritic cells to help treat cancer. Uh, where it fits in is that uh, currently, to just be very broad about it, um, you know, there are options like chemotherapy or immuno-oncology. Uh, so, you know, chemotherapy is a little clumsy. It's about, you know, it's killing fast growing cells. Uh, immuno-oncology is about reducing a tumor's defenses. Where we fit a little bit differently is we're about more enhanced and, and targeted destruction of the tumor cell. So we provide a massive amplification of information to your immune system so that rather than having you know, a quiet whisper of uh, of information floating around your immune system. We have, you know, screaming from the rooftops to make sure that your, the, the T cells and the activities that they do in, in fighting can, uh, tumor cells, that they have all the information they need to identify tumor cells and, and uh, unleash the, the, you know, the power of the immune system. So we think that we can fit very nicely uh, without a lot of additive safety issues. We can fit very nicely and well tolerated in an immuno-oncology and or chemotherapy environment uh, and it's great. It's breaking space. I mean, CAR T is is moving now into CAR NK and and CAR Max, and and so our our dendritic cells, I think, are are you know destined to be picked up and become part of the physician's armamentarium going forward. How does the cost compare 
with the existing therapies, with the existing IO therapies as well as the targeted ones. Yeah, this is a huge unappreciated advantage of the lineage approach. And even today, there was an article about uh, the, you know, the, the open secret of manufacturing cell therapy, that the cost of these personalized medicines is so out of control. And we're seeing activity uh, in the legislative side about, you know, how do we control costs and so forth. Our solution for that is that we use cell lines. So we never take cells from a patient and manipulate them. That's custom, right? That's bespoke. That's incredibly expensive. What we do is we manufacture by the billions cells from cell lines that have already been characterized and we use them in ways that they're not rejected. And in doing so, by manufacturing billions of cells at a time, if we are transplanting, for example, 100,000 cells into the eye, that means we are already today manufacturing thousands of clinical courses in just a three liter bioreactor. So our allogeneic approaches really give us a huge advantage in an environment that is increasingly value pricing based and cost competitive. Okay, that's great. Uh, with two candidates in mid-stage development and one in early stage trial, what is the combined market opportunity you're shooting for? Well, for our lead program in dry AMD, uh, I can tell you that dry AMD is about eight to nine times more common than wet AMD and sales of wet AMD programs are above $10 billion. So, I mean, there's many billions of dollars available because there's nothing approved yet. Uh, similar for spinal cord injury, there's nothing approved. I mean, we have monopolistic opportunities uh, to, to be a first mover and, and be able to establish a market for these therapeutics. So couple that with our reduced costs of goods uh, and, and you know, fact that there's a paucity of competitive threats, uh, I think we're well positioned to do very well. And, and oncology, you know, oncology is special. It, it has heretofore tolerated incredibly high pricing. So, um, you know, even if that comes back down, I think we can uh, navigate very well. And, and so I think each of our programs represents a billion dollar commercial opportunity, in some cases, quite a bit more. Sounds real pretty. Thanks, Rob. Uh, uh, Rob, uh, could you please appraise us of your Bioalexa platform for atopic dermatitis in adolescents? Sure. So, as you know, we're starting our trial in Australia uh, this quarter. The reason we chose to do it in Australia is we get a tax rebate from the Australian government, and it's easy to recruit patients there in the pediatric level, and that data is still transferable back to the FDA. So we're very cautious with our money, where we spend it, how we spend it, uh, trying to do right by our shareholders as far as keeping our costs down. So the total addressable market for uh, atopic dermatitis is about a $16 billion market in 2025. It's around $9 billion today. It's growing at about 11% per year, uh, CAGR. So this is really a tremendous opportunity. If you look at the atopic dermatitis market as a whole, there hasn't been a ton that's been newly introduced. Um, what you have mainly is topicals, uh, which just treat the redness and the inflammation. Then you have biologics like Dupixin for really, really uh, you know, severe cases of uh, atopic dermatitis. That's an injectable that parents really wanna stay away from. It's not used for pediatrics at this point. So we think we're in a real sweet spot. We have a non-corticosteroid um, product that we're currently in the trial for. Big market opportunity. Uh, cheaper to move for us to do the trial in Australia. So we watch our dollars there, as I said, and we'll have readouts for that in the first cohort uh, early Q2. Um, you know, we're excited about that. We're excited about our anti-inflammatory platform, uh, gene therapy and COVID assets as well. We think we've got a really unique uh, pipeline, uh, all billion dollar opportunities and above uh, for you know, our shareholders, hopefully to participate in if we're successful. Is it time you mentioned nearly for the adolescent age group? So $16 billion is the overall market for atopic dermatitis. Uh, as you might probably know, uh, most cases of atopic dermatitis do start out as pediatric and then continue through the life. Um, you know, in many few cases as atopic dermatitis resolve itself. And what you'll also see is when you talk atopic dermatitis, you also talk food allergy. Uh, you know, most patients that have atopic dermatitis also have uh, allergies such as food allergies. And, you know, we have a, a drug that we're working on, as we talked about, for anaphylaxis, 
So we think, you know, these two drugs can go kind of hand in hand uh, as far as in our pipeline that, you know, immunological disorders that are unmet, that are underserved. Okay, uh, thanks, Rob. Thank uh, Brian, what are the key upcoming clinical pipeline catalysts for lineage? Uh, key catalysts. Uh, well, we had one yesterday, <laughs> so I can tell you that um, we provided uh, a, a essentially a doubling of our clinical data. So we had seen some encouraging uh, evidence of efficacy in our dry AMD program in the first uh, six or seven patients. We added data on another six patients, and it was consistent with the initial data. So that's a reinforcement of what we had seen. Um, we obviously don't have data updates every day, but uh, I can tell you that next quarter, we do intend to provide another update. And that one's of particular interest because the reading frame, uh, i.e. The, the data that you get in the first three months can be encouraging, but we feel that really it's the second three months that tell you whether a patient is responding well. So we're gonna be really keen to see how these patients uh, that, are, that are looking better than baseline, 75% of them are looking better than baseline. That's unusual. This is a vision, uh, this is a linearly degrading visual problem. You only get worse. And then on top of that, we also have been uh, starting to look at something called retinal restoration. We, we are the only company to ever describe retinal restoration. And uh, that is that we were able to make an area of, of injury smaller. And it shouldn't be possible because human beings lack the ability to regenerate retinal tissue. But we demonstrated it and it was durable and it was validated by experts in the field. And so we are hopeful with these newly re uh, treated patients that we will be able to reproduce that because we think that that would be incredibly powerful. So we'll have safety update, delivery update, we'll have efficacy update. And um, you know, if, if we see it, we'll have uh, restoration update as well. So a lot coming next quarter for, for lineage just on the lead program. Uh, uh, that's really uh, exciting few months ahead for you. I wish you good luck for it. Uh, how about uh, Hoth, Rob? So for Hoth, as I mentioned, we have the atopic dermatitis trial going in Australia. We'll have the start of our trial for HT001, uh, which is our lead uh, oncology drug. This is for cutaneous lesions that uh, take place for chemo patients, which is really something that there's nothing in the market for currently. So we think it's a big market opportunity for Hoth. Then we'll continue to have some preclinical data coming out on our psoriasis acne uh, anti-inflammatory platform and our gene therapy uh, therapeutic as well. So we just recently released some news also on our COVID-19 assets uh, that was very favorable. So we continue to have preclinical updates and obviously uh, on our clinical uh, projects as well. So a, a good time at Hoth Therapeutics, we think, in 2021. Uh, super excited about this year. Uh, company is funded uh, for the year. Obviously, we have uh, almost $20 million on the balance sheet. allows us to put all our programs in place. So we look forward to keeping investors uh, informed. Well, that seems interesting. Uh, moving on to the next question. Cash is key for biopharma companies, especially for smaller ones, which work for years together on hopes of potential revenue at a distant future. Uh, Hoth, I, uh, I for sure know, had a couple of private placements this year and an equity offering in 2020. How comfortable are you with your cash reserves? So it, that's a great question, Shanti. And I think, you know, biotech and Brian can talk to this as well, is an expensive business. And it takes, you know, uh, quite a few dollars to uh, put, you know, preclinical and clinical plans in place. And it takes a lot of planning. And the planning aspect is really where you start spending money before you're even getting any results, uh, such as putting your toxicology studies in place, uh, patient enrollment, and so forth. But Hoff is in a really good cash position. As I mentioned, we have uh, almost $20 million in cash on the balance sheet. No need for further funding in 21. Uh, we think you know we have a, a, at least 18, possibly 24 months of cash. Puts us in a really good position to put all our programs in place uh, for 21 and 22. Uh, Brian, you ended 2020 with a cash balance of 41.6 million. With so much going on with respect to your clinical programs, how sufficient is your cash? Uh, yeah, and to, to quote Monty Python, I got better. So on March 5th, we were able to report 57 million in cash and cash equivalents. Um, one of the things that I'm really proud of is that uh, having been the CEO of Lineage for 
a little bit more than two and a half years, I've never had to do a traditional financing. Uh, we've been able to successfully fund the company by uh, capitalizing from our extensive patent estate and conducting license agreements, spinning out businesses, converting them into cash. Uh, so we are well-funded today, uh, well into 2023. Uh, so that's more than two years based on our on our historic uh, spending rate of about five million a quarter. So I think we're in a we're, we're in a great position, and and we can reach some major clinical and and other developmental milestones with that capital. Uh, we've done that over the last two years, and I have no doubt that we'll continue to do that the next two years. So um, you know. More can sometimes be better, but we certainly have a lot of leverage with respect to our cash resources today. Okay. Uh, Rob, uh, if you ask to take one pitch to investors, what would be that one pitch you, you would like to make? I think we're going after areas at Hot Therapeutics that, you know, you know, we talk about unmet needs as, you know, this panel is named, right? We're really going after areas where there's tremendous opportunity for us, where we can have a first mover advantage, such as HG001, uh, you know, for cancer patients that are going through uh, chemotherapy, where you know there's a 36% pause or dropout rate. Uh, you know, we look at our anti-inflammatory platform, um, you know, from uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore. There's been nothing revolutionary in uh, acne and psoriasis based in some time. So we think once again, another tremendous opportunity. Uh, we really feel that anything we've licensed from these universities, keeping the inventors on board with us through the whole process, preclinical work uh, through clinical is a real differentiator from most other companies who simply license uh, and then take it in-house and try to figure out where to start. By keeping the inventor involved, by keeping the universities involved, you know, we really feel it puts us in a good position to succeed at a faster pace. Great. Uh, Brian, are you with us? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Any of the exciting user development you foresee for the current year you'd want to share with investors in your stock? Well, I think what we're seeing and experiencing is what I call cell therapy 3.0. So at one time, there was a lot of hype and excitement around cell therapy many years ago, um, but it was too early. It was not ready to deliver. Scientific progress is sometimes slow and it's not always a straight line. Uh, and one of the big problems was in manufacturing and delivery, uh, but we now are in an environment where cell therapy has matured and you're starting to see clinical evidence of that coming from companies like Lineage. Uh, like the retinal restoration and our spinal cord data. And uh, actually, I would you know direct investors to just take note of what's happening in the field because I think there's explosive growth. There are companies with multi-billion dollar valuations that aren't in the clinic yet. And, uh, and so I think that there may be some um, you know, inefficiencies in the market with respect to lineage today because we are actually walking the walk with respect to what cell therapy promised many years ago. And I think it's going to be a fun story. And, and to add to that, you know, Amazon used to just sell books. And, you know, right now we're mostly known for making retina cells, but there are 200 other cell types in your body. And just like Amazon sells everything today, who knows where we could go in the future. So, uh, you know, it's next year is going to be great, but, you know, there's a long ride here that, that could be, uh, you know, momentous. Looks, your story is inspiring. One last, last question to both of you. Uh, how do you see 2020 in general for biotech sector? Would you like me to take that first, Shanti? Yeah, you can, please. So I think, I think 2021 is, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's a reboot year because we had, you know, 2020, even with COVID, as you saw for biopharma, you know, innovation continues. It doesn't stop. Science never stands still. So I think in 2021, you're going to see, you know, even more therapeutics hit the market, more exciting developments. Um, you know, we were lucky at a hot therapeutics where our labs at the universities were operating even at a reduced rate. So we're able to move all our programs forward. I, I think you're going to see a lot more of that in 2021 uh, as the world opens up, as labs open up more, um, as trials once again really you know move at a quicker pace for enrollment. So I think 2021 is a really, I know it's an exciting year at Hoth. 
Uh, I know it's going to be an exciting year for Brian at Lineage, so I know that continues for all of us in the biopharma space. Okay, that's great. Uh, I think that sums up what uh, we plan to discuss. It was one hell of an insightful session. Thanks again, Rob and uh, Brian, for being with us today. Thanks, Shanti. Yeah, thanks, Shanti. Shanti. Thanks, Rob. Frank, thanks to the three of you, Shanti. Wonderful discussion. Rob, Brian, so happy to have you both with us. Uh, please do reach out, uh, Rob and uh, Brian. They have wonderful companies. Thanks again, gents. Thanks, Elliot. Thank you for that. All right, very interesting panel, tons of information on unmet medical needs and what that really means. Uh, again, Shanti, thank you. Um, so we are going to move on with, I believe we have four more presentations with incredibly interesting uh, stocks and incredibly interesting pipelines to discuss. Uh, but do please send me questions in the chats. I am here to ask those if we have time at the end of these presentations. There are two tracks to engage with. All of these presentations will be on the tracks after we conclude. And we're going to be back tomorrow with 10 more presentations as well. Uh, so everybody, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, please continue to engage with me. I will uh, continue to, to pass along your thoughts to the executives. Uh, so we, next up, we have Dr. Sanjay Shukla, the President, CEO, and Director of ATYR Pharma, NASDAQ listed as LIFE. Life. I love that. Dr. Shukla, can you hear me? I can. Is that is it Dr. Shukla or Dr. Shukla? Shukla. Shukla. I obviously am, chose the wrong one. <laughs> My apologies. I'm gonna let you take right uh, take it right away. Sure. So um just wanted to run through our, our slides here. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just a quick question. Am I mm -hmm. supposed to display on my own or? Yes, uh, if you you do should have the share screen option at the bottom there. Yeah, I apologize here. Give me one second. All right, how's, how's that looking? Looks great. All right, so <clears throat> thanks for this opportunity to uh, discuss some of the things we're doing here at ATIRE here in uh, San Diego, California. Uh, we're charting a new path to medicine uh, and here to talk to you a little bit about some of our activities. This next slide is, there we go. Uh, before I get into that, some of our forward-looking statements, I'll let you guys read that on your own. So at ATIRE, um, we, we're, we're lo really looking to develop a new class of medicines based on a uh, very interesting uh, novel proprietary biology platform that comes out of the Scripps Institute from the lab of Dr. Paul Schimmel. Uh, Dr. Schimmel has been uh, instrumental in founding some rather transformative companies, uh, El Nylum, Cubist, uh, Alchemies, to name a few. Uh, but his, his life's passion and the lab's passion has really been around this new biology that he's discovered around fragments of enzymes in our bodies called tRNA synthetases. And these are enzymes that help us make proteins. What Dr. Schimmel discovered years ago is for some reason these enzymes break apart into fragments. Uh, they migrate out into different uh, tissues in our bodies. And there they play a very different non-enzymatic role. They play a role in helping us control immune environments. Uh, so ATAR's job is really to look at these fragments and determine <clears throat> how can we get, make medicines from this? Where could they be uh, utilized? In what sort of different sort of disease conditions might they be useful? Uh, we have three verticals we've created. Um, in clinical, preclinical, and discovery. ATYR 1923 is our uh, clinical asset. This is an immunomodulator for severe inflammatory lung disease. This is a, a, a program that we are focusing on a form of interstitial lung disease known as pulmonary sarcoidosis. Uh, uh, data is expected in this very important phase two trial uh, upcoming here in Q3 of 2021. Uh, we recently reported out some positive results uh, from a uh, mechanistic COVID-19 trial that we uh, just read out here uh, in the last uh, uh, couple of days and weeks. Uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about that today. Uh, we also have a program focusing on NRP2 antibodies. What is NRP2? NRP2 is the receptor that 1923 binds to. It's a cell service receptor that uh, is expressed on immune cells. But what we've learned about this receptor is we also see a high degree of neuropillin expression in cancer. So we've developed a number of antibodies that we think can unlock the immune system and be useful in cancer. ATYR2810 represents our first anti-NRP2 antibody 
And this is currently an IND enabling work uh, where we've already shown uh, some interesting animal efficacy in a triple negative breast cancer model. And we have some follow on experiments that are reading out and will be presented here in a few weeks at American Academy of Cancer Research. Finally, we have our discovery programs uh, focusing on other fragments. We are discovering new receptors from these fragments and have recently found uh, two new fragments that seem to modulate and bind to natural killer cells, and this has implications in cancer. Our financials, uh, this, this is actually, uh, at the time we uh, presented this, uh, the, the, these slides were from, were from last week, 31 million as, as of the end of, uh, oh, actually this has been updated, excuse me, 31.7 million as of the end of December. Um, we're in good cash, a, a cash position here uh, for these readouts, in particular our phase two readouts for 1923. So our pipeline, as I've described it, uh, clinical program focusing on 1923, uh, 2810 focusing on solid tumors and preclinical testing, and a number of interesting uh, targets that we're looking at in cancer, fibrosis, and inflammation, focusing on a natural killer cell biology. This is a little bit about the science I described. As I said, there's about 20 of these enzyme families. Uh, they're all represented here on the left with these names, Rs, Cars, Dars. They represent the specific enzyme that helps you conjugate an amino acid to a tRNA. So HARS, for example, is in green, that's histidyl tRNA synthetase and basically takes uh, that amino acid and conjugates it, it to tRNA. But what it does, in addition to this enzymatic function is it breaks apart into fragments. One of these fragments in particular we saw was enriched in the lung tissue. And early on we saw had some real utilization in downregulating immune cells that are activated during an inflammatory response in the lung. So we followed this fragment into the lung. There's other fragments that seem to play a role in immune policing different tissue environments. Uh, but this fragment really started uh, us on this uh, pathway towards interstitial lung disease. One of the early experiments we looked at was in a bleomycin induced lung fibrosis model. We uh, presented this at American Thoracic Society a few years ago. This is the gold standard model looking at uh, uh, acute lung injury. Uh, here, rodents, where you see a healthy lung in rodents, uh, when you administer this agent, it creates a really inflammatory injured phenotype. There you see in the middle, a lot of this infiltration of these, these uh, dark dots, those are immune cells, and even some of this sort of lighter pink fibrotic remodeling. When we went back and treated these animals with 1923, we saw some real robust resolution. And this was presented to uh, about two dozen leading pulmonologists from around the world, they thought that 1923 was a novel mechanism to treat inflammation. Uh, this is what put us on the map and got us looking towards more immune-mediated lung disease. So 1923, uh, uh, we, we have targeted for immune-mediated lung disease. It takes this fragment and it fuses it to an FC region of a human antibody, there, thereby creating an engineered protein therapeutic that now has the characteristics of uh, a, a nicer half-life of eight to nine days. This can be administered once a month through a one-hour IV infusion. Uh, we have seen that this uh, drug binds to, as I said, NRP2, which is a cell surface receptor expressed on immune cells that are involved during inflammatory response. So now we really understand that this, these effects we see are mediated through this interaction with neuropillin 2. Neuropillin 2, we have learned, is expressed in uh, sick patients who have lung disease. Uh, sarcoidosis is what we're focused on. And we have detected neuropillin. The target is there in the granulomas, the, uh, the, the, the tissue of the worst pathology for these sarcoidosis subjects uh, is the granuloma. Uh, we've also seen in the literature, New England journals showed that lung tissue from patients who died from COVID-19 also expressed neuropillin 2. It downregulates a lot of that inflammatory and pro-fibrotic cytokine. We've already demonstrated good safety in phase one. And even in our current trial, uh, many, is, many of the patients have received the dose about six months uh, and thus far are tolerating the therapy uh, rather well. Uh, early on, as I said, we showed, did some uh, translational work in the, the bleomycin model. We ran a large translational campaign, similar to maybe what a large pharma would do, what might do before jumping into the clinic. So unlike a biotech that may look at one or two models, we ran a number of models, over a half a dozen models. Here's a snapshot of five. In each of these models, there's different types of injury 
Some can be more inflammatory, some can be more fibrotic. Depending on which model we ran, uh, you get a different kind of injury phenotype. The important takeaway is we saw consistent downregulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines in all of these models. So this had a really robust anti-inflammatory effect, regardless of the type of presentation of injury and the, and the type of injury we create. Uh, p acnes was an experimental model, mimic sarcoidosis, a lot of inflammation. We saw downregulation of these, these cytokines. Scleroderma GVHD model was presented at the Scleroderma Foundation a few years ago, has a mixed phenotype, inflammation in the lungs, but also skin fibrosis. There we also saw some nice efficacy. So this was a package of, of data that really made us comfortable, again, presented to pulmonologists before we went into the clinic and said, what's a good condition to look at? Uh, our basic mechanisms of action, therefore, is disease triggers in some patients. It can be organic, uh, an infection. Sometimes it can be autoimmune disease like scleroderma. Sometimes it can be environmental, which is probably what's causing sarcoidosis or, or some of the pneumonitis out there. Uh, in some patients, you get an aberrant immune response. What our drug does is it calms that immune response down, uh, basically creates a much more stabilized lung by dampening the immune response binding to this receptor that immune cells are expressing during this response. So let's talk a minute about interstitial lung disease. There's four major types. IPF, you've probably heard of because there's two drugs that generate about uh, two and a half to three billion in sales. But there are a number of other interstitial lung diseases that uh, are, are the larger well-known ones are sarcoidosis, CHP, uh, and connective tissue related ILD. Uh, these are conditions that present a little bit differently than IPF, a little bit more inflammation. Um, all of these diseases have this common immune pathology, that aberrant immune response. So even IPF patients have some degree of inflammation. Uh, our view is by targeting the inflammation, we're pre preventing the worst outcome. And that's really progression of fibrosis. When, once these patients become fibrotic and all roads can lead to fibrosis for these patients, that's really where you have the significant morbidity and mortality. Uh, therefore, we think we have a really nice opportunity to address these more pro-inflammatory interstitial lung diseases. When you look at the relative market size, as I said, IPF dominates uh, the market from a commercial standpoint, but there's a large green space opportunity in these more inflammatory conditions of which we see uh, approximately a, a, a two to $3 billion global market opportunity. ATIR is a leader. We're the furthest along of any worldwide biopharma in looking at these inflammatory ILDs. Uh, we're focused on these conditions because there's over half a million uh, of the patients who uh, are, are living with sarcoidosis, CTD, ILD, and CHP in the US alone, and about 3 million globally. Uh, let's talk about our first indication. Uh, pulmonary sarcoidosis is a condition characterized by clumps of immune cells, uh, highly driven by T cells and macrophages that you mostly see these clumps, these granulomas in the lungs. About 200,000 patients in the US, is, US are afflicted. Half of these patients need some form of systemic therapy, but those treatment options are limited to things that are quite toxic, corticosteroids, immunosuppressants, sometimes TNF inhibitors are used, but these come with a lot of toxicity. And unfortunately, none of these treatments uh, prevent these patients from becoming fibrotic. You still have 50 to 60,000 patients a year progressing to that fibrotic phenotype. And that's really, the, as I said, the worst outcomes for these patients. So we are running a study. We've uh, completed enrollment here with data expected in Q3, uh, looking at three doses of our drug, one, three, and five milligrams. It's a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial uh, testing these three doses. We're giving six IV doses once a month. Uh, what's unique about our trial in in these patients is we are enrolling stable, stably managed patients on corticosteroid, uh, anywhere between 10 to 25 milligrams. We're forcing these patients down to a subtherapeutic dose by week eight. So we're making these patients effectively unwell. And our view is our drug is being going to be able to control those patients who are getting 1923 compared to placebo. It is a safety and tolerability trial. Uh, as, as, it, as it is an early trial. But this steroid sparing effect, this is the first time the Division of Pulmonary in the FDA has endorsed a steroid sparing approach to treat ILD patients. Our study schema is rather elegant here in the sense that we're enrolling 12 patients in each cohort. 
Within each cohort, eight patients receive our drug, four receive placebo. As I said, there's a forced steroid taper over the first seven uh, to eight weeks of the trial. Everyone then gets to the starting line here with this five milligram dose. And what we expect is the placebo patients will not be able to control their day-to-day -day cough and shortness of breath. And they will titrate up with their steroid dose. Uh, titration is done by observing cough and shortness of breath using two validated symptom scores that these patients can um, be, be, be titrated based on those symptom scores. 1923 should keep these patients at a low level. At the end of the trial, you should see a splay in, these, in the uh, steroid utilization between these patients. And if we are able to maintain this, this subtherapeutic dose, we know the drug has actually been working. We have the added advantage that uh, towards the end of enrollment at cohort one, the PI has asked us, hey, if folks are doing well at week 16, could we think about maybe tapering people completely off steroids? Uh, we, we wrote a major, major protocol amendment uh, at that time and went back to the local IRBs and said, hey, can we try to get people off even any kind of background standard of care? Uh, they like that concept. Steroids are bad. Patients want to get off steroids. We now have the ability to potentially even get people completely off steroids towards the tail end of our trial. In particular, this will be important to look at as we advance into three and five milligrams to see if we have a dose response for that sort of complete responder population. Uh, I'll end here by saying much of that translational data we have been presenting at conferences uh, basically year on year. It was presented a few years ago in Dallas. We were approached by a respiratory focused uh, company in Japan called Curin. Uh, and we have uh, embarked on a collaboration with them. Uh, Curin has licensed 1923 uh, already based on our translational data uh, with upfront and milestone payments uh, that we've generated of $10 million at this point. We are eligible to receive approximately $165 million more in milestone payments. The bulk of these are development because Curin will be joining our next phase trial uh, as we look to actually get the drug approved in Japan they're funding all that development work, but as we advance the development in Japan, uh, ATAR will be, will be able to access some of these milestone payments. Let's end here quickly with just the highlights from our COVID-19 trial that's just read out. Uh, this was a mechanistic study that we were able to, we wanted to look at just one dose of our drug, one, three, one or three milligrams of 1923 uh, compared to placebo. Uh, 32 patients were enrolled in this study hospitalized patients needing oxygen, but not mechanically ventilated. Uh, what did we see? We were looking at safety. We also wanted to look at some recovery. Maybe we see something within just even just one dose. Uh, and then the clinical biomarkers, which we just reported out. Uh, the, the study tracked well with safety. It was generally safe and well tolerated. That's good. No new scary findings from a safety point of view, even with a very serious population. We also see no long-term disability in the patients treated with the three milligram dose, <clears throat> as opposed to placebo, where you still have some folks who have limitation in activities. Signals of activity, we saw a modest improvement uh, getting people out of the hospital in about five days, five and a half days, uh, a tighter stats on that compared to placebo. Uh, why might a placebo overperformed? Uh, the PIs thought, hey, this is actually a, a pretty um, good finding in placebo. But as it turned out, when we looked at the randomization, which is we're blinded, it's, it's sometimes these things happen in small studies. We had some sicker patients in the 1923 group, more over the age of 65, severely hypoxic, more comorbidities. What that tells us is the drug had a tougher group to actually get better uh, and still was able to outcompete and do a good job with placebo. Uh, these findings were backed up by what we also saw in the biomarker data. The biomarker data confirms this, that we had more, inf more of an inflamed population in the treatment group. Despite this, patients treated with 1923 showed a nice trend of improvement in over 80% of those biomarkers. So even those patients that had these elevated biomarkers, we see really strong reductions in uh, interferon gamma, IL-6, uh, MCP-1. Uh, what's really interesting is these are the very same biomarkers that the animal studies also show the greatest amount of impact. So we see very nice validation between this patient biomarker data and what we saw in the animals. We also, in, actually in this small study, saw a statistically significant reduction in serum amyloid A, which is a very well-known marker of inflammation in sarcoidosis patients. So with that, a um, lot more on the, on the research side. I know we're running out of time. 
Um, I encourage everyone to take a look at some of the work we're doing in cancer with neuropillin antibodies. I think the key catalyst to pay attention to are these sarcoidosis readouts that are coming out here in the near term in Q3. Fantastic, Dr. Shufla. Really, really interesting. And uh, it sounds like there's a lot of runway outside of just the COVID aspect of what you're doing, though. So uh, very exciting time. Appreciate you being here. Thank you, Elliot. Thanks for the time. All right. So that is ATYR Pharma, uh, Attire Pharma, NASDAQ listed L-I-F-E, LIFE. Fantastic ticker. <laughs> awesome. Thanks again, Dr. Dr. Sanjay uh, Shukla, President, CEO, and Director. All right. Uh, if you are learning a ton, drop a one in the chat for me. This has been an absolutely phenomenal day of education, deep insights into companies, uh, panel discussions on COVID, on unmet needs. COVID's not going anywhere too quickly, uh, but I am so excited. We are not done yet, y'all. We got three more amazing companies to get through. A Dial Pharmaceuticals, William B. Stiley, Chief Executive Officer and President uh, NASDAQ listed A-D-I-L. Uh, how are you today, Mr. Stiley? Yeah, I'm just doing fine, Elliot. Thank you for having us today. Oh, we are excited to have you. I am going to let you get right to it. I don't want to waste your time. Excited to have you. Uh, tell us all about your company. Okay, really appreciate it. So first of all, before I get started, uh, again, thank you, Elliot, and thank you to Benzinga for putting this on. Um, before I get started into ADAL, you know, it's always good to have an idea of to whom you're speaking. So I'll a little bit about myself. I'm Bill Stilley, CEO of Adal Pharmaceuticals. Uh, background is undergrad, Marine Corps, and then in business. Uh, started out in finance and heavy industry, but quickly a couple decades ago moved into life sciences. And my last position after a previous company where I had been the chief exec, I'm a chief uh, operating officer and finance officer, had been acquired. I worked for the acquiring company, and I was the vice president of business development and strategic projects. So strategic projects meant I Got, did, did anything that got into trouble, and I ended up running a cardiovascular global phase three program, a manufacturing drug for launch. But on the business development side, I was always looking for acquisitions. That's where I found the technology for ADAL. We liked it. It was on track for an acquisition. And at that point, the uh, company board of directors said, stop the acquisitions and let's sell clinical data. We did that to force as a billion plus dollar deal. And that gave me the opportunity, though, because that drug had not been acquired to go and start a new company around that technology. And that's what we're here today. We went public uh, uh, almost two years ago now, and we are driving forward. And that drug is now in phase three trials. So I'm going to share, give me a second here, share my screen so we can go ahead and uh, give the presentation. And uh, so, as I said, Adal Pharmaceuticals, we've all seen the forward looking statements before. And what we have is, our, is a company that is focused on developing medicines for addictions. Our lead products is a drug called AD04. It's a genetically targeted drug for alcohol use disorder. So this is one of the largest disease states that exists in the United States and in the world as a whole. And the Lancet has even said it's the leading cause of death in people, people in their prime, which they define as ages 15 to 49. So we have a differentiated product, which in the one third of the patients that would be expected to be genetically positive, helps them reduce their craving for alcohol to reduce or eliminate their drinking. Currently in a phase, had a good phase two in 283 patients and currently in phase three trial in seven countries. Uh, and that trial is designed to be usable as a, a basis for approval in both the US and Europe. Uh, it's a reformulated drug, so we think that gives us a lot of advantages. Of course, with any reformulation, there's a couple of risks, but we think we have those well handled and they are not relevant to our drug. And we think this is a drug, when you get approved, would be something that a small company could handle as far as taking out, becoming a multi hundred million, maybe even low billion dollar drug before you partner or are acquired by a larger company to go out and go to the general practitioners and make it into a blockbuster product. Patent protection out to 2032. We'd expect extensions to 2037. And exciting for us recently is we did our first acquisition of a company called Pernivate. Uh, that gives us an adenosine platform to develop a number of other drugs, including their lead product in pain. And with that, combined with the other alternative uses for AD04, really gives us a robust, robust uh, uh, product portfolio already. So a little bit about the team, just depth in all positions, even for you know, a 
smaller company like ourselves. Uh, I've already told you about, you know, about me, which is the first person, uh, Dr. Johnson, one of the world's leaders in the field of addiction. Uh, Joe Truick has been with me at our CFO, three companies now. Alex Lugaboy was chief business officer for Indivier, which had the $1.6 billion opioid use disorder drug. Uh, Mark Pekin, Skylar Vincent, round out the team with great power, and then we're building. Jack Reich, one of the founders of Gencia, has recently joined the team as full-time management. We acquired through the, through the acquisition, we didn't acquire Dr. Thompson, but through the acquisition, Dr. Thompson is now working with us and one of the world's leaders in the field of addiction, inventor of numerous drugs. Andrew Taubman uh, has recently joined us as the VP of Corp Corporate Development, and importantly with him, he has that uh, reimbursement background, having worked for Blue Cross Blue Shield at senior levels and then our general counsel. Board of directors, again, depth and strength. Kevin Schuyler runs a $10 billion CIO operation. Tony Goodman was the chief commercial officer of the company that built Suboxone into that $1.6 billion drug. And again, bench strength below that. So when I say it's one of the largest disease states in the world, I mean, we're talking about potentially 35 million people in the United States alone. The damage to society is incredible. Quarter trillion dollars of damage estimated by the CDC, by the NIAAA, as I mentioned, leading cause of death. American Oncology Association says more than one in 20 cancers directly caused by alcohol. Despite this, a small number of people are actually getting treated today as far as a percentage of that group. And, you know, that's a big problem. I'll talk about why is that? Especially when you say that in Europe, it's an even bigger problem. So this is really a global issue. And I would tell you the reasons why current drugs are not being, uh, the, the current treatments are not working is that they are all, in, you know, can only be characterized by one word, and I would call that word extreme. If you think about it, first, dramatic life makeover, raise your hand, you know, give up friends often, sometimes even dissociate from families. That's one of the, the, the most prevalent ways of getting treated. If you're, you know, AA will tell you, you will likely not be willing to tolerate our treatment unless you have hit they have a term, it's called rock bottom. It means your life has been destroyed in some way. So an abstinence being the absolute end state for everyone. And not that abstinence isn't a great way to treat and for those with whom, in whom it works, that is the perfect solution, but it doesn't work for everyone. And if you're willing to try one of the pharmacologic treatments, you have a, a drug that can make you violently ill if you drink. You know, most people just don't take that drug. One that's an injection, you get it every 30 days. It has, it's very painful. And it has a number of side effects. And so really only those people that are have hit rock bottom are willing to take these treatments today. And what the patients really want is they want to be able to in, stop the harm of alcohol in their life. And they're not so interested in those extreme treatments. So what we have, new method of action, very safe and tolerable drug as, as demonstrated so far. The oral dosing, which we think is very important, and it reduces the heavy drinking which is really the culprit in causing most of the damage. Doesn't require them to go into public. If they don't want, they don't have to raise their hand. If that works for them, that's great, but they don't have to do it. And we think this is you know, very important for the uptake in the market. And finally, there's a genetic test. So previously, the doctor's conversation might be something like this. Hey, I notice you're drinking a bit. Have you thought about getting help? You know, going to behavioral therapy, AA, maybe taking you know, that injection. And the answer you often get is, whoa, 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 maybe, you know, that's not for me. I'll, I'll, I'll do better. Now the conversation is, hey, there's a test to indicate whether a, a product could help you reduce your drinking. What do you think about taking that test? And the patients, the responses we get when we talk to them is, you know, wow, that'd be really interesting. I'd be like to know that. And wow, that would explain a lot. And this drug would be built for me. So we think this could really be important. It limits the number of patients that can potentially get the drug, but it will drive uptake of what we believe in, uh, in the material way. So we have a product as a, with that, that list that looks better than the things that are out there available today, assuming you know that all gets proven out in the phase three trials and uh, we're driving forward. So the drug works through serotonin three blockade, which is well known to work upstream of dopamine, you know, through the dopaminergic system. And it is also a drug that is already on the market today. So it's under the brand name 
Zofran. It's an anti-nausea drug. And when I looked at this, uh, one of the first questions I asked is, what will stop people from just taking Zofran? It's already on market. And there have been problems with other uh, drugs that are reformulated being used off of the, where the current drug is used off label. And with this, we don't think that'll be a problem for two primary reasons. The first is in dose response work, once you start overdosing the drug, it seems to stop working. And you'll note that Zofran is on the market at the lowest dose of a four milligram tablet. And our dose is a 0.33 milligram tablet. So greater than 12 times less. And if you look at drugs in the uh, serotonin space and other brain drugs, you see that there is often an overdosing problem where if you overdose, it stops working. So ADHD meds, antidepressants, if you dose too low, they don't work. If you dose too high, they don't work. Uh, marijuana, that's a good one, serotonin uh, effector. If you dose low, it's angiolytic, meaning it helps with anxiety. If you dose high, it actually has the opposite effect. You know, people hear about paranoia and stuff. So our drug seems to behave similarly to other serotonin drugs. And so we would expect that uh, if you overdose with the current doses, it would not work. And secondly, ondansetron is known to have cardiovascular effects at high doses. In an acute setting, like it's used for nausea, which is post-operatively and post-chemotherapy for a few hours or a few days, that's fine with Zofran as at its high doses. But in a chronic setting, like for addiction, you would have potential safety concerns. So we think it's highly unlikely this would be a, a big problem. And then talking just real quickly about our patents, we have patents filed in over 40, or approved, I should say, and issued in over 40 jurisdictions. And if a generic competitor tried to come on at our dose, they'd have to do it on an approved patent, and our patents prohibit them from coming on. So now let's look at that phase two data I mentioned. So 283 patients. On the left, you have the primary endpoint, the severity of drinking measured in drinks per drinking day. On the right, you have the secondary endpoint of frequency of drinking measured in days absence. And what you see from this in that left-hand group, the target genotypes, the, the dark blue bars, and the right-hand group, the, the light blue bars are the other genotypes, that people on drug, on genotype, had a significant reduction in both frequency and quantity of drinking. That means they picked up the bottle less often, and when they picked it up, they could put it back down. And you'll note that they picked up the bottle almost 50% less often. And when they picked it up, they could put it back down 60 with 60% 60 less drinking. So importantly, this also has demonstrated that it seems to have demonstrated that uh, it reduces the heavy, which is also known as the harmful drinking, which would be the basis for an approval with the FDA and with the EMA. So we already have our trial design approved by the FDA. We're going out and we're running it. Right now, we expect to have data in about the second quarter, I mean, first quarter of next year. And this just, just shows that, that our, our plan for development. When we commercialize, we think that this drug will be used and up, have uptake just like antidepressants. Some people will go on it for a short period of time, rotate off, maybe go back on. And also, the first initial doctor to prescribe it will be the specialist. Eventually, you'll have some people that end up going on it stay on it for life and you'll have the general practitioners that will be doing most of the prescriptions just like with the antidepressants. So when you think about what this means for a market, remember I showed you that slide earlier of the number of patients. If you take just one third of the patients and then you use a reasonable uh, monthly cost of, a, of $255 a month, you come up with a $36 billion potential market for just those that are genetically positive. And importantly here, notice that if you look at those already in the system getting treated, it's a potential $3 billion market. And so the question I ask is not even so much, can we get some of that $36 billion market, but how many of those people that are already going through the extreme treatments available today, you tell them there's a safe, easy to use drug, all you have to do is take a test to see if it's for you. How many of them will take the test? And if they're positive, how many of them will try it? I think of that 3 billion, which is really the low hanging fruit, easily targeted, we can get a significant percentage. So manufacturing, we already have it worked out. We recently announced that we've scaled it up even further and we are ready to go commercially. We've taken the time to invest in that so nothing will delay us as far as manufacturing is what we believe. And what we have is a massive market, a late stage drug with good data in phase two, the companion diagnostic to identify the responders. We've worked it out with the FDA already. 
manufacturing is high margin, simple, simple, we can do it, long, strong patent protection. And then there's indication expansions for ADO4. We believe we expect to do some uh, uh, trials or you know, testing in opioid use disorder, maybe gambling. Look, look at label expansions once it's approved for, uh, for alcohol use disorder. And then our rec recent acquisition of the adenosine platform through Pernivate, we think gives us a lot of opportunities. We're going to focus on pain for internal development, but we think there's cancer, asthma, diabetes, inflammatory diseases, which we can also uh, go after as license, potential licensing opportunities. So thank you for your time today. And uh, I'm not sure if we have time for any kind of questions. Elliot, turn it over to you. Yes, sir. We do have a question in the chat, and I think an interesting one uh, to look at a little bit more broadly here. Jeff uh, Cavalieri uh, references anti-abuse, uh, but I would open up to probably uh, other uh, anti-addiction drugs as well. Uh, anti-abuse is a drug that stops people from boozing. Uh, can you compare ADO4 to that? And how is yeah. it different and comparable? Yeah, absolutely. And I'd actually say when you talk about an extreme drug, that is the poster child for an extreme drug. Antabuse, the, the uh, generic is disulfram, is a drug that if you take it and then you drink, it turns alcohol into a poison. It stops its breakdown so that it becomes a poison. And it makes you violently ill. So if you take the drug, then you drink, it makes you violently ill so bad that it can even be fatal. And what ends up happening there is People just don't take the drug. You know, I, I once went to a conference and my, here's my story about antibus. I went to, to a conference and I had a woman come in and, and say, you know, she wanted to meet with me. She actually didn't want to talk about business. She wanted to learn about our drug because she had had a problem in her family with alcohol use disorder. And she said that antibus had saved her life. And I was like, wow, I don't usually hear good things about antibus. Tell me about it. And she said, yes, every day I get up and I make my mom take it. And I tell her if she doesn't take it, she has to move out. Because of that, she no longer drinks. And I have heard, and I had actually, I had a, a similar thing happen where uh, somebody came to me and said, oh, you know, I was interested in what you're doing because I used to manage uh, antabuse sales in Australia with one of, the, in the, uh, one of the drugs in my bag. And he said, and I knew all 25 people that took it. And so, you know, this is a drug. I mean, think about it. If you want to drink, all you, have, and you have a choice. So you want to drink, you can either drink and throw up all over the place, or you can just not take the pill. Humans are pretty smart. They know what to do with that. Fair enough. So essentially, Jeff, ADO4 is not fatal. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it, it, <laughs> ADO4 is a simple, easy to use pill. You take it, you know, take it. It's, a, it's just a medication. But the side effect profile is extremely low. So that is not one of our methods of action. Our method of action appears to work through craving inhibition, not through punishment if you do it wrong. Can I ask, uh, this may be a very layman terms question, uh, but this is, this is my own. So when your drug does not, or drug medicine does not, you know, make people uh, stop drinking, you know, they can still have drinks. It, it works with the craving. So with that in mind, how does that affect overall withdrawal uh, from the person? I'm assuming it probably lessens it by a great deal. So we have not done a withdrawal study, and, and I'd say that there's, other than the fact that at much higher doses, it has an anti-nausea effect, but it doesn't appear to have that at our, we would not expect our drug to be particularly useful in inhibiting withdrawal symptoms. What it will do is inhibit the overdrinking in the future. And you know, if you think about it, if you're somebody that can't control, and now all of a sudden, and by the way, it didn't just stop people from starting to drink, it allowed them to stop in the middle of the drink, right? So we think that's wow. important. But also, if you're somebody that's trying to be abstinent, and that's what you and your doctor think are best for you, and you look and you see the, the, the bottle sitting there and it's calling to you, wouldn't it be great to have a little help? Right? And you know, AA will tell you, you know, AA will tell you, get help from wherever you can. Get help from your friends. Get help from AA. Get help from God. And, you know, if you get help from, from a, a good pharmaceutical that's been tested in trials and shown as safe, and can really help you achieve what you want in your life. That's exactly why we take all of the drugs, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, drug, good drugs, I mean. Absolutely. Now, I, I believe, did I pronounce your last name correctly before? It didn't sound like I did. Uh, was it you, still? You did, you did not, but that's oh okay. So it's, it's I got the note and I still said it wrong. My goodness. <laughs> uh, so this is William Stilley, Chief Executive Officer and President of A-Dial Pharmaceuticals, listed on the NASDAQ, A-D-I-L. 
what a pleasure to have you. Incredibly important work you're doing. Okay. Thanks. Well, thank you, Elliot. And, uh, yeah, have a great right. day. Thanks so much. You as well. All right. Fantastic. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much for the question. Please keep the questions coming. If you are learning a lot, drop a one in the chat. I'm excited to be here. I still have 24 hours of this and I, I could not be learning more right now from these uh, executives and thought leaders of this, within this industry. And to answer your question, Pep S or Pepsi12, Ampio is right now. Uh, we have Holly Sharevka, Chief Operating Officer, and Michael Macaluso, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer from Ampio Pharmaceuticals, listed on the New York Stock Exchange, AMPE. Uh, as we bring them over, please do remember, all of this is evergreen on, on YouTube. If you miss something, you can go back and watch it now or later. Uh, I suggest doing that later and asking as many questions for Mike and Holly as you have. Uh, Ampio Pharmaceuticals is an incredible company, and I hope you all have uh, questions for him. Mike, Holly, let's get your cameras and mics turned on if we can, and we will get going. All right, I see Mike there. How are you doing, sir? Good, thank you. Thank you for having us. Oh, we are thrilled to have you. Uh, and there is Holly. How are you? Hi, I'm great. Thank you. Of course. Fantastic. You're both here. I'm excited to hear what you have to say. I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, I will share my screen and we'll quickly go through the presentation and then hopefully open it up to uh, any questions. How's that sound? Beautiful. Okay. All right, so just to get started, thank you for the introduction and thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, we are Ampio Pharmaceuticals. We are focused on advancing immunology-based therapies for prevalent inflammatory conditions. Of course, that's really applicable um, during this COVID time. Uh, and we do have a COVID program. So we're actively um, pursuing an application in COVID-19 and the fight against COVID-19. And we're excited to um, be able to share positive preliminary results in human trials there. Um, and also we're in development in osteoarthritis, osteoarthritis of the knee, which is a chronic inflammatory uh, condition where the standard of care hasn't really changed in decades. So we'll talk a bit about where we are in late phase development there. Um, Ampion is our lead therapeutic and that's what we're talking about for all of this. And Ampion really is a platform biologic, meaning uh, the ability to address several different indications. And it's a multi-channel therapy. And that really means that because of the nature of the product in and of itself, we're able to deliver the drug um, intravenously as so IV, as well as inhalation and um, straight into the joint with an intra-articular injection. We uh, have demonstrated data in multiple human trials, as well as a lot of data from our in vitro laboratory work. So we have a strong research and development group. Um, and I believe you already announced there on the side of the screen there, you see AMPE is our ticker and there's some just general business highlights. I'm joined today by Mike Macaluso, you see Mike there, um, as well as Dan Stokely, our Chief Financial Officer. So let's dive right into Ampion. Uh, what is Ampion and, and how exactly does it work? Um, just asking if I want subtitles. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I'm having a technical difficulty here. So how does Ampion work? Let's see if I can, there we go. Can you see that? There you go. Yes. Uh, okay, great. So Ampion is an immunomodulatory drug with anti-inflammatory effects. What does that mean? It means that Ampion modulates the immune response. And I'll talk about that with a graphic in the next slide. But essentially, how do we measure that? So we know that Ampion is modulating the immune response because in the lab, we're able to treat human cells with saline and Ampion, and we can show that uh, in comparison to saline, Ampion actually reduces the presence of inflammatory proteins. So here's a list, for example, tumor necrosis factor alpha, um, IL-1 beta, et cetera. And so while we're reducing that level of inflammation, we're also um, increasing those uh, anti-inflammatory proteins, such as interleukin-10, et cetera. And so that's how we're able to show um, efficacy across a wide range of different conditions. And here's a nice graphic to kind of give a visual to what I'm talking about. So Ampion actually blocks the transcription here in this, this cartoon, you can see the block with that little red um, bubble. We block the transcription of, for example, 
NF kappa B, which then reduces the amount of those on the top there, those red inflammatory proteins. And we promote the transcription of things such as AHR and PAPAR gamma, and that increases the production of those anti-inflammatory or healing or resolving uh, proteins. So essentially in a disease state, um, your body, you know, the inflammatory response when you're healthy is quite good. It happens, uh, uh, you know, according to an insult or an injury, and then your body's able to turn it off and you continue life and business as normal. In a disease condition, that response just continues and continues, ultimately attacking and sort of degrading and turning on your own body. And Ampion really works to restore the homeostasis across multiple pathways. So many products work um, specifically targeting one pathway, and Ampion is unique as a biologic in that it targets multiple pathways um, in the immune response and is able to provide that immunomodulatory effect. Uh, and all of this really comes from our foundation of research development, really discovery. And so we have an in-house scientific team, we have an in-house uh, research laboratory, and we continue to investigate how this mechanism of action can be applicable across multiple disease conditions, in addition to those ones where we're already in human trials. And so along those lines, we've announced uh, research collaborations with prominent scientists at Vanderbilt University, as well as one of the oldest children's hospitals uh, in the country. And some of the things that we investigate uh, include pediatric conditions and kidney conditions. And so what you really have is Ampion as an immunomodulatory therapy really um, sort of laying the work as a platform biologic, and then you can see the different indications that we're actively pursuing in human clinical trials as well as R&D, and all of that is in an effort to continue to provide value to patients and to improve clinical outcomes for patients, which ultimately delivers value for shareholders. And how does that translate into the clinic? When can you expect results, and what is it that we're looking at? So in the clinic, um, we have inflammatory joint disease. We've uh, our late phase asset is osteoarthritis of the knee, and I'll provide an update on that. Um, we're in a confirmatory phase three study under a special protocol assessment with the FDA. Essentially, that means we've agreed on the critical elements of protocol design with the agency. So we um, are attempting to de-risk the regulatory path forward to market uh, by working with the agency and agreeing ahead of time on the elements of trial design. We've also demonstrated safety in osteoarthritis of the hand. So I mentioned the nature of our therapeutic is such that um, it's not incredibly viscous, which means we can use a fine gauge needle and we can really go with large joints like the knee, but also get into those smaller joints such as um, the basal joint at the base of the thumb. And in terms of inflammatory lung disease, we'll talk about um, inhalation therapy with our products to directly target inflammation in the lungs of COVID-19 patients. Um, along that, uh, is acute respiratory distress syndrome. So that's a leading cause of mortality in COVID-19 patients. So we can talk about the application there. And then very briefly, we'll touch on kidney pediatric disease um, and our long haulers or long COVID um, or PASC as uh, Dr. Fauci has recently provided an update on. Um, those patients who continue to experience low levels of chronic inflammation after COVID-19 infection. So cruising into COVID, I mentioned um, the different programs here. And so we'll break the categories up into inhalation, IV, and the long hauler or long COVID studies. And so we're really excited that we were able to announce positive preliminary results for um, the inhalation study. And we're expecting top line results in Q2, early Q2, as well as the launch of a phase two study that we were able to work with the FDA on. Um, the same is very similar with the IV study. So we did complete a study of 10 patients and we showed safety and trends in efficacy with a small patient number and we presented that to the FDA as well. Um, to discuss the potential application for emergency use authorization or EUA, where does it fit in and, and what exactly are we looking at here? And all of that also translates into the continued development um, in cases as we learn more with the emerging sort of evolving data on the pandemic uh, with the long COVID or the long hauler study. So for inhalation treatments, um, the preliminary data that we reported and also shared with the FDA showed an improvement in all-cause mortality such that if you're receiving standard of care, which approves, um, uh, includes therapies that have been approved for emergency use authorization, um, so any standard of care, essentially whatever the clinic has in the hospital settings have for their patients, um, we allowed a standard of care 
uh, you were either in that treatment arm or you were um, in receiving standard of care as well as Ampion. And we showed that, um, you know, in standard of care, your all-cause mortality rate is about 21%. And that number drops to about 8% with Ampion treatment. So that's really something that we feel is very clinically meaningful in this population. Um, likewise, you see those continued trends with hospitalization time, 11 days with standard of care treatment, um, and including approved therapies, and that drops to just seven days when you add on that Ampion treatment. Um, same with oxygen use, so you'll, you remain stable or show improvement in your uh, requirement for oxygen um, for patients with 86% of patients in remaining stable or improving with Ampion treatment compared to about 75% of standard of care patients. Um, the same is true with um, quality of life measures and adverse events. So we ask a questionnaire, how are you feeling? And it's a standard set of objective criteria. Uh, and we're seeing stable or improvement with the Ampion treatment, again, 86 versus 75% of standard of care. And adverse events were really the same between both groups, indicating um, you know, an unremarkable safety profile, or in layman's terms, uh, well-tolerated safety profile. And so um, all of this is backed by um, scientific evidence and a regulatory position to the FDA. So even though the agency is moving quite quickly, they do have requirements in order to allow you to move into human. So we pivoted from an osteoarthritis as a knee program because of our in-house laboratory and our research and development. We were able to demonstrate um, application in the lungs. And the first thing you have to do with the agency is we work with them uh, in order to show the development of aerosolized Ampion. So you can see here this sort of bell-shaped curve is exactly what you want to mm -hmm. see. That's the drug delivery into the lung, showing that it can be appropriately delivered to target inflammation in the lung. And that little pink box actually is uh, a rat lung tissue to show, hey, this is exactly what you want your lung tissue to look like when you deliver your drug to the lung. You want to protect and maintain healthy lung tissue, which is exactly what we demonstrated. Um, and we presented that to the FDA, and the FDA uh, moved quite quickly to award us an active IND in order to allow us to move into the um, And so we conducted the trial that I just updated you on the preliminary results with a five-day treatment of inhaled Ampion versus standard of care. Um, similarly, we developed a program for um, intravenous application. So as you know, COVID-19 presents a lot of symptoms. So not only just respiratory distress and issues, but there is systemic inflammation present that's manifested in a lot of different ways. So we also wanted to investigate IV application to evaluate um, if we address the, the inflammatory cascade or that runaway cytokine storm that we're reading so much about um, using systemic IV therapy, could that also improve outcomes for patients? And in fact, you know, that's what we're seeing with early data with them. Our first study was an, a 10 patient study and we showed that it was safe and well tolerated. Uh, we presented this information to the FDA as well. Um, they did approve that act by and and they gave us recommendations in order to uh, move forward for potential application as emergency jurisdiction product. Um, they gave us recommendations on how to design a phase two study, which um, is that global study that we're evaluating in the U.S. and Israel. And all of this really comes from a lot of the exhaustive research and development, as well as the osteoarthritis of the knee program. So as a recap in the market space for osteoarthritis of the knee, um, it's a global issue. It's a, it, over 200 million people worldwide suffer from osteoarthritis with 17 million people in the US alone. As a novel biologic, Ampion would qualify for 12 years of market exclusivity from, straight from the F FDA. Um, and we know that the standard of care in this treatment paradigm in these patients hasn't changed in decades. So um, perhaps the drug delivery is evolving but really the uh, foundation of treatment it has remained NSAID, opioids, steroids, and hyaluronic acids, and ultimately um, surgery. And you can see on the graph here on the far side, um, you can see that this is the OAK prevalence has a linear trajectory. It just keeps growing. Um, and that's in millions, while the spending on top also has the same sort of linear trajectory, but that's in billions. So we can see that the market is really requesting um, improved treatments and improved outcomes for patients. So as I mentioned, we were well underway um, in conducting a confirmatory pivotal study under a special protocol assessment with the FDA when the world was struck with a pandemic. And the CDC provided guidance that eight out of 10 COVID-related deaths 
occur in adults aged 65 years and older. CDC also lists a number of comorbidities, and that is the exact patient population in our confirmatory study. Um, Nature Magazine reported that over a thousand clinical trials were suspended due to the pandemic, and Ampion um, development for OAK is one of those trials. And so um, the FDA has issued guidance for industry as well as guidance specific to our program. Um, we responded uh, to the FDA's guidance and we recently submitted a proposal. Um, you know, and what are the kind of options that are available to us? Well, one of those would be, can we minimize any potential bias or effect of COVID-19 in the program and analyze the data now? And that's exactly what we presented to the FDA. We said, listen, we think that there's an opportunity to really use objective criteria to, to minimize any impact of COVID and potentially analyze the data now. And that's what we're talking to people today. Should they accept that, um, then we would be uh, locking and analyzing the, the data if positive moving into BLA summit. Um, also in the guidance, one of the things that is open to companies is to increase enrollment to offset those patients who may have been impacted by COVID-19 or to conduct a, a new study altogether, right? And there's different iterations of all of this between um, conducting virtual visits versus in-home hospital, in-home sort of in-clinic visits, conducting in-home visits, et cetera. Um, so the proposal that we are exploring with the FDA uh, revolves around analyzing the data at this time, but certainly there's a myriad of um, opportunities. And because we are um, being conducted under a special protocol assessment, the special protocol assessment guidance for industry um, suggests that the agency should respond within 45 days of the proposal. So we announced that we had submitted this proposal on our December shareholder call. So we're looking forward to continuing the dialogue with the FDA quite soon. Um, a quick touch base on R&D for kidney, moving pretty quickly here. Um, we continue to investigate uh, the application of Ampion and other inflammatory conditions. And here you can see a schematic on how Ampion may be able to work in kidney disease. And when you think about inflammatory kidney disease, one of the first things that comes to mind are diabetics often suffer from inflammatory kidney issues. And so this could have really um, meaningful application, which is why it's so important that we continue our work in collaborations with those, which is and the ones from those scientists from Vanderbilt. Manufacturing, I think it's important to note that all of our clinical trial material, as well as material that we're investigating in laboratory, comes from production in-house at Antidote's headquarters in Colorado. So that is actually a picture of our facility there. So we manufacture everything here. Um, all of our manufacturing standards comply to both the EF, US, and EU regulatory requirements, such that we're able to furnish um, global demand as needed. So this is a recap of everything we sort of just cruised through in the inhalation study. We expect to have you know, that data um, coming up here pretty soon uh, to support the preliminary results that, that we've announced. Um, we also are moving uh, quickly into a phase two program as suggested by the FDA in our discussions for potential emergency use authorization. The IV study is along a similar trajectory. So we completed the initial safety studies and we're moving into um, the phase two program. The osteoarthritis of knee study as we just recently went over, we've submitted a proposal to the FDA. We feel confident in that proposal um, and in our continued cadence and dialogue with the agency. And so this is a brief sort of overview on when we might expect to see those milestones and, and kind of have results reported out on some of those milestones. And in summary, this kind of recaps everything we started with on Ampio as a company, what we're focused on, and how we're focused on addressing um, and improving patient lives and those patients suffering from inflammatory conditions with our immunomodulatory therapy. Uh, so with that, I would say thank you very much. And I would actually turn it over to Mike McAleese, our CEO, for uh, additional remarks. Actually, I'm, we're ready to take questions if there are any out there so that we could move this along. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we do have one in the chat. Are there any target uh, or any target markets for Ampion tests outside US, such as like a Europe or Brazil, um, if you hadn't touched on that already? Yeah, I think Holly touched on that. We're uh, doing the um, IV study for, uh, for COVID, inflammatory COVID in uh, Israel, and we'll be conducting that also in the United States. Uh, we're going to stay primarily in the United States initially. We'll do some studies, like I said, in Israel, but uh, we'll expand later into other countries as, as things permit. Another question. I think you touched pretty well on how COVID, the COVID pandemic has 
impacted uh, MPO. Uh, if there's anything else you'd like to touch on that, but also perhaps it's fair to ask how it will uh, continue to affect you all moving forward. Well, I think it gave us, we have been working on inflammatory lung diseases, systemic inflammatory diseases for many, many years. It was part of Dr. Barrore, our founder, his initial scientific discoveries. The interruption of our phase three pivotal trial uh, gave us the opportunity to really focus on those things and bring them to the forefront because of COVID. So actually COVID has been a benefit, not to, not to society, but to us in terms of the development of Ampion for inflammatory lung diseases, COVID, uh, a side effect of COVID, a systemic inflammation, again, uh, because of COVID, and then the long hauler applications that uh, post-COVID patients are experiencing, which again, having trouble breathing, uh, blood clots, et cetera, et cetera, we're able to address those things. And fortunately, they're all part of our clinical platform right now. Fantastic. Mike, Holly, that brings us to time, but uh, I mean, there's a lot of traction for your company right now. Uh, tons of interest in the chat. So we really appreciate you all being here. Uh, a lot of excitement in terms of what you're doing. Thank you for having us and Thank look you. forward to answering questions in the future. Yes, Thanks. please. Email. Is there an email where they can reach out to you if we didn't get to their questions? Yeah. M-M-A-C-A-L-U-S-O at A-M-P-I-O-P-H-A-R-M-A dot com. My M Macaluso at ampiopharma.com. Be happy Perfect. to answer them. Perfect. Thank you all again. Really appreciate it. We will talk to you all very soon. Thank you very much. Have a good day. You as well. Fantastic. That was Holly Sharevka, the Chief Operating Officer, and Michael Macchiluso, Chairman and CEO of Ampio Pharmaceuticals, New York Stock Exchange listed AMPE. All right. We are on to a wonderful uh, conclusion to our day. Red Hill Biopharma, the CEO, Dror Binasher uh, of Red Hill Biopharma is here with us today. NASDAQ listed RDHL. Uh, Dror, if you get your uh, camera and mic on, we will get this going, but very, very excited to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Great uh, to, to, uh, to be here. Um, I see that you are having a really, really busy day, uh, <laughs> and I'm sure you're looking forward to uh, some uh, rest. Uh, so uh, I promise to keep our overview, uh, overview short. Uh, should I uh, get going? Yes, please, sir. It's good to have you here. Thank you, thank you. So, um, how is that? Does it look okay? Yes, if you want to fully present it, you're welcome to, but we can see your deck. Perfect, yeah, I'll keep it that way. Wonderful, so um, a few words about Red Hill Biopharma for those of you who don't know us. We're listed on uh, NASDAQ, uh, and we are um, up and coming, uh, rapidly emerging uh, specialty pharma company in the US. Uh, I remind you that because we are, <coughs> we are public, um, a, a lot of the statements that will be uh, made here, we cannot guarantee those are forward uh, looking uh, statements. So a little bit about us. So typically when you see a, a sub half a billion dollar market cap company like Red Hill, you tend to see a, a single product, maybe a couple of products, maybe a technology platform, something like that. In our case, it's very, very different. Red Hill already has uh, several FDA approved products that we are promoting in the US. I'll talk about that uh, in a moment. With a, with a very strong uh, commercial uh, footprint, we have uh, several phase three stage uh, programs right now uh, ongoing, including a couple of uh, COVID-19 phase three stage novel molecules already administered uh, in the clinic advancing uh, nicely. Uh, we are not aware of uh, even a, a big pharma that has uh, two shots on goal at phase three stage, novel orally ad administered molecules uh, for COVID-19. Uh, we have that uh, as well as other uh, late stage uh, programs. Uh, we have a solid balance sheet with $100 million. Revenues are rising really, really nicely. Last year, over 64 million, nearly uh, 30 million in uh, gross uh, profit. And again, this is uh, growing nicely and we expect uh, 2021 uh, to be a, a breakout year with potential commercial uh, operation uh, uh, break even. 
This is uh, our pipeline. So um, as, as you can see, three products that have been approved, we are already promoting. Uh, I mentioned the uh, revenues. The development pipeline has several phase three stage products. I will also uh, mention uh, that for lack of time, we cannot discuss all of them today, but we'll briefly mention uh, a couple of them. At the bottom, what you see is our COVID-19 programs phase three stage, uh, which uh, I will discuss uh, right now. Uh, so we have two shots on goal for COVID-19. Uh, one of them is on the left-hand side of Paganib, which is already over two thirds uh, enroll enrolled in a phase three study that is uh, run globally, approved in eight uh, countries. So again, over two thirds enrolled. We expect to complete uh, enrollments uh, in the next qu quarter, Q2. Uh, and we are uh, planning to uh, issue the top line results as well uh, during the uh, next quarter, Q2, all goes well. Uh, the other product is a uh, Pamstat, which is uh, for non-hospitalized uh, patients on the right-hand side. It is also in a phase three study in the, uh, in the US. What makes those molecules unique is that they have the potential to tackle existing and new mutations, emerging mutations. This is very important, given everything we know about the mutations that keep coming at us. Uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, governments are concerned, patients, uh, of course, are concerned, the, the, the uh, physicians are concerned, managed care is concerned, everybody's concerned about mutations. Those two uh, novel orally administered molecules that are phase three stage, both of them should be effective against uh, existing and uh, new mutations because of the special uh, mechanism of action which targets the host uh, cell. The host uh, cell as opposed to the virus uh, itself. Uh, Opaganib on the left hand side already completed the successfully a phase two study in the United States. And as I mentioned, uh, is uh, about to complete a phase three study uh, globally. Opaganib uh, also achieved very exciting results uh, when uh, it was uh, measured, how it is doing against uh, the uh, virus itself. So Opaganib completely inhibited SARS-CoV-2, the uh, virus that causes COVID-19. Uh, and not only that, uh, it demonstrated the most potent activity versus all compounds that we tested, including Remdesivir. Very exciting uh, mechanism. Uh, needless to say, the mechanism of opaganib is not purely antiviral. Opaganib is also a, a potent anti-inflammatory, which is critical when you deal with a disease uh, that causes inflammation and, and lung deterioration and so on uh, and so on. Uh, so I will take uh, one or two minutes to uh, tell you about the phase two data that we generated. Uh, we um, have shown uh, that, that opaganib uh, was found to be safe, very important in a phase two study. Uh, we have shown greater improvement in reducing oxygen requirement by uh, uh, day 14 across, across uh, key and primary and secondary efficacy outcomes. Those are the endpoints. Uh, and this is a clinical improvement as measured by the WHO uh, scale. We have shown greater improvement uh, in uh, reaching uh, room air 52% uh, versus 22%. Uh, both uh, Opaganib and the control arm were on top of standard of care. The control arm was placebo on top of standard of care. We have also, also shown greater improvement in proportion of patients with 50% reduction in supplemental oxygen, 89% uh, versus 66%. A high proportion of patients uh, dis discharged by day 14, very important for hospitalized patients, 73% versus 55%, and a greater reduction from baseline of uh, median total oxygen requirement, or AUC, uh, which was 68% versus 46%. And this is in a small US study. It's very difficult to show such data in, in a small uh, study. The phase two three study of opaganib is ongoing. 
we are uh, going to enroll 464. We are well, well over 300, well over two thirds of the patients have been uh, enrolled and we are enrolling uh, nicely. The primary endpoint is a proportion of patients reaching room air by day uh, 14. And the uh, study has already passed three independent committees, including a fertility analysis, which is very important uh, when it comes to uh, assessing the efficacy, the potential efficacy, and the uh, likelihood of success in the uh, study. Moving on to uh, RGB 107 or Upamostat, uh, this is uh, an outpatient uh, study. So we are covering the whole spectrum, hospitalized patients with opaganib and non-hospitalized patients with RGB 107. Uh, that is a US study, phase three, that we have uh, initiated and are enro enrolling for. And the primary endpoint is uh, time to sustain the recovery. There's a very strong need for uh, an oral treatment uh, in this uh, indication. Obviously, the, the market is far larger uh, in uh, outpatient setting, uh, far more patients that are not hospitalized. And you want to prevent them from being hospitalized and, of course, deteriorating. Uh, where is Red Hill going? Red Hill uh, is uh, suddenly going places, uh, growing very fast. We have uh, several products on the market, as I mentioned, but we also have a strong pipeline. We'll keep feeding our commercial organization with drugs that we bring to the market from within our pipeline, from within our company, in-house, uh, just like Talithia for each fellow infection. And we will do the same by uh, non-organic growth, by bringing in products such as uh, Movantic, which we acquired uh, in April last year from AstraZeneca. We have uh, 100 uh, sales reps across the nation, headquartered in Raleigh, North Carolina, and we have another 30 uh, field support uh, professionals in the field. Company will keep growing, revenue will keep growing. Uh, it's going to be a, a quite an exciting uh, journey. The market cap is uh, about 350 million. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, uh, roughly 100 million in the bank. Commercial operations headquartered in Raleigh has all the functions that are needed. Uh, we can support uh, a fast growing organization, which is actually exactly what's happening uh, right now. The uh, managed care landscape uh, is very positive for us, even though we just launched Alicia uh, about half a year ago, effectively, we already have seven out of 10 commercially insured patients that can access the drug. Uh, and with Movantic, which is for opioid induced constipation, nine, or, nine out of 10 commercially insured patients uh, can access the Movantic. So warm uh, endorsement by managed care, uh, the pricing, uh, it's something that's very important. Uh, what I wanted to show you here is uh, the strong growth of, uh, of Talisia. Uh, despite the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic is, is the worst possible time to, to launch a drug from scratch, uh, especially a specialty drug that requires a diagnosis of the disease of H. pylori, uh, because patients do not want to come to the clinic to be tested, uh, and so on and so on, for obvious reasons. Uh, despite that, scripts have been growing, uh, and we expect uh, growth to accelerate significantly later this year as the pandemic uh, gradually fades away. Revenues have been growing again, despite the pandemic, uh, we have generated 21.5 million in Q4 2020. Movantic I mentioned for opioid induced constipation, it's the uh, market leader in its uh, segment. Uh, it's been a trans transformative event for Red Hill uh, we have worked uh, diligently with AstraZeneca, transitioned the product, and are currently promoting it with more uh, field force, higher, uh, stronger field force than AstraZeneca did. Uh, we are very optimistic about the prospects for the, for the drug. Talisia uh, is a very exciting drug that we have uh, developed internally, uh, have gotten it approved by FDA, uh, and launched effectively uh, last uh, summer into the uh, pandemic. 
Uh, what is important to understand about Talisia is that it is targeting a carcinogen class one called H. pylori infection. And H. pylori infection is something that, believe it or not, more than half of the world's population is infected with. Uh, 100 million Americans are infected with uh, H. pylori infection, and roughly 90% of gastric cancer cases are caused by this uh, infection and a lot of other uh, nasty uh, conditions and diseases. Um, the um, important thing to understand about Talisia is that uh, it overcomes uh, a high and growing resistance uh, to uh, H. pylori, to existing drugs by H. pylori, uh, and th therefore we believe that it will be uh, become the standard of care uh, for this. Uh, the US market is big, as I mentioned, 100 million Americans uh, are uh, infected. We are promoting to uh, many thousands of specialists, primary care physicians, and so on. The, the uh, last drug that we are promoting is Encolo for travelers diarrhea. I will not talk about that much given that there's not much travel right now. Uh, however, I will mention that Encolo uh, is going to become increasingly uh, important as uh, travel resumes and uh, as we all know, booking for uh, international travel has been growing very uh, rapidly by all measures. Uh, and we expect uh, later this year to see quite a spike of uh, travel. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the other molecule I'll mention is uh, RGB204 for our uh, non-tuberculous mycobacterium. Again, an infection uh, that is uh, creating a significant uh, unmet medical needs. There's no drug approved for first line NTM infection. We have uh, initiated a phase three study in the United States. And if we are approved uh, successful, this will be the uh, only first line uh, drug. It's orally administered three times a week. It's a standalone drug. It's an exciting program with a very significant uh, market potential. Uh, one um, more uh, drug I want to mention is RGB104 for Crohn's disease. Uh, we have successfully completed a phase three study, uh, roughly 40% remission. Uh, and we have also been able to show a durable remission uh, after one year and maintenance of remission. So very exciting data for Crohn's patients, very strong unmet uh, need. So to, to sum up, uh, so that we can take a couple of uh, questions, uh, this year is gonna be a breakout year, there's no doubt about it, uh, both on the commercial front because we already have several products that we are promoting uh, and they will keep growing. But also on the R&D front, our COVID programs are unique in that we are probably the only company in the world or at least one of a handful of companies, including Big Pharma, that has two phase three stage orally administered novel molecules. Uh, one of these molecules of Paganib is about to complete a phase three study over two thirds uh, enroll, enrolled, uh, and we expect to complete enrollment uh, next quarter and all goes well also announced offline results. So overall, we uh, expect significant growth this year on all fronts uh, and we uh, plan uh, all goes, goes well on uh, achieving also a commercial operational uh, break even uh, this, uh, this year. Uh, I thank you for uh, listening and uh, happy to take a call in the uh, remaining, uh, remaining time. Thank you so much, Dror. That was very informative. A couple of questions, you know, that, that come to mind for me here. One being, uh, with your two, the two phase three no, uh, COVID molecules, um, are you along the same thought process that, you know, COVID is here to stay? And with that in mind, this part of your business becomes a little bit more uh, ever present, if you will. Absolutely. So two of our three marketed drugs in the US are uh, infectious disease uh, drugs, although they are promoted primarily to GI and primary care. So this is within our sweet spot. Uh, COVID-19 made a lot of sense for us to go after. Our team has been able to bring two phase three stage programs to where they are today within less than a year. And we are a small company with very limited resources. Again, we're not even aware of a big pharma that is where we are. So we feel very comfortable. The need is certainly there. The clinical benefit of uh, drugs that have been approved 
for emergency use or uh, full marketing uh, only a couple. Uh, the clinical benefit uh, is controversial, it's limited, and the uh, unmet medical need, uh, the suffering, the death out there is very, very significant. We are doing our very best as a small company to address that. Fantastic. I look forward to connecting in a year <laughs> at the next biotech conference to see where we're at. Uh, I guess another question for me is, you know, I would say the majority of your products are, are gastric focused, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so are, are those, uh, was it easier to bring one to market, you know, after having achieved already some gastric success, if you will? Bringing a drug to the market is uh, quite a project. Uh, Palicia has been developed for, I would guess, uh, close to 20 years. It was in our hands for 10 years before we got it approved. But once we got the data out there, we were able to get it approved within half a year, which is record time with FDA. And this knowledge of designing and executing studies in the GI space, as you mentioned, is something that is one of our core competencies. And we continue to do it with quite a few other late stage, clinical stage. Uh, program as we speak, and we'll continue to bring additional products such as Movantic from AstraZeneca that is already generating uh, close to 20 million uh, a quarter for us uh, as of uh, Q4. Fantastic. So tons of room there, tons of runway. Uh, Dror, it is a pleasure to have you in Red Hill with us. Uh, very insightful and <laughs> Uh, big value play I hear, I think, everybody. Uh, so please check into them. Their ticker is RDHL on the NASDAQ. Dora, thank you again for being here. Thank you. Keep safe. You as well. You as well. Uh, all right, everybody. That is our first day of our Biotech Focus Small Cap Conference. We are thrilled to have you. Uh, it has been a full day, very educational. If you enjoyed it, drop a one in the chat. Your questions are appreciated from beginning to end. Uh, Manju, Anthony, Jeff, everybody, uh, it, it really is a pleasure to, to hopefully bring the education and content to you guys that uh, you're looking for. Some deep insights. I think great value uh, value adds here. Uh, definitely a few I'm adding to my watch list. I hope you all feel the same. Uh, we have a full day tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be another nine to three. Uh, please do come back. Uh, we will be talking to a full different set of companies uh, on different sides of biotech. So uh, it will not be repetitive or monotonous to, to say the least. Uh, past that, we also have several other events. Please do check out benzinga.com slash events. Uh, get your news from benzinga.com. It is the backbone of everything we're able to do here. So uh, other than that, uh, you are able to go back and watch these sessions uh, at your convenience. They will live on YouTube uh, and then there for you all. Thanks again. Uh, events at benzinga.com. If you have any questions, uh, follow me on Twitter, Elliot Lane 10. Outside of that, we will see you all bright and early tomorrow. Uh, 9 a.m. Eastern time. All right. Thanks, everybody.